complete? Yeah. Are we ready to go? All right, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Ngorasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, and our settlers from around the world. And uh, I'll do the roll call. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Okay. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. Got so everyone is here other than Councillor Rutherford. She'll be joining us shortly. Adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. I'll move that the July 4th slash 6th. Reminder, we don't have to go that long. Uh, City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. Additions of 6.2 Healthy Streets Operations Center, Chinatown. 6.4 Small Scale Sanctioned Encampments. Uh, 7.12 uh, bylaw 20226 Council Process Amendment 7.13 Bylaw 20186 Vehicle for Hire, hire Bylaw Amendment 9.1 Government of Alberta Consultation Local Authorities Elections Act uh, 9.6 Intergovernmental Update 9.8 Event Opportunity and Replacement Attachment Reports for Item 7.2 Bylaw 20148 A Bylaw to Amend Bylaw 19617 to authorize the City of Edmonton to construct finance uh, and assess sidewalk reconstruction in Malmo Plains neighborhood. And eight motions pending, 8.7, 2021 Edmonton Police Services Annual Report and 8.8 .8 additional support for industrial development in Fulton Creek Business Park. And to delete, oh, it's a sec, there's two pages today, sorry. And to delete page or item 6.1, and 2021 Edmonton election non-compliance in relation to campaign disclosure statements. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Any questions on the adoption of the agenda? Seeing I'm not. trying to I'm trying to buzz in. Oh, sorry, Councillor Jans. Yes. So some of those some of those items that are being requested to be added, uh, 6.2, 6.4, 7.12. Um, I believe they weren't ready until. Friday, late Friday, late Thursday on um, eScribe. And I'm just wondering if we could get a, a rationale for that because it's really hard to prepare for the meetings without the, you know, the reports being available 10 days in advance. Okay. The motions, just a, fr just a friendly reminder, the motions for those were just passed at the last council meeting. Yeah, but the, I guess the, it, if their documentation is not available, um, until that time, it what it, I guess what's the option? We could we could set it for time sensitive on Wednesday, which would allow us to have a little more time to process or to to engage. So if we want to set items for time specific, I think that's a different process. Anybody could move to do that. I'm, that's my understanding. But these reports were late because we gave direction. We did not give our administration the prescribed amount of time to prepare these reports. So was the council direction to bring them forward? So obviously we were expecting them to be late. Okay, yeah. and seven point twelve as well. Uh, seven point. That came out of council services committee last week. I would have been happy to bring that forward within the thirteen weeks, but I was directed to bring it to this council meeting. But yeah. if you don't want to deal with it, happy to let it go over. But just a friendly reminder that the changes that uh, we bring you forward are actually directed by council. But appreciate it's up to you. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Councilor Jens. Any other questions? Seeing none, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. 
uh, adoption of the minutes. Councillor Nat. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move the adoption of the minutes from the June 20th, 2022 City Council meeting, the June 22nd, 2022 City Council public hearing, and the June 24th, 2022 City Council non regular meeting. Okay, need a seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Rice for the uh, approval of the minutes. Any questions on the approval of the minutes? Councillor Jans? Oh, okay, you're not there. Okay. All right, please vote. I'm a yes. And thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We're just waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? Seeing none. Okay, select items for debate. Please sign up to select items for debate. All right, Councillor Rice. I would like to select 6.6. 6.6. 6. 6. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is that voting purposes or is it for uh, questions? Because we for had a health voting purpose. Questions. For questions as well. Even though we had a very healthy debate and long debate at committee. You more have more questions? Yeah. Okay. All right, Councillor Rice, 6.6. Councillor Jans. Thanks. Um, I'll pick six, um, six two, six four. Six two, just hold on. Six four. And then we have to select six, eight, nine, ten, six, and eight, eleven. Nine, ten, eleven. And then I'll also select um, seven, twelve. Seven. Seven twelve. Then I guess I'll nine, just hold on. Oh. Seven twelve. Seven one two. Yeah. Then yeah. while we're at it, I guess nine point four, nine point six, nine point seven, nine point eight. They all have to be selected as well. So. Okay. Nine point four, nine point six, nine point seven, and nine point eight. Okay, Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mayor. So he just uh, just nine point one. That's all I have left. Nine point one. Councillor Principe. Mine have all been chosen already. Thank chosen. you. Okay. And Councillor Rutherford. I'd also like to select 7.1, please. Just 7.1 single use. Uh, ready for first reading, okay. Uh, Okay. All right. Do we have anything that we haven't selected? Yeah, we do. Okay. Uh, can someone move the balance, please? So moved. Councillor Nack moved the balance. Second. Councillor Cartmel seconded. Please vote. I'm oh, sorry, point of order. Can we just um, repeat as I was signing in what is not selected? Okay. Can I just do what has been selected? Would that be helpful? That way I can yeah. confirm. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. Sorry. Thank Sorry. You. Just before I vote, I just yeah. Wanna... For sure. No problem. Pro apologies. So City Council has approved uh, deletion of report six. Uh, sorry, six point one. The twenty twenty one Edmonton election non compliance report was not added to the agenda. Councillor Jan selected six point two. Six point three was not selected. Councillor Jan selected 6.4, 6.5 was not selected. Councillor Rice selected 6.6, 6.7 was not selected. Councillor Rice selected the following, 6.8, 6.9, 6.10, 6.11. 
Close to Jens. Oh, thank you. That's why we're checking. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Councillor Rutherford uh, selected 7.1. Was that for voting purposes or for questions? Questions? Okay, thank you so much. Councillor Jones selected 7.12. Councillor Knack selected 9.1. In 9-2 was not selected, 9-3 was not selected, Councillor Jan selected 9-4, 9-5 was not selected, Councillor Jan selected 9-6, 9-7, 9-8, and that's it. Thank you. All right. So please vote now. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. That is carried. Uh, request to speak. I have none. Request for specific time on the agenda. None. Vote on the bylaws now select for debate. Councillor Gartmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move first reading of item 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, .7, .7, .7, .7 and 7.13. Okay. Se second. <coughs> second by Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Stevenson seconded, please. Oh, any questions? Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So he will move second reading of item 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, 7.11, 7.12, 7.13, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.17, 7.18, 7.19, 7.20, 7.21, 7.22, 7.23, 7.24, 7.25, 7.26, 7.27, 7.28, 7.29, 7.30, 7.31, 7.32, 7.33, 7.34, 7.35, 7.36, 7.37, 7.38, 7.39, 7.40, 7.41, 7.42, 7.43, 7.44, 7.45, 7.46, 7.47, 7.48, 7.49, 7.50, 7.51, 7.52, 7.53, 7.54, 7.55, 7.56, 7.57, 7.58, 7.59, 7.60, 7.61, 7.62, 7.63, 7.64, 7.65, 7.66, 7.67, 7.68, 7.69, 7.70, 7.71, 7.72, 7.73, 7.74, 7.75, 7.76, 7.77, 7.78, 7.79, 7.80, 7.81, 7.82, 7.83, 7.84, 7.85, 7.86, 7.87, 7.88, 7.89, 7.90, 7.91, 7.92, 7.93, 7.94, 7.95, 7.96, 7.97, 7.98, 7.99, 7.10, 7.11, 7.12, 7.13, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.17, 7.18, 7.19, 7.20, 7.21, 7.22, 7.23, 7.24, 7.25, 7.26, 7.27, 7.28, 7.29, 7.30, 7.31, 7.32, 7.33, 7.34, 7.35, 7.36, 7.37, 7.38, 7.39, 7.40, 7.41, 7.42, 7.43, 7.44, 7.45, 7.46, 7.47, 7.48, 7.49, 7.50, 7.51, 7.52, 7.53, 7.54, 7.55, 7.56, 7.57, 7.58, 7.59, 7.60, 7.61, 7.62, 7.63, 7.64, 7.65, 7.66, 7.67, 7.68, 7.69, 7.70, 7.71, 7.72, 7.73, 7.74, 7.75, 7.76, 7.77, 7.78, 7.79, 7.80, 7.81, 7.82, 7.83, 7.84, 7.85, 7.86, 7.87, 7.88, 7.89, 7.90, 7.91, 7.92, 7.93, 7.94, 7.95, 7.96, 7.97, 7.98, 7.99, 7.100, 7.101, 7.102, 7.103, 7.104, 7.105, 7.106, 7.107, 7.108, 7.109, 7.110, 7.111, 7.112, 7.113, 7.114, 7.115, 7.116, 7.117, 7.118, 7.119, 7.120, 7.121, 7.122, 7.123, 7.124, 7.125, 7.126, 7.127, 7.128, 7.129, 7.130, 7.131, 7.132, 7.133, 7.134, 7.135, 7.136, 7.137, 7.138, 7.139, 7.140, 7.151, 7.152, 7.153, 7.154, 7.155, 7.156, 7.157, 7.158, 7.159, 7.160, 7.170, 7.171, 7.172, 7.173, 7.174, 7.175, 7.176, 7.177, 7.178, 7.178, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179, 7.179,
any consular inquiries? Seeing none, reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. So first item, Madam Clerk, was deleted, right? Mm -hmm. And we go into our second item, 6.2, which is the first item, okay? And that is the Healthy Streets Operation Center. Uh, there's a presentation from administration. There is indeed, Your Worship. I'm just go ahead. Get uh, someone to come down here. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council. Um, good morning. Uh, Council asked administration to work with our colleagues at EPS to develop a business plan for the Healthy Streets Operations Center. And this was announced as a public part of our public safety plan and as described in our commitments to Chinatown. Uh, the report focuses on the most important element of the Operations Center, that is the people who respond when the calls come. The problem is identified uh, uh, or the data shows a certain pattern that we have to respond to. There would be additional costs for facilities, social agency support, and additional components of the Healthy Streets Operations Centre, but today's report, report provides a sense of the scale we would recommend for this to be a sustainable aspect. And do, just want to clarify that in the meantime, we are doing what we can with the resources we have and the reallocation of other resources. I'm just going to turn it over to Mr. Jones, the Branch Manager of Community Standards and Neighbourhoods, to provide a bit more detail. And uh, we also have, as part of the delegation, um, the uh, Chair of the uh, Edmonton Police Commission for questions as well. So, Mr. Jones. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, in May of this year, Council approved the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy, our roadmap for inclusive, connected, and coordinated safety and well-being planning that is aligned to the values in the city plan. The Healthy Streets Operations Centre advances the community safety and well-being strategy through the crime prevention and crisis intervention and safe and inclusive spaces pillars and is a key action from the downtown core and transit system safety plan that we provided to the Government of Alberta in June. A Healthy Streets Operations Centre allows for operational collaboration and coordination increasing the presence of police officers, peace officers, and fire prevention officers, while also reducing response times to non-emergency situations. The Healthy Streets Operations Center is an operation center and, and not a traditional police station. While the exact location of this center is still being determined, we have planned for it to operate seven days a week, 21 hours a day. Through the Healthy Streets Operations Centre, the City of Edmonton, Edmonton Police Service and community partners will focus on shared outcomes while sharing data analytics, problem identification and developing appropriate responses. Through a multidisciplinary model, these teams would report within a unified operational command structure and increase efficiencies for both the City of Edmonton and the EPS. An example of this model already in use on a smaller scale is the governance and structure for our collective encampment response. Administration is dedicated to using evidence-based practices including hotspot deployment and problem-oriented practices to address community concerns related to safety. Today, administration and the EPS are presenting the business case for the Healthy Streets Operations Centre. Working together, we have determined the resourcing requirements to activate such a centre. On the administration side, we would hire four peace officer sergeants, 16 community peace officers, two community safety liaisons for the NET program, and three firefighters or fire prevention officers. A scale up of resources of this nature will take some time to implement. Uh, to hire, for example, to hire 20 new peace officers would take up to six months to recruit, hire, and train. If we received a decision today, we would be able to implement it by Q1 2023 and if that decision is made during our budget conversation in December, we would be looking to implement it in the summer of 2023. The EPS will also have a prolonged implementation time for similar reasons. Net new costs for administration's portion of this plan in 2023 are $2 million, rising to annual costs of just over $2.9 million for 2024 to 2026. Cost totals. Total costs over the four years are 10.7 million, representing a tax levy increase of 0.11% in 2023 and another 0.05% in 2024. 
the combined total for the two organizations as presented is $18 million. Details can be found in the report and subsequent attachments. Teams throughout administration rely on the expertise and partnership of the EPS to complete difficult and complex files in our city. We are prepared to expand our work together and with our community partners to improve safety in Edmonton. Thank you, and we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the presentation, and this was exempted by Councillor Jans. May I? You need to sign up. Here we go. Council Jans, go ahead. Excellent, thank you. So um, I just want to get a sense of what other options were. Um, well, I guess maybe my first question. So does this contemplate, is this just a uh, operations ask or is there a capital ask along with it too? Yeah, it's all operational, Councillor. Uh, the, the, the minor capital that would be used would be the facility itself, but that would be funded through a lease through operations money. Um, could you clarify, could you expand upon that? Well, uh, what the important part of this center is that it operates in somewhere in the middle of China, Chinatown, which is what was requested and what we're looking for right now is that, that location. So we would obviously want to pay um, a rental of that space as opposed to buy it. And so it's capital, there would be a building for this place to take place, but we would use operational funds to pay for it through a lease. Okay, so there's three components of the ask. The component that the city is contributing, the component that Edmonton Police Service is contributing, and then um, the, the capital piece would be the lease through which we would see in the operations funding. Yeah, a certain amount could, of dollars a month for rent or something. Yeah, and that could be done either through EPS or through ourselves. Okay, and um, I guess I'm wondering, and I don't know if I can ask a question of the police, but I'm, I'm wondering about the opportunity to redeploy officers from elsewhere uh, to, to meet this need. I, I make, I, maybe I can just start off by saying right now we're meeting uh, the need as much as we can through a lot of overtime and a lot of redeployments. And I think the theory was both with the city and EPS, we can do that for a period of time, which we're doing now already, uh, but it, it's not sustainable forever. So we were asked to bring forward a business case for how to turn the current status quo that we're doing temporarily using a reassignment of forces, uh, or sorry, of, of um, assets or, or people. Um, and that's what we're doing now, but that's not sustainable forever. So maybe EPS can further respond to their part. Yeah, right now, uh, you, that's correct. Uh, the city manager said we're redeploying that resources that were dedicated for not just a geographical area in the city, but the city of Edmonton. In other words, these are being used for protests, uh, for high crime areas that uh, flare up from time to time, for festivals and, and different things like that. Right now, we've had to pull those resources and dedicate them to the downtown core, Chinatown and 118 Avenue. Um, we just don't have the resources to be able to do that. We're trying to stand up a, a 10 squad model and patrol just because we're understaffed there and we're also having difficulty doing that. I guess if we look over a, a 10 year time horizon though, no, no other jurisdiction in Canada has invested in policing the way Edmonton has. No other jurisdiction has, has uh, resor resourced uh, accordingly. And, and, and I guess I'm struggling here with, it, it appears yet another ask for an acute problem to a neighborhood to uh, provide something. When we heard, I believe Councillor Knack a few meetings ago had asked about the, the numbers of officers that were previously scheduled to be downtown and then that's been reduced as well. And, and uh, um, I, I appreciate the work going into this report, but I really wonder, um, is there no other way to, to do reassignments currently within, within the, the, the operation? Um, respectfully, um, that statement that you made that uh, we're over-resourced, uh, then there's no other I, I didn't say over-resourced. I said no other jurisdiction in, Can in Canada has Yeah, and has I, would, I would debate that with you. Um, and I also, we go through exercises continuously on trying to utilize our resources most effectively and efficiently. And right now we're struggling to do that. 
So could you tell me who in Canada spends more per person on police? Uh, right off the top, I could tell you that Calgary has approximately 400 more sworn members than we do. No, how, how, uh, the spend per person. How much does the taxpayer in Calgary spend per person? Oh, I, I'm not going to Because according to the that. Globe and Mail, no other jurisdiction think, except uh, for Windsor does. Yeah, but we can't compare because uh, Councillor Jans, there's things that are done in different jurisdictions that we're responsible for paying where the city pays, or they all have joint dispatch centers that the city uh, police service doesn't have to pay for. You can't compare it that way. Yeah, I think it is probably not the right time for that discussion, so I would really f encourage everybody to focus on the item that is at the agenda. So which may is, I ask, how much are we being asked to additionally contribute then? It's another six yeah. million this year. That's a good question. Another six million this year, and then 18 million over four years. Am I correct in reading that? No, could, could I get clarity then? How much are we How much are we, we, we required to spend on this? The total yeah. for four years is 18 million. That's across, uh, that's not all to EPS, that's yeah. to the city uh, and EPS. Yeah, yeah and I, I think it, it's time. Councillor Jens, time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Well, thank you. Yeah, and maybe maybe just to pick up from, from that thread, uh, just, just for a bit of clarity, it looks like the 18 million didn't seem to include anything for EPS in uh, 25 and 26, I believe. Um, so just wondering if we could get some clarity on that. Um, uh, so this is page, sorry, my posse is not, or sorry, my, it's in the main report. It is one of the pages that I apologize, just can't see because half of my page is missing. Um, but there's a table that has the total cost, so the total cost for the Healthy Streets Operations Center, and there's uh, only funding for EPS under 2023 and 2024. So the, uh, the funding for 23 is the is um, half of the staffing. Can you move close to the mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the funding in 23 is for half the staffing in the, uh, to start the policing op and the infrastructure to support them, the vehicles, the radios, cell phones um, and then the the annualization of that costs uh, in 2024 once the budget is increased on a one-time basis a permanent budget increase we we it becomes part of our base we don't need an additional set of funds in 25 and 26 but we do need that influx of money uh, partly in 23 and the other part in 24 okay thanks thanks for that clarity and then maybe to mr. Corbold would that that would be the intent as well, is that this would also become part of the base, the base funding, the city's contribution? Yeah, certainly, uh, certainly subject to uh, budget approval, but um, if council was to approve this today, for example, we would submit it as, as a funded package as part of the budget in the fall. Gotcha, okay. Well, thank you. I mean, I think, I think um, you know, looking forward to some discussion around, around some of the funding and the timing of that funding. I think for me though, what I really wanted to dig into was you know, I really appreciate the, the perspectives in the report around wanting to have the right resource in the right place at the right time. Uh, I think that's, that's really an excellent approach. Um, but I was curious that there, there doesn't seem to be um, any, any specific reference to some of the community groups. I know it references that over time we would work to bring community uh, agencies into this, but uh, in my mind, sort of that, again, back to the governance piece, having having that community-based model and those other services that I think are the right resources for many of these calls, being being part of this from the beginning, I just wasn't seeing that reflected. Yeah, and I think that's just reflective of the, you know, the seven working days we've had to put this together, Councillor. Like, certainly we're committed to that, and I would see it operating much like we operate the transit safety plan with a tripartite, if you will, of social services. In this case, we are not able to sort of identify who that would be in this case, but I, I know that EPS and us are committed to that. Uh, and that's what's needed from a Chinatown perspective as well. We all know that. So, but I, so I think the idea is um, we, we can certainly flush that out and get those details back to council with, with a bit more time. Great. Yeah, and I think I think even again, depending on on the timing of this, but I think you know if it is a funding package coming forward, either funded or unfunded in the fall, you know, would really like to see the resource ask for that component as well. Yeah, certainly. Great. Um, also, just wondering if if again um, that we can we can build this model out to really support and be integrated with the integrated dispatch um, approach so just again some of those same governance models same parties just bringing those all together absolutely in fact this team would partially be uh, dispatched by the the new joint dispatch center that we're working on great 
Great, and then and then maybe just to to the service. I know we've we've spoken before that that you would um, potentially be able to share with with council some of the stats in terms of areas where resources have been reallocated. Some of the statistics around you know are we seeing longer response times for calls, things like that, to help help inform our, our decisions? Yes, that's correct. So some of the areas where the suppression teams were dedicated to, they've been now pulled out. We're watching those areas to see what's happening, if crime is increasing, spiking, or what trends are happening. Great, great. I think that'd be really helpful information for us as we, as we move forward. Um, and then, you know, it was mentioned before, but just want to confirm, I know the very specific ask from the community was around having that physical footprint in, in Chinatown. So that is absolutely a commitment. Would, that, would those operational dollars, again, would that sort of be within an existing budget? Or um, I just don't see anything identified in the report for that footprint. Yeah, we, we think we can absorb it. There's also been offers from different businesses in Chinatown to provide the facility at no cost, which is a good partnership. Uh, so that's why we don't see a specific need at this point in time. But uh, And if we did, we can cover it off. Yeah. Great, great. Thanks so much. And sorry, yes, just for clarity, absolutely in the middle of Chinatown and uh, several locations have been scouted already. Thank you, you Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cartfield. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So I, I want to be really crystal clear on timing and dollars here. So I'm referring to uh, the chart in the report. And the chart at the top of the page says Healthy Streets Operations Centre and has the cost breakdown. And I understood uh, the service to say that their numbers see a $2.5 million increase to their budget in 2023, permanent increase, then a further $2.5 million permanent increase, ongoing increase to their budget in 2024. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. Then the service is looking for a one-time $1.5 million uh, funding for equipment. Yes, sir. Now the city chart at the bottom, does that read the same way? $2 million increase in 2003 and then a further increase in 24 and a further increase? Or is that simply the in-year cost? For the city, that's in-year cost. So okay, so the different. charts read differently. Correct. So then there's a question about how do they add up? Uh, sorry, I, uh, Councillor Cartmel, I, I think we, there might be an error on that. So the 2.9 is total ongoing costs. I think you quoted 2.5. I'm sorry, I looked at the upper number. I'm sorry. Yeah, Yeah. so 2.9 and then one-time cost of 1.5. Right. Yeah. But it's two increases that the service is contemplating. And then another one in 2024. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, I understood that there was enough resources to essentially stand up this operation within existing budgets and resources, both on the city side and on the police side, to, to do this for three or four months. Yes, sir. So three or four months, we get to September, do we run out of money? It's not that we run out of money, sir. It's that those resources would go back to the areas that they originally came from, and then the staffing in the Chinatown area would not exist. So we would do this for four months and then stop doing it, That's and correct. then decide, the way this reads, decide whether we're going to do it again on an ongoing basis in December, in which case we couldn't start doing it again until the summer. Is that my understanding? That's correct. Yeah, yeah I that think that is my understanding. Is, so, my, is my understanding correct? Yeah, so Councillor, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say we'll stretch it out as long as we can this fiscal year. And this is, this is a plan being presented for 23 to 24 for sure. So that um, sounds like a nine month gap. Yeah, and, and really is a, it's about the decision point. Because as you recall, when we got approval for the transit safety plan in January, we didn't get those additional TPOs fielded until June uh, right. because of the training and recruitment requirements. So that is my only concern. And the reason, uh, I think part of the reason that this, this discussion is being had today is so that council can consider that. Um, if we get a decision on this in December, then we'll have it for the budget. The problem is I would anticipate just on the city side for recruitment, we would have to recruit some of those resources. Now we will always, uh, given the priority and the importance of security in Chinatown, we will always on the city side, speaking for city resources, prioritize those resources in Chinatown. And I feel confident that we can do 
something up until uh, November, December, but it's going to be a lot of overtime money and those kinds of, uh, and we'll, we'll take it from somewhere else. So I think what's really important is when this decision is made, because our lead up will be four to six months on recruiting those additional resources, and I would assume similar for EPS. So it doesn't mean we won't try to do what we can, but we're already stretching it quite a lot for four months and possibly into December now. Uh, so the question is, when does council want to make the decision, knowing that there would be a bit of a lead up to get those resources in place? But it sounds like if we were to make the decision today that we wanted to establish this for the, through to the end of 2024, say, that there is a funding gap for the balance of 2022 of this year. That, and you're saying, Mr. Krobold, you could you know, pull and, and tug on other places and try to cover the gaps. The service, I don't see anything here about what, what it would take to get through to the end of the year. It sounds like there's a, a funding gap for 2022. I think as a service, we understand the position that we're in right now collectively as a city. For us, what we're trying to do is ensure that we can have as many resources as we can, but we need clarity that we're going to be able to backfill in the out years. And that's really what we're looking for in terms of a decision now that we can now start doing the active planning for 2023, 2024, that we know from the areas that we have now pulled from that we're going to be able to have bodies to backfill it and manage within our resources. So for example, if we if this is not approved today, that's fine. We'll carry on doing this as best we can right through to the fall, I think. Uh, but then there'll be a you know there'll be a, a lag time after that. If we were if this was to be approved today, then both the EPS and the city can start to recruit, plan, get those numbers in place, get the FTEs established, so that in January we're knowing you know with certainty we have got people on the ground, maybe even showing up as early as December, January, and then it becomes much easier to bridge until then, uh, knowing that there's some certainty beyond it. Okay. Thank you, Councillor uh, Cartmel. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to my colleagues for trying to clarify the amounts uh, required and what we're going to do in the interim until the summer of 2023. Um, again, I think we're looking more at Band-Aid solutions, and I, d I don't know if if this is the, the, the right approach, and I don't want to downplay the events that have happened in Chinatown um, for, for many, many years. But in, in the report, you talk about the sort of the... Um, evidence-based crime policy and I'm, I'm just concerned is it all due to crime or is it due to public disturbance and is this the, the right approach to be taking we had one of our speakers um, in, in, in one of our um, committee meetings um, speak to the fact that the police present isn't necessarily welcomed by um, a, a lot of those that are houseless um, that are dealing with uh, drug poisoning, and I'm just wondering if any other approaches were looked at besides the criminal aspect. And, and thank you for that uh, question, Councillor. I think it's important to note that as we're bringing this presentation here, it's not just the police ask, it's working with our city partners, especially fire and EMS. The intent is to provide the right solutions to those who need it, but there is an element of criminality in what we're seeing within, and violence in what we're seeing within these neighborhoods, and we do need police resources to address it, but that's not going to be the panacea for everything when we're speaking about houselessness, but we do play a part in working with our city partners and our community partners at Councillor Stevenson brought up to see in this plan. So it's not just going to be a one size fits all, but we do need to be able to leverage the different authorities that we have with our respective partners. Okay. It, it just seems to be heavy on the side of, of EPS rather than working with those other social partners. Um, and, and then I'm just wondering about the, the impact. If you're draw, drawing on other res resources, does that include like um, the traffic operations and speed enforcement? Because I, I know in in, in many of the, the wards, constituents are concerned about speeding, and it, does that draw take away from those resources, or is it? Right now, we haven't uh, taken away from those, like the traffic resources. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I had some other questions here, but I'll I'll go on, and if I need to, I'll come back for a second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I heard that, uh, Mr. Jones, it was seven days a week, 21 hours a day. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what we've got in the plan. Okay, and so 21 hours. Um, what was the reasoning for 21 hours and not 24? Uh, 
I think co collectively we um, we had to weigh how many resources we would need uh, compared to what the sort of the needs would be other than emergent needs uh, in the middle of the night. So I'm not sure if anyone from the EPS wanted to address that question as well, but uh, certainly it would be a, a, fall, a far taller ask uh, if it were 24 hour a day coverage. Okay, yeah, that was uh, my other questions were already answered, so thank you. Thank you, Council Principal, Council Salvador. Uh, thank you. Uh, so just want to start with a few questions, just uh, seeking some additional clarity um, and just establishing some facts. So uh, just related to timing, uh, recognize that this is sort of phase phase one of Project Connection um, that we're going to try to extend as long as possible. Um, but I guess what was envisioned for phase two? Was there always an intention to sort of come forward with a, an additional ask or service package? Um, I would say yes, Councillor. In fact, um, we had been planning uh, some sort of downtown additional ask way back in the fall and there was going to be some work towards this uh, in the fall uh, that got stopped when when there was a, a budget decision from at least from an EPS perspective and then with the emerging concerns um, we've kind of resurrected that plan and uh, when we first responded to the Chinatown in particular we did it with uh, increased resources uh, essentially taking from other spots um, and we always said that we needed to come back with a sustainable plan and that was also a, a concern voiced by Chinatown it's like okay we're, we've got this increased presence for now um, and it's not just Chinatown because we're starting to see impacts with Chinatown on places like Alberta Avenue and other other areas so we're trying to deal with it all at the same time so I would okay. always say that uh, a phase two of this type was always envisaged and required yeah. okay um well, that, that helps. So there was always that intention to come forward. Uh, I guess a secondary question, how do we know if Project Connection is, is working? Just in terms of uh, evaluation metrics associated with that. I know it's only been up and running for, I think, end of May. Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, right now we've got anecdotal evidence, anecdotal sort of thoughts about the sense of safety, but it's also caused some in, uh, increased tensions as well. As uh, Councillor Wright uh, it explained as well, I think uh, the presence uh, and uh, has also caused some um, uh, tension with Chinatown businesses and uh, houses uh, folks who, who are reacting to some of the presence. Um, so, but we do owe some data to Council and I would say we'd be in a position to present that in August or September with, with more time. Okay. And it's quite frankly part of our uh, commitment to Chinatown in terms of measuring uh, success as well as our commitment uh, in our public safety plan that was presented to the province. Okay. Um, and then I guess just a larger question because to me this, this very much looks like a service package and we just had a fairly long conversation uh, where we heard arguments in favor of funding formula so that EPS can allocate resources according to um, you know, emerging operational priorities. And we, we heard strong argumentation against the service package approach. Um, now, council has given direction to move forward with a funding formula. Um, so I'm trying to square that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's a good question. I remember, as you know, the funding formula is suspended right now. So we're operating in a suspended funding formula. I think as we prepare details for the funding formula, we can certainly include things like this in it when we present to council uh, later in the summer before the budget. Uh, and maybe there's a point if council approves the funding formula that uh, with that approval, we can transition from this service package approach for this thing into that funding formula. So I think as, as we present to council recommendations on funding formula, we should probably also present how we would transition this type of ask into that funding formula so that it doesn't, we're not doing both. Yeah, I just, I'm just trying to be sort of hyper aware of yeah. the, the doubling up. Yeah, but uh, presently uh, yeah. that funding formula is suspended, so we're in that mode right now. Okay, um, then just a question around the unified operational command structure. Uh, really trying to understand the governance model a little bit more and, and understanding who teams would actually be reporting to, recognizing that the longer term intention is to loop in other uh, organizations and agencies. What would that look like? 
Yeah, so it's essentially uh, at the highest level, it's the chief of police and myself and whatever uh, social agency we identify or will collaborate with us to, to get this going. Uh, in this case, we're also adding the fire chief because of the, the fire prevention aspect of it, which is an important part of the ask, those three additional people to look at the safety aspect of that. And uh, the head of EMS for Edmonton would be part of that governance structure as well. Okay. And I, the I idea is at the highest level, the, the four or five of us would discuss how things are going, give direction for the operations to, to carry on. Okay, so it would be multidisciplinary at its at its core as well. I just want to try to understand who that backbone organization or organizer is, but it sounds like it's it would be shared. Yeah, essentially, it's a yeah. shared governance structure. Yeah. Uh, it will be bigger than what we did for transit tra with transit safety, for example. It was chief, myself, and uh, Bent Arrow. For this one, it would be larger because we would add the fire chief, EMS, and then we just haven't identified. Uh, and I think it, in this case, because it's a broader area, it's not one social uh, sector person, it's probably a team of them. Right, thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you, Constable Salvador. Constable Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanna just pick up on the question of Councillor Salvador, because I, I had the same question around the funding formula versus service packages, and I understand that this funding formula was suspended for 2022, but this is talking about 2023, 2024, and beyond. So I'm also concerned about the, the discourse around potentially needing to approve today because it seems like a bit of a chicken before the egg or egg before the chicken, whichever debate you, fo you follow there. Um, so could you just kind of walk me through that a little bit, Mr. Corbold? Yeah, sure, Councillor. And I think the issue here is that we're, you know, we've now got direction to transition into a funding formula, which we still have to put together and, yeah. and demonstrate to Council. Uh, in the meantime, we're also trying to satisfy the public safety issues in Chinatown and the downtown core to the satisfaction of the people that work and live there. Um, and so I would say it all boils down to that we're in a transition phase here. Uh, but I think, as I said, indicated before, as we present the funding formula recommendations, we can also include how things like this package, if it were to be approved, could be uh, transitioned into that funding formula. If it's not approved today, then it's less of an issue because we'll have the funding formula in front of council yeah. before uh, that that budget decision yeah. is made. But on the other hand, we also wanted to explain to council that there's a lead time to these things mm -hmm. uh, because it takes four to six months to Absolutely. recruit folks. So. Um, I guess my question to Edmonton Police Service then is, was your strategic plan also suspended when the funding formula was suspended? No, I think this fits right into our strategic plan. Okay, because the first point in says balance, support, and enforcement places a spectrum of EPS resources in close proximity to locations where high harm offenses are likely to take place and can be deferred, but also put, provide supports to vulnerable people affected by mental health and addictions. That's right in your strategic plan for 2020 to 2022. So I guess I'm, can, I'm trying to really square away how, if the strategic plan wasn't suspended, how did we get to where we are today? For sure, so, and, and thank you for that question. And I'm sure you'll remember that December 8th, we were here speaking about what we were going to be doing with our scheduled increase in terms of the funding formula that was there. At that point, we had articulated that we saw that the spike that was happening within downtown Chinatown 118, that we needed to have a multidisciplinary approach to be able to address that. That's what we brought to council on December 8th and a decision was made and now we're here regrouping, thinking about how we can move forward with it but still understanding that there's a lead time. So this always fit into the strategic plan. This is the plan that we had brought forward. So, but there was then without that, with that decision of council then what I'm understanding is even with the evidence showing that there was hot spots in this area, we, we did not redeploy resources there. So when we think about our strategic plan from 2020 to 2022, we have, these are our goals, and these goals still remain even with the funding formula being suspended. And so we are constantly pivoting on how we're gonna achieve those goals. And so yeah. when we think about the multidisciplinary teams, as mentioned, that was a part of our plan, but then when we were reduced in the planned growth money, we had to pivot. Mm -hmm. And now we were asked to come back and provide what that funding would look like to actually sustain this. And this is why 
this is showing our strategic alignment and showing what it would take to achieve. Oh, that it. makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. And then in the report, there's sort of a discrepancy between the administration report and the Healthy Streets business plan in terms of the distribution of crime. So in the administration report attachment, I believe, the, the first attachment that sort of talks about best practices, it talks about that it creates that diffuse, but it also helps, you know, that you don't see the crime really distribute to other communities. But in the, the police report, it talks about the risk being the, the displacement of crime. And so I, again, I wanna make sure we're not just shifting the issues. If we're spending $18 million, are we actually making Edmonton safer? as a whole. So part of um, our planning that we do, so when we think about what we have in our um, community policing bureau, we do have our suppression and disruption teams. And so this multidisciplinary team is really focusing on, on that off-ramping, on making sure that we can provide the right resource to the, the vulnerable people that we encounter at the time. And so that, that in itself is being able to mobilize that and, and ensuring that we have those teams in place, but then we also have our disruption and suppression teams that we've had already in our, in our planning process that deals with crime that would be in other areas. And I don't, I, yeah, and if I can just add to that, um, it's been a juggling act all along, so I don't want to create the impression that we weren't doing anything in the downtown core before. We were using these teams as crime started to spike or the problems. And if you remember in the LRT this winter, there was a lot going on. Disruption teams were down there working side by side with our uh, LRT peace officers. So we've been juggling all along with a plan to try to put something more uh, permanent in the downtown core because this is probably one of the, the hottest spots in Edmonton right now as far as crime. And if we were able to do that, then the disruption and suppression teams would be able to not only complement them, complement them when needed, but also start paying more attention to some of the other areas. Because if that displacement starts happening, we need to be flexible and be able to react to it. Okay. Okay, thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much. Councillor Tang. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I want to continue on the multidisciplinary safety team idea um, and just want to better understand. So we're here talking about another form of multidisciplinary team or is it HELP 2.0? The foundations of HELP is the foundations, the same principles here, essentially leading with strengths and combining the resources that we have kind of across the city. But HELP is going to be focusing more on case management. This is going to be focusing on upfront visible um, uh, patrols and deployment. And I think the other element that this brings is the EMS element and the fire element that don't exist in uh, HELP teams, I would say, right. at, at, a, at a higher level. Right, and, and, but we do have other multidisciplinary team within the city involving fire and EMS focused specifically on problem properties. We also have COT um, focused around areas in and around transit centers. So would this, I guess, building also coordinate all those teams? Yeah, I think what you'll see over time, Councillor, is, is an amalgamation of all that. I mean, it, it, for instance, some of this is the same players, right? Fire chief yeah. is involved in several of these things, and uh, this is a very specific response to the downtown and Chinatown uh, piece that, that we thought was important given our dialogue, and you know, many of the councillors were in those dialogues with Chinatown. So, um, it, but it's, I would say it's taking that same approach, uh, adding to it as we go along for, for that, because it's, it's working in other places like transit and, right. and other places. Um, and so the center would, quote, will create a joint deployment and team building across diverse teams. Um, and so currently, um, the Wichitoan building does not do that. Is that right? It's a full capacity, Councillor. Okay. So we're kind of looking at a second, second location. Okay. Um, I guess I'm also curious, you know, you had a really good question in the GBA plus um, where when we talk about safety and security, it's important to ask for who. Who is the center for specifically? Like who would be the end user? We're talking about like people who are experiencing on the streets. Sorry, well, I would say um, 
the people that will, will, in terms of the end user, the people that will see the benefits of this uh, include Chinatown residents and businesses, but also um, houseless people that are on the streets who are also um, vulnerable and being preyed on by some of the criminal element. I, so it's about helping okay. everyone who needs help uh, from a safety perspective. Um, right. And that's, that's why the multidisciplinary approach has been taken. So the idea is um, if it's medical support you need, EMS is there to make sure that medical support's required. If it's social supports from housing to, um, to shelters, then that is immediately available. If it's a fire prevention so issue, that can be done. Yeah, so I think earlier Councillor Stevenson had a question around kind of where is the service provider on this and I have, I guess I have a similar question in terms of where's the end user and I appreciate that you have seven days to pull this together and and you also did mention that you might, that you will prepare some of the data or evaluation related to those th three month deployment. Um, for me, I mean, I think it's really important we have a proof of concept which, you know, on something as complex as this you need like so many different stakeholders and I think end users, people, like what is the interaction that's gonna be happening at the center and on the streets? Um, that's gonna be different from what's happening right now. Um, and I think that's important data that for me, I'll certainly be looking for. Yeah, understood, Councilor. Yeah. Do you wanna add, okay. Um, I'm just curious about location wise. I know there was a conversation previously about a station in city center mall. I'm curious where that's at. Or is that a thing at all? Uh, not a station. We, we have, there's like uh, an office space that the, the members go to uh, to do reports and, and that kind of thing. But it, it's not like a storefront. It's like an office. It's yeah. just an office that's not marked with policing or anything. Yep. Is that in place? Yep. Okay. Um, and is that some sort of similar concept to where you're increasing the presence to alleviate a bit of a, that perception? Yeah, even with this building, it's not going to be a station that's going to be, um, that somebody's going to be staffed there all the time so that the community can it's come joint. in. It, it's a joint and it's an office where they, they come in, they meet, they might look at the files that they're going to be looking at, uh, what they're going to be doing for the day, and then they'll go out and deploy from there. Okay. I'm, I'm out of time. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put a motion on the floor. Um, I'll move that the police funding be increased by $2.9 million starting in 2023 and decreased by $2.9 million in 2025. That one-time funding of $1.6 million be added to the police budget in 2023 and that police funding be increased by $2.9 million in 2023 and decreased by two point... This, sound, this sounds weird. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, decreased by $2.9 million in 2025. Uh, to support a healthy streets operations operation center in Chinatown, and I think the wording is uh, is off there because one of those is community services, I believe. Yeah. Can second. Yeah. Council Cardinal Before second. We second uh, yeah, we, we need we need actually need a is. motion on the uh, on the on the deck because I have n need explanation. It's the this. motion I shared with you. Oh, you yeah, did? Yeah, but oh, with clerk? And the clerk, it's been shared with the clerk. I just so believe. Before I'm going to add it into eScribe, if I can get the clarity that we need on what the motion actually is. So, Councillor Hamilton, what would you like us to change, please? That the, it's doubled up here. I, one of them should be community, community, sa like, com like community safety. Which one? Uh, the second one. That where it says public safety. Okay. Give us two seconds, we're yeah. gonna load it into eScribe and I'll share it in the chat. I, I, has this been shared with administration, Councillor Hamilton? I be believe it has, yeah. Was it just sent to administration now or? Councillor Hamilton? I believe they've seen it, but I can send it to them now, again. We'll, sh we'll share it just so that we're sharing the right versions. That would be super helpful. Okay. 
Okay, can you read it again, Councillor Hamilton, please? That the police funding budget be increased by $2.9 million starting in 2023 and decreased by $2.9 million in 2025. That one-time funding of $1.6 million be added to the police budget in 2023. That community safety funding be increased by $2.9 million in 2023 and decreased by $2.9 million in 2025 to support a healthy streets operations center in Chinatown. Okay, what do you like? Sorry, sir. Sec no, second by Councillor Cartmel. Okay, would you like to I'll briefly introduce it. Yeah. Um, this follows up, I believe, on the recommended funding tranches outlined in the report. The report did not come with a recommendation, but this would allow the Healthy Streets Operations Centre uh, to, um, to gear up for 2023, um, and I believe would probably help bridge um, there is the question of bridging between now and the beginning of 2023, but it would help the center um, become operational with its own tranche of support, uh, of funding support. Um, this doesn't uh, negate the impact of a funding formula, but given that the funding formula has yet to be determined and will take effect in 2023 in whatever form this council decides, there is a gap that we need to uh, fill in the meantime. Um, so, okay. and I believe that's what we've sort of been discussing this morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. So we have a motion on the floor, moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Councillor Cartmel. And questions remaining. Uh, everybody had it on first round. I didn't. So, Councillor uh, Knack, can you please take the chair? Uh, I've got the chair. Thank you. So, Mr. Corbold, uh, the, this has been... Uh, identified, where's Ms. Corbo? Here you go. This has been identified as a need from the community and uh, and you s understand that you can stretch the res existing resources with EPS as well to continue until December and uh, then you need certainty moving forward, right? Yeah, I think that's a that's fair assessment, uh, okay. Your Worship. I, I think, um, you know, we, we've certainly we know for certain we can keep this up until September, which we've expressed. There's yeah. always been a question coming up from Chinatown and others that how, how do we make this sustainable? Yeah. Uh, and so this is our uh, recommendations on how to make it sustainable. Okay. So at a Chinatown town hall, there were seven provincial ministers who pledged to help the community. These were seven provincial ministers who pledged to help the community deal with uh, crime and disorder. Uh, I think we need to give them the opportunity to step up to provide support, right? So how can we do that before we debate this as part of the budget, right? I, I would say uh, we can make that formal request and, and you're right, uh, you know, Certainly, uh, a couple of the ministers mentioned that at our meeting with Chinatown that uh, specifically they wanted to help and support, yeah. but also that they very much wanted us to find a way of establishing a healthy streets operations center. That yeah. was very much a, a formal request, I would say, from several ministers when we met about our public safety plan. Yeah. Uh, so I think what we could do is we could um, have that discussion with the province immediately uh, put this business case to the province, see if they're interested in participating, and then we yeah. could I, could come back, say, early August. I I would I would I would like to amend the the motion uh, that we maybe second part that we engage with the province and report back maybe late August. So we still have time to, if province says no, then we still have time to uh, to debate this. Because I think it's really, really important that uh, we ask the people whose inaction has caused the harm to the community to be stepping up. Most of the challenges that we're seeing in Chinatown is related to houselessness. Is, is houselessness city responsibility or province's responsibility? Yeah, I would say uh, mental health addictions and houselessness are, are indeed a provincial responsibility. Right. 
and addictions causing a lot of harm to the community and to individuals, that's a provincial responsibility. So we're asking city taxpayers, property owners to pick up the pieces or pay for the consequences of lack of investment in health and lack of investment in housing. And those ministers were there saying they will step up and they demanded action from us, which we delivered. So I think it's very important that we ask them to step up as well. And they want to help, right? That's what the sense I got. So I would like to amend it, Madam Clerk, that, uh, that we add a second part, that we, the, the administration uh, request from provincial government to offset the cost of uh, the uh, the safe streets, whatever that this center is called. I'll second when we've got wording. Is, is yeah. it okay, as Chair, right now, Deputy, uh, to finalize that wording before we do it, just instead of moving it right now, because I don't have a final, yeah. final yeah. wording. Well, so. I'll, that's, that's the question I had, that's all. Yeah. You want me to take the chair back? Or cause, yeah, or cause well, it depends. Do we have the final wording of the amendments? And if not, um, maybe can I give you back the chair yeah. uh, in the meantime? In the meantime, we'll go the wording and then come back. Okay, got it. Okay, okay. good. Just, no. uh, just a point of clarity to throw something out there. So this motion doesn't actually have a funding source. So before we start debating this um, this motion, I understand that the desire was that the 2.9 million in increase, and I'm going to invite the CFO to correct me here, would be from the financial stabilization reserve starting in 2023 with a decrease by 2.9 million in 2025, and then another increase of 1.6 million be added again from the FSR, um, and that the community safety funding branch be increased by two, we just need a funding source, and it, all of the funding sources from the FSR? Yep. I'll just invite the CFO to make any amendments that we need to make to this before you continue to debate, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So you're looking for multi-year one-time money, so money for 2023 and 2024, and your funding source, if I understand correctly, would be financial stabilization reserve. If you add all of those together, you will draw yourself below the financial stabilization reserve minimum. Let's do FSR in 23 and tax levy in 24. Is that clear? It's clear, but it's you're, you're motioning tax levy outside of a normal yeah. budgetary process, okay. which has not been your practice in the past. Okay, give me a second on that then. Okay. Can I go to rest next round, Madam Clerk, in the meantime? My only concern is I'm not sure what you're debating when the yeah. motion on the floor is not clear. Could you just give us five or ten minutes to get some uh, clarity on yeah, what Yeah, please. We'll debating? take a recess for ten minutes, and in the meantime, we'll work on the other wording, too. Thank you.
So, Mr. Mayor, we've put the restated uh, motion, the budget motion, up on the floor. Okay. It's, all right, Councillor. Uh, can I? Um, before I'm just going to go to Councillor Hamilton to uh, read it back in to the to the record. Um, one that the budget be adjusted on a multi-year one-time basis to support the Healthy Streets Operations Centre as follows. Police budget be increased by $2.9 million for 2023 and $5.8 million in 2024 with funding from the Community Safety and Wellbeing Funding Held and Financial Strategies. That the police budget be increased by $1.6 million for 2023 with funding from Community Safety and Wellbeing Funding Held in Financial Strategies. And that the Community Standards and Neighbourhood Branch be increased by $2 million in 2023 and $2.9 million in 2024 with funding from the Community Safety and Wellbeing Funding held within financial strategies. Okay, good. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. And I'll go to Councillor Paquette. You're next up. Thank you. Just trying to find that mute button. Uh, yeah, so I support this motion, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, there are purists out there, I guess, who will look at this and be maybe, uh, uh not, to, not to speak yet questions only, please. Is, that, is it okay if I speak to it and then I can just log off? Yeah. If you, or oh, you need to go because there are, well, other, no, no, there no, are other questions, the meeting, but that way I'm just in and out and, uh, yeah, there might be a sub, it. there's going to be a sub, uh, uh, amendment to it as maybe you want to wait for it. Okay. Well, I won't speak to it then. And then what I will do is ask this question of administration. Um, we're looking at this, at this, at this money and, uh, you know, one of the, one of the concerns that people have, uh, is that what they would like to see, I think theoretically and, and in real life is that the efforts that cities make uh, as far as policing goes are matched with the efforts the city makes as far as social well-being goes. And so I'm wondering if there's some sort of mechanism or if there's been any contemplation about how we, how we match that uh, um, desire within public with how we um, move toward funding these things. Yeah, counselor. I, I don't know what a formula would be. Would it be dollar per dollar, or would it be, you know, need for need? Like, and and that's where it gets a little murky in, in this whole conversation. And uh, I think it's the work of council administration to sort of clear that up in order to match the public demand. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's not so much a uh, dollars per dollars in different sectors. It's it's a, a deployable assets on on the street that are helping out and and getting back to you know the questions that were asked about impacts and outcomes, which I think we'll be able to report on, on this current process. We'll be able to report better on in August. But it, uh, essentially, it's it gets back to the fundamental point that the right person is on the street to help out whatever the right need is. If it's medical, if it's uh, housing, if it's social sector, if it's criminal, whatever the issue is, the right person can respond as quickly as possible. And that's what we're trying to get at. Okay. And uh, I believe it was Councillor Salvador who was asking about metrics, about how we measure these things. And uh, do we have a plan for how we can actually measure the efficacy of dollar to effort? Yeah, I think we can uh, we can bring back that in 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 future metrics for sure. Um, I, I think how would we measure that though? I think well, I was just about to say I think there's a bit of an art to it. It's not as you know. I, I think uh, it's specific numbers. It's how people are getting settled. But but I also worry about you know the longer term, right? So for example, we've had successful graduates of Housing First that are homeless today, and uh, or houseless today. And, and that, you know, is, is a challenge as well from a, from a, from a measurement perspective. So, but we've, so we've said we all along that we have to get better data for council on all of these things. Okay. Yeah. So that's my next question. Do we, tr do we track folks on an individual basis? Like, so we know what their journey looks like. We don't track folks all the way through the system. It, it, there, the individual tracking of folks ends at a point in time that I don't think is helpful to us. I think overall we've got to do a much more comprehensive uh, review of individuals and what happens to, to them over a longer period of time. 
Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering at what point is it not helpful if we know that people are also, you know, maybe returning back to homelessness, that would kind of be helpful, wouldn't it? It would be very helpful. And uh, we have some information of that, but I don't, I just don't see a full picture of that all the time. And I'll just see if, if Ms. Kajenner wants to add to that. Uh, sure. Th thanks, Mr. Corbold. Uh, so we, d so people in Housing First are tracked um, for the duration that they're in the program for, which is usually a year to 18 months. Um, we Homer Trust doesn't indefinitely track people forever and ever, but there is off off obviously a require a need to better link um, returns to homelessness through incorporating the shelter data and data for people who are coming out of um, apartments and going back into shelter uh, and having that flagged in the system. So they are able to do some analysis in terms of how many people are new to homelessness versus how many people are returning. But it's not, I think, at the degree that we be um, that maybe is desired in this conversation currently. Although I would say these types of solutions that we're looking at today were in, with interdisciplinary, if we adequately include or agencies like Homeward Trust, we will be able to better make those connections and then intervene earlier if somebody is to return to homelessness. Okay, because uh, I believe that in like procurement is taking a look at how to aggregate, aggregate data like this and, and anonymize it. So I wonder if there's a way to work across branches to sort of figure this out. The answer is yes, Councillor, and, and quite frankly, it's part of what we committed to doing as part of the community safety and well-being strategy. And remember, the top of each pillar had uh, a much more robust data collection and analysis aspect to the community safety and well-being strategy. So that's where I see this work coming to fruition. But yeah. as we also indicated when we brought that to Council, it's going to take six months to a year to actually see that uh, come through. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor uh, Nack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So uh, with some of the questions, I'm just maybe going to look to the clerks for guidance first. Um, easy to refer a motion on the floor, but uh, providing direction as to what that referral should then uh, come back with is something that we would need to have some more detail on. So I've heard some conversation around finding out what the provincial supports would be to the operations of the Healthy Operations Centre. We couldn't refer the motion back and ask for that. Would we have to refer the motion and then do a subsequent motion? What's the right process to? So the reason, so if you're looking to just um, postpone discussion on this, then I would suggest that, that could, this item could be postponed over to the next council meeting. If you're looking for direction, or sorry, if you're wanting to give direction to administration or to the mayor, that needs to be passed by motion. So if you're directing the mayor to write a letter or advocate, that's a motion required. Okay. If you're referring it to admin, admin needs to know what you're referring it to them to do. So I think the primary referral or the primary thing that we would be seeking is from the mayor to find out what the provincial government is going to be contributing to this. So my question is, does that have to be a separate motion or can that be a, a point two of a referral motion essentially refer this back to the next council meeting the first one back in august and a point two being that the mayor on behalf of council advocate to the provincial government on what their contributions would be to the healthy operations center so if you refer the motion on the floor with the two parts when it comes back in august then the matter that will be on on the floor for council will be the budget adjustment as presented by councillor hamilton yep. the second part will be then a motion asking the mayor to go and advocate to the province. So I would suggest that the motion as you're articulating, it might not get the uh, direction or the um, outcome that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. So what's the right order to do? Can we do that as a, as a subsequent motion to a refer? So if we were to refer this to the August 15th council meeting, that's the first council meeting back, we could in fact then do a subsequent motion that the mayor do that between now and the same amount of time and bring forward that that additional detail I would look to the chair to make that ruling but typically okay. when you refer an item off of your agenda that is when the item ends mm -hmm. so look to the chair and to yourself to figure out how you want to manage this forward if you're looking for it sounds yeah. I could be wrong but yeah. it's entirely possible that you want to postpone a vote on this motion is that correct? Okay. Well, we can postpone that, and then we would still have the opportunity to, to vote on additional information. Wow. Well, I know that's not ideal, but I think there has been a request to get that additional information. So. The only other option is, is the yeah, the motion could come off, but then 
we want to give direction that this motion will in fact be debated. I think there's pretty clear desire that this motion should be debated. So. Wait, what it, Madam Clerk is seeking some direct, uh, conversation. Sorry, go ahead. No, I didn't hear the question. Was there a question? No, there was, the, like, we were going to go talk to Mr. City. Yeah, Mr. I'm just Maddie. trying to get clarity on what it is. I wasn't part of the sidebar conversation, so I'm just wondering if I've missed something. No, you didn't miss. We're just seeking how to move forward on this. So there's a motion on the floor right now. If yeah. council wants to pass a referral motion, I just need instructions on what should be in I, that referral motion. I think the, Mr., with my last little bit, the, yeah. this ultimately to, to you as the chair, it's not normally process where we would do a subsequent motion to a postponement or a referral motion, mm. but I think there is a desire to get additional information yeah. to inform that. So if, if you as chair are willing to accept a subsequent motion, yeah. I could move to postpone this. Yep, yeah, then do a subsequent. And then we can do a okay. subsequent yeah. to get the information, but that would be up to you yeah. as chair. And that, that's discretionary to the chair, but uh, allowed. Madam Clerk? You make the decisions. You're well, the I'll, make, I'll make that decision then. We refer this. So you're going to refer this to admin, or are you just going to refer this to the next August to the, uh, the postpone to, to the first clear, meeting on August? I'll move to postpone this motion yeah. to the uh, August 15th council meeting. Isn't it the item? Or this whole item, yes, I guess. Uh, the item. Yeah. Yeah. To our first meeting on August? Correct. Okay. We need a seconder. Second. No. Second. Second by Councillor Jens. <laughs> okay. Any questions on the postponement? Um, I, I. Just. Yeah. We'll have to wait for the subsequent until this passes. Oh, okay. My question's on the subsequent. Yeah. Okay. So we have. Uh, here we go. That the July fourth. Uh, can Councillor Nack? Can you can you read that, please? Into. Yes. So I would move that the. July 4th, 2022 Community Services Report and the motion on the floor be postponed to the August 15th, 2022 City Council meeting. Got it. And as a quick introduction, because yeah. I know that seems odd, but I imagine the question folks would have is what, what would potentially a subsequent be if one were to be made after this? And I think it's something along the lines of that the mayor on behalf of council engaged the provincial government to determine how they will be supporting the Healthy Streets Operations Center um, example, mental health supports, housing support, shelter operations. Got it. That could not be made until an appropriate yes, until time. Until we but, deal with this. But that is likely what a good subsequent might be to okay. try to get us there. Good. All right. So please, any questions on, uh, on the uh, postponement motion on the floor? I'll just wait for the deck to be cleared. And I'll maybe just go through the list. Councilor Cartmel, any questions on this? No. Councillor Jans, any questions on this? Councillor Jans, any questions on no. this? No. Okay. Councillor Stevenson, any questions on this? Not on this, no. Okay. Councillor Tang, any questions on this? Uh, I guess just a quick one. <clears throat> so, Mr. Corbell, you mentioned um, that you'll bring back some data. Would you then bring it back at this, this one as part of the whole package then? No, I, I think we had planned to bring that data back um, uh, later in August or early September in terms of okay. how the first three months are going, but that would be as part of a regular update and depending on what we have, we can either do it by memo or, or a report to council, probably a report to council would be better. I guess I'm just, you know, I, I think for me that that data would be actually quite important in making budgetary decisions and I'm just wondering if there's a way to, to consolidate these many reports that yeah, are I, coming at different, different, I feel like we're trying to make a budget decision but the data to support that may not come until a few weeks later. So that's kind of the attention for me. Yeah, and for me, the other attention, of course, and you would understand this, is the, the quality of data, which we need a Absolutely. bit of time on. And, uh, you know, because we, we've had a lot of conversations about how much is weather a factor on transit safety versus, you know, uh, encampment safety and those kinds of things. So I think, you know, we, we want to work through all that um, to, to bring that back. And I just can't see us bringing that back by the 15th of August at this rate. Yeah. Because yeah. we've only had, you know, essentially six weeks really so I guess that's question to the mover or the chair like how important is that for, for you so I've heard a sense of urgency from some of our partners around the timeliness of a decision and so I, I appreciate the tension 
the reason I said August 15th is because that is the first meeting back and I've heard that folks at DPS might be able to make that work but the longer we go the more challenging it is and so I've left that date by choice but appreciating that you have raised some really good points around how and it just a friendly process. reminder when you postpone something so you lay it over from one meeting to the other administration does not have an opportunity to update the report because the matter is before you and you are just delaying the decision so if you're okay. seeking additional information that would need to occur either through a memo or through an additional report added to that agenda got it mr. Gorbel I, I was just gonna say your worship I mean just talking to EPS we, we, we can't bring a comprehensive data analysis but we can bring as much data as we can uh, over the first sort of two months of operations uh, and, and it won't be I think all super conclusive but um, we'll do what we can in the update certainly at that first council meeting okay. and we could do that as part of a verbal update I think if that's helpful okay. Good. Good. thank you thank you Ms. Corbold. Uh Councillor Wright any questions on this uh, yes, please. Um, I, you've mentioned uh, four to six months lead time. So, and this is for 2023. So whether we post it's a referral, it's a referral at this time. I said, uh, sorry, it's a postponement of this report to the next meeting. So please focus your questions on the postponement. Okay. So by postponing it to August, does that reduce your lead time for the funding to be available for 2023? Yes, it does. And what, I guess, what impact will it have? Because by my calculations, if four to six, if this wasn't going to be in place until 2023, we still have six months for it to, for it to start in 2023, right? I think a part of what we had proposed in the business plan was that planning part of it, recruiting, making sure that we can get things in place. Even for EPS, it's longer than six months. So we can't do any of that unless we, we know that we have the funding for this. I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking, knowing it's in place, if you know in, in a, another month from now, <clears throat> um, you still wouldn't have the funds in place until 2023. But, it, and I, I think I understand what you're trying to say, but it does take a tremendous amount of planning and uh, to be able to now organize recruit classes and understanding where we are going to be backfilling within our business. So we presented this in December of last year, planning to be doing that work this year. Now we're still in we're July 3rd, 4th. Um, having the discussion of how we're going to be able to initiate that planning. So in order to do that work, we need some certainty first and foremost, and then start doing the comprehensive work of recruiting and staffing across the city. And, and I'll just add to that that the reason why we put the funding for 2023 is so we will have those people in place by mid-year. That's why we don't need it in 2022, because we won't have those people in place until mid-year of 2023. But And in, in the interim, you'll be staffing from current resources yep. and okay um <clears throat> I, I do think it's important to get that information from the province so okay, thank um, thank you thank you councillor right councillor rice questions on the uh, postponement oh uh, yes go ahead so it's my first one yeah we are on the postponement now so so I do have a concern for this postponement. And then, can you tell me what's really big difference you could make and to refer this motion, the previous motion, postponed to August, one month later? To me? And the question to the mover? Okay, go ahead. Uh, to the mover. Thanks for the question. I, I've heard through some of the discussion today from a, a number of our colleagues a desire to find out what specifically the province will be doing as part of their contribution. And, and so my understanding would be that by postponing it this amount of time, we could get an answer one way or another as to whether they will be contributing, whether they won't, but, but we would have that information to help inform our final decision. But the key point here is the funding source. The funding source we already identified as a financial strategy. The financial strategy funding source doesn't matter this year or next year or one month later. So if we have a funding source available already, 
and we still, why we need to hold our action on this urgent needs to address the safety concerns and is a hot pot and area. And the funding source is already there. And then if we can uh, pass the funding source available and then for our EPS and also for our city administration to take action right away. And we still have time to collaborate with province. And then if we can get response from province, that money could offset what we are approved here. So I didn't see the value and for the postpone for the previous motion. And specifically, and that this conversation, I believe, between the city and the province is already underway. And for another key point here is this is a part of our city uh, community safety and well-being strategy. And our strategy is already implemented a few months ago with 11 actions identified. This is just add another actions and why we need to hold this urgent needs and for another month. And I, I didn't say that by you. And so that is my question. And I do believe, I do believe the previous motion and the indicated funding source and the timeline very clearly. And then I didn't say <laughs> the impact could or the difference it could make and for the key points. Is that for additional response or? Uh, yeah. Uh, hmm? uh, question to, yeah, sure. question to the mover. Sure, sure. And then even for me, I would, I would like to amend the previous motion as well. Uh, we don't have this at this time. We are. Uh, uh, okay, I understand yeah. we were on the postponed. Yeah. So, so to provide a, a further response, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts here. Um, I think back to uh, late last term, council was um, made with a decision, had a decision before us related to things like shelter operations. And we uh, immediately stepped up uh, because it was the right thing to do to try to uh, fill what was some pretty substantial gaps. and. Unfortunately, afterwards, we didn't necessarily see the um, order of government who's ultimately responsible for shelter operations to, to meet with us and uh, help fulfill those gaps. And so I, I do think there is a worry, personally, I won't speak for anyone else on council, that if we um, don't have this holistic conversation, because I, I think right now from what I've read in this report, we've got a lot of great enforcement um, mechanisms here. I haven't seen anything related to the social supports. Um, Bissell Center is operating on reduced hours. Encampments are set up along the street. And this doesn't solve that part of it. And so spending money just on enforcement without understanding how we're going to deal with this other piece, for me personally, feels like a, an incomplete picture right now that I don't have. Um, uh, can, I, can I just respond that? And then <clears throat> specific uh, Only ask questions. Yes. And then my question is for this, uh, specifically this item we're talking about, their operational model insight in the report and the very detailed outlined and how this health street center could be operated. And that piece you say, you say is missing, actually in the report, very clear. <clears throat> and this support is already there. And the plus, and in our, uh, from our uh, CSWB strategy, community stra safety and the well-being strategy, and we already trust all this and social, social services support and in the multidisciplinary team. And this is okay. the basic piece for that, right? Time goes And can I, uh, yes. Thank can you. I just ask confirmation and from Mr. Kobo? Sorry, confirmation on? Yeah, for the social services and in this operation model is already and addressed it. Yeah, I believe it is. I, I think part of this was catching up in many ways with, uh, with all the other funding we've done with social services. And remember the area of operations we're talking about is quite frankly, uh, has a, it's the epicenter of social services in the downtown core. Um, but we can definitely um, explain that 
if, if this item is deferred. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rice. So before I go to Councillor Knack to close, I just need more <laughs> clarification on a process-wise from Madam Clerk, and that is that the uh, subsequent will not be in order. So the process we can take, which may not be as burdensome, is that once if this passes, that uh, counselor, our counselor be uh, allowed to make a motion without customary notice to make a subsequent. That the right process, Madam Clerk, right? Yep, and the reason being is once you actually postpone an item and you deal with it, it's no longer on your agenda. Yeah. It's been dealt Got with. It. So I would say it's your decision, but again, I would uh, suggest you stick with your No, I, 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 I value your advice, and I'll stick to your uh, advice. And that, subsec uh, that notice without customary notice will be at the end of the agenda or could be done after the item is con this item is concluded? Again, that's up for council to determine. Okay, got it. Okay, okay good. Okay, Councillor Nack to close. Nothing further, thank you. Okay, please. All right. Please vote on the postponement. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is postponed to August 15th. Okay, would someone... Mr. Mayor, could I yep. move that Councillor Knack be able to provide a motion without customary notice? Yes. Need a second? Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Please vote. All the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now, Councillor Nack. Thank you. Uh, I think we have the final wording that so I'll start reading it out. That the mayor, on behalf of council, engaged the provincial government to determine how they will be supporting the Healthy Streets Operations Centre, example, mental health supports, housing supports, shelter operations. And I'll second that. You want to make an introduction, Councillor? Just, Nack? I, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. We, we've been talking about uh, what I think some of us would like to have additional information on. Uh, this is important for me personally. This is important information to help inform um, what the right mechanism is and to make sure we have a, a truly holistic solution that doesn't simply rely on one specific area. So um, that's why I think we need to give you the opportunity to go find that out. Um, being that you've been sitting in on those meetings, you would hopefully have the best way to, best opportunity to find out those clear answers. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Stevenson? Yes, thanks very much for that. Um, just wondering, to we talked maybe about a part two in terms of administration coming back with further information about the governance structure uh, and any funds that might be required. So, appreciating your point, Mr. Corbold, that it's not necessarily social services themselves, but but again, the, the resource implications of bringing them in as part of the governance structure, I think is sort of beyond that immediate service delivery that, that we've been providing. Um, so just wondering if that, if you'd need that to be part two of this uh, motion potentially? I, I don't think we need it, Councillor, because you know that we've got a bit more time between August and we would have provided that on this one if we had. So we're gonna continue to obviously, as we always do, work in between uh, council meetings and we'll get I think we can provide that as part of the uh, verbal update plan that we present in August. Okay, great. Because just to confirm with with Madam Clerk, um, because it's because it was postponed rather than the refer referred, the report itself won't be able to be amended. But there could be additional information brought forward in a presentation. It's my understanding that this motion um, that's going to be if it, if so. First of all, the motion. Sorry. The motion will require the mayor to actually report back. So we'll be adding an item on the agenda from the mayor and the mayor and the city manager can work together to provide whatever additional resources that they have or information that they have available at that time. Perfect, so so administration could come forward with additional verbal information that could lead to potentially some additional resources being added to the motion that's been postponed. Okay, yeah. perfect. And we yeah. will do that. Great, great. Really looking forward to that. Uh, thank you so much. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jens, questions? Yeah, through you to the mover. Um, I guess I'm wondering, uh, 
as Sage Old Counselor, how do we find this line here between directing the operations of the police? Because I, I recall like during the convoy and other debates, we've been told, stay out of it. You're the political wing. You do not interfere with the enforcement wing. Is this not kind of, should we not be rendering unto Caesar and let the police decide where they have critical pressure points to operate? Well, th this motion solely asks the mayor to engage the provincial government on getting additional information. I think it's a very relevant question, but not for this motion. I think that would be a relevant co uh, question when the main motion comes back uh, on August 15th, because this is just asking the mayor to get, engage the province. Are we not kind of asking the province, though, to step in and put a few dollars down on, on, on the board somewhere, right? Isn't this, are Correct. we kind of inviting political interference into, like today it's Chinatown, what if next week it's Alberta Ave, or next week it's White Ave, or, or Lacombe, or something else, like are we? The examples that I listed in the motion would all be things within provincial jurisdiction, so I, I don't believe it muddies the waters in that way. I, uh, and again, those are just a list of examples, but I would, uh, I don't think this motion is, is looking at to interfere with policing. And I've heard the mover say, housing, 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 till he's as blue as his suit. And yet this isn't housing. And I wonder, are we, like, does the mover think when the province has so many asks and if they're hearing from us, um, what is your priority? Is this council's true priority? Like we have 170, only, only 170 day shelter spaces. We know that $9 million would open up 348 permanent supportive housing sp spaces. We know that the, the, the province themselves cut photo radar $7 million. Um, is this, I guess I'm wondering, like, you of all the things we take forward, is this what the mover thinks? Like, is this our most important, would this have the best bang for its buck in terms of public safety in Edmonton? So I think this does reference housing and the shelter supports the items we just talked about, I think, which, which I believe is this council's priority. And the primary reason for this motion is recognizing that the mayor and a number of members of council have sat in on meetings with ministers and members of the community. And what I haven't heard yet is what their portion of the response will be. And so this is meant just to get a better understanding of, of the things we've already identified as priorities. What are you doing to make sure you're fulfilling your role in partnership with, this, with the council and in partnership with members of the community who are here? Okay, okay, that's, that's really helpful because I was worried that this was waiting uh, a preference of response. So, and could the mover clarify, is the provincial surplus right now, is it 14 billion or 15 billion? Or sixteen billion. I I just can't remember how many billions. Not a, not a fair question. To okay. The mover. All right. Thank yeah. you. My time is up. My thank you, Councillor Tans. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you. I actually had quite similar questions. Um, I guess just wondering. You know, we're we're specifically saying supporting the Healthy Streets Operations Center. Um, and and to the mover, you you know you 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 mentioned that we're actually talking about the breadth of uh, of supports that would be attached to that. Um, do you feel that we're limiting ourselves then by specifically saying the Healthy Streets Operations Center? I mean, I know that that's pertinent to the discussion we had today, but I guess I, I would also worry about how that's stacking up against other priorities um, for intergovernmental relations. It's a, it's a fair comment. I think we've heard from, and again, I, I haven't been privy to those, those meetings and a number of other members of council have, um, but, but from what I understand, there is a very urgent situation that is, that is currently happening in, in this particular part of town that does require a, a very specific series of questions. So I, I feel comfortable asking this, recognizing there's still a lot of other work we have to do, and there's nothing that prevents the province in response to the mayor doing this advocacy about what they're going to do here and then ideally broadly across the city to help further address the, the issues that we're dealing with. So it doesn't prevent that, but I, but I also think um, we've got members of the community here who have been going through a lot that need, that need clear direction, and I don't want to get too far down a path that, that doesn't deal with what we're what we were specifically talking about today right okay and i'd also look if i'm getting too far into territory that should actually be in private maybe let me know um but i'm just sort of playing this out uh you know if if for example the province was keen on supporting particularly the healthy streets operation center um in whatever capacity that might look like does that then commit our involvement to the Healthy Streets Operations Center? Council will still ultimately have a vote. I, I 
I can only speak for myself that if they did choose to commit to this, I would probably be comfortable personally then advancing this as well. Um, but each member of council will, will have their own decision yeah. points. Yeah, I think that, that just places us in a challenging position. Um, okay, well, I think that, that answers my questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang and Salvador. Councillor Tang on the uh, uh, motion. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, on the floor. Questions? Yeah, um, I, I understand this is to bring back more information for the August meeting. You know, we want the province to put their money where their mouth is. And I think that'll be really important piece of information for us to help to decide. I guess the other piece that's kind of been missing for me this whole time is just solid evidence. and. I had initially wanted to do a subsequent, but I think given the way things have rolled out with the postponement and the notice without customer notice, I'm not going to. Um, and I have wondered if this, there, this, there could be like a part two to this, but I don't want to overcomplicate this either. Um, Cause I recognize that there's been, you know, we've had lots of overload of motions. Question. So my question to, I guess, to Mr. Corbell, um, I think what I'm looking for is the evidence for the feasibility in the form of like a proof of concept using tools like storyboarding and to, to this outline. This is on the letter, Councillor. I know I, I understand, but I'm trying to figure out if I want to suggest a, a, a part two, but I don't want to. And I think I just want to know if, if you, when you come back later, whether it's August 15th for that interim reporting or later on, um, would you be able to provide um, that information, that evidence I'm, I'm looking for, whether it's end user experience or how we're engaging service providers in that uh, research and development um, as sort of the second piece of information that will help this council make that decision. Yeah, I would say, Councillor, that it's, that's explicit direction we have from Council as part of our community safety and well-being. The ability to bring that level of detail, you know, three, two months into operations, we'll do our best. Um, but, but I just don't I want to manage the expectation of how detailed that analysis will be, and including sort of engaging with the people we need to engage with. So we'll do what we can on August 15th. We, we have explicit direction based on the community safety and well-being plan to come back to council. I think certainly before the fall budget with clarity on how that's going and that would be much more explicit. So. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, often the case we have to make, you know, decisions for urgency with imperfect data. We will do the best we can, but I just don't have a high level of confidence that it can bring what I think you're looking for as early as August 15th. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I guess I'm thinking about the principles of evidence-based, evidence-informed decision-making. And yep. I find that a bit lacking in this conversation. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a very important point. But but again, you know, if, if the time is a factor as well. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Councillor Rice, questions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, so, to the mover, uh, I want to focus on this location for the health Street Operation Center specific in Chinatown. Uh, in terms of the scope you mentioned here for the provincial government support, is it already in place or you are asking additional support for those things? Yeah, my, my question is, is if there's going to be further supports because from what I understand, um, there's not enough to meet the current needs, the, the, what I'm seeing in the area. So I, I do appreciate the intention for this motion, and then, but my concern is if the provincial support is already in place in terms of the three, like you mentioned, the three categories here, and that is under the provin provincial uh, jurisdiction authority, the already there. And if you look at how much social services is already centralized in the Chinatown, is already there. And then do we get any meaningful response 
and from province and by this one month That's a time. great question. So, so I really appreciate it. So I get a sense of, of the worry is, is through, by wording it the way it is, I think there's a fear of, is this looking to add yeah. more to the area? And in fact, I would argue the complete opposite. So we have 453 units of housing that will be ready to open uh, any day now. And if those get the operational dollars, we can get 453 people, which unfortunately have primarily been in the core and in the, the Chinatown area, out of those areas into housing where they're going to have 24-7 support. So I, I'm actually, uh, my view on this is that I'd like to know what they're going to do so we can get folks out of this area where we have over-concentrated them for so long. Okay, so then my next question is to the administration, Mr. Kobo. So in case if we cannot get the information back, my August 15th. So do we still continue postpone the previous motion or what is our uh, steps to respond to these needs and from a high risk area? Well, well that'll be up to council. Uh, we will do our best. I can probably have the draft letter for the mayor tomorrow. We will do our best to try to get an answer, but I can't guarantee how long it'll take to get an answer from the province. And if we don't get an answer, we will be back here on the 15th of August and we'll see what council decides to do at that point. Um, a lot of sense, and can we make a little bit of word, wording change and to focus on what we really want? I do want to discuss with this as mayor. I, I know you want this later going out. Uh, I support the intention, but how we can get really the information we wanted to make that decision. And maybe some like wording change needed for this. Do you agree and to the mover? Uh, I'm happy to uh, potentially accept a friendly amendment. Yeah. I, I don't know Do what you have any change, changes, Councillor Rice? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think it because this operation center actually is our city's business. And then to ask proven provincial, yes, from that strategic level and the strategic priorities, and we talk about collaboration between two orders governments, but from uh, operational perspective and how we can ask the province to support our operational center. So can we make a little bit of trick for the wording to really get meaningful support and from province? So I, I'm re I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm a count on uh, administration to, hopefully I express my concern clearly and. I, I would say, Councillor, that I think the wording is help, is good as it is. Uh, and I, the reason I say that is because this letter will go to the province in the context of us also going back and forth with the province on our uh, public safety plan, which uh, has been submitted to the province. There's been several discussions. And so I think it falls well within that context, and the way it's worded, I think, is good as it is for, for what we're looking for. Okay, I respect and your judgment for that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette, uh, questions? No to speak? Okay. So that concludes the questions. Now to speak, Councillor Paquette, to speak. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I support this motion, heart and soul. Uh, it's it's time for uh, the city and the province to really um, start walking side by side on this issue. And if this is one of the ways we get there, that would be wonderful. Um, I, my hope is that um, the things that the, the, the terrible events that have happened um, have sort of shaken things up a little bit and maybe where the province may have thought that on a city level, we've been exaggerating the need. Um, my hope is that they're starting to, to recognize that uh, this is real. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming that Alberta Municipalities is working on communications with the province because this is not just an Edmonton problem. And uh, if this is one of the ways that we can start building a relationship that gets to the results that Edmontonians need, um, then uh, fantastic. There is no harm in any way of, of trying uh, this avenue. And uh, my only hope is that the province uh, feels the same way. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I see no one else to speak. So I'm gonna ask Councillor Jens to take the chair and I'm gonna say a few words. So taken. Thank you. So I think it, this motion is, is necessary because uh, 
over the last uh, uh, while, particularly since the tragic incident that took the lives of two uh, of our beloved members from the Chinese community. Uh, we are having a number of conversations with the province uh, and really making evidence-based case why Edmonton should be getting the support that we need. We get one-third of the permanently funded shelters compared to Calgary. And province is listening on that, so I want to give them credit. They are listening to uh, at political level, they're also listening at administrative level. We also know that uh, Edmonton gets the lowest per capita funding to support ending houselessness in Edmonton compared to seven other cities that province funds. As a matter of fact, we got about 50% less compared to Calgary. And we had a good conversation with the Premier, with uh, Minister Chandru and Minister uh, 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 Minister Casey Madhu on that. They're listening to us, and which is good, and they're listening at administrative level too. And I go back to the meeting that we had with the community. There were seven ministers that came to meet with the community. And a number of them stood in their meeting saying that they want to support a center like this. And I think it's very important for us to go back to them and say, okay, we are working on this with EPS and commission, and how are you going to support this? I think they deserve to have that opportunity to engage with us. It's very important. That's why it's, uh, we'll see what they say, but I think uh, uh, I, I am optimistic that they will uh, uh, be true to their words. Right? When they stood in front of the community that this is what they need, and this is what they're going to do, and then we need to make sure that uh, we are engaging with them to uh, give them an update what we're doing and ask for their uh, part partnership in, uh, in, in that. So that's why I, uh, I really want to thank Councilor Nack for work working with the administration and Kirk to craft this. And I'll take the chair back. And I'll go to Councilor Nack to close. Uh, I think it's been discussed. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, that's number... Oh. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, Councillor Rice, yes? What is it? Uh, before <clears throat> we move to the next item, I just want to get some procedure clarified. Uh, if we cannot get response by August 15, and then for the next council meeting, do we still going forward for the previous motion, or that, what's the process? Is there any motion we need? No, subsequent that, motion? So this the report will come back to us on August 15th. At that time, council If will, not, will, will I said, what if? The report is coming back to us August 15th anyways. Whether we hear back from the province, this the report that we postponed is coming back on August 15th. On uh, August 15th, yeah. without yeah. any new information. That is what I Whether asked. we hear from the province or not, that report will be scheduled on the agenda for 15th of August. Yes, okay. Yep. So for clarity, the first motion that you postponed included the report, so that's already on your August 15th yep. agenda. The motion that you just passed actually requires the, city, the mayor, the mayor is required to provide a report to that agenda. Okay. Yep. okay. That's the clear. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, okay. I don't see anyone else on the, so 6.3 was approved. We have... Next item, 6.4, small-scale sanction encampments. This was exempted by Councillor Jens, and is the presentation on this? I believe it is, yeah. Okay.
Good morning, council members. First, I'd like to introduce the following city staff who are here with us today in person to answer questions. We have Crystal Kajenner, who is Director of Social Development, and Caitlin Beaton with Social Development as well. The report before you today provides a response to the motion passed by City Council on June 20th, 2022, that administration provide a report outlining options, including funding requirements, to pilot one or more small-scaled small sanctioned encampments this summer, 2022, as one strategy to support the safety and well-being of people experiencing homelessness and reducing impacts to surrounding businesses and communities. We appreciate Council's desire to be innovative and look for new solutions to addressing the needs of people sleeping in encampments and to surrounding businesses and communities. So far, there's a lack of consistent and compelling evidence on small-scale encampments being conducted in other jurisdictions. Different cities have had different experiences with sanctioned encampments, and comparison across jurisdiction is difficult due to significant differences among weather and climate, jurisdictional responsibilities, the complexity of individuals experiencing homelessness, population size, and local housing market conditions, all which factor into the decision to pursue a sanctioned encampment. In instances where sanctioned encampments have been successful, they are typically initiated by ma and managed by grassroots volunteers, churches, or organizations. Typically, these cities have a small number of people sleeping rough, and when municipalities lead in sanctioned encampments, the cost balloon as the city adds services such as securities and amenities to decrease the potential associated risks. As requested, administration has set out to create a sanctioned encampment pilot plan that would align with the City of Edmonton's community safety and well-being goals and align as closely as possible with the minimum emergency shelter standards. We will present a pilot option that strives to increase the likelihood of connecting clients to services and housing by allowing them to remain in one place with on-site services available, increase the safety and security of individuals in the sanctioned encampment with the presence of on-site medical services and a third-party private security company, reduce the potential neighborhood impacts associated with encampments such as litter and needle debris by having the site contained and easily acceptable to cleaning crews, reduce the potential negative impacts to surrounding businesses and communities, and finally be complementary to the community efforts to address homelessness that Edmonton is facing. When we take all of these factors into consideration, the cost to operate sanctioned encampments becomes as or more expensive to run than overnight shelters or bridge housing on a per person basis. With this in mind, coupled with a short timeline to establish and operationalize the encampment and work in partnerships with impacted neighborhoods, administration does not recommend moving forward. If City Council wishes to explore alternatives to existing housing options for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, direction could be provided to administration to undertake a more detailed planning and analysis of the feasibility in piloting a weatherproof, year-round solution such as micro shelters or a tiny home village that can be designed and planned to be operational for next spring. I will note the work is also underway to plan for winter shelter options that could also be operated year-round. We will be coming to City Council later this year with further details on that work. Thank you, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, and uh, this was exempted by Councillor Jens. Thank you. Please sign up. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Jens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I want to thank administration for the very quick turnaround on this report and um, acknowledge that it was, to the clerk's point earlier, it was Council's request that this, that this come forward. Um, so I, I guess as I was looking through it, I think many of us are, are struggling a bit with the economics. That's, that's the piece here, and I think administration is as well too. Um, so when, when I look at market rent for a year for an individual could be, I, I think totals about $10,000, we could house approximately 212 or so uh, individuals for the same cost as, as this encampment. Um, I was wondering if, if we still were comfortable with with this, the the spend is there some way to do the vouchers or get that rolling? Um, it wouldn't solve the encampment pro problem right now, solution right now. But are there if if the status we we realize there's challenges with the status quo. If we wanted if we want some other course of action here, um, 
it still housing two two hundred people in market rent for a year is better than better than where we're at uh, for those twelve hundred. So I guess I'm just I'm trying to think through other courses of action or what seeing this if the recommendation is a no, what other pathways are available to us, um, short term, medium term, long term. Uh, thanks for the question, Council Jans. Um, so I think the first thing to start with is to say that yes, it's, it is very expensive to support people who are experiencing homelessness and that's part of why the case is made to invest in affordable housing <clears throat> as the ultimate solution rather than managing people in their condition of homelessness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the reason, part of the reason why the economics are such is that when you're looking at a managed encampment, we're talking about supporting people who are in, acu in an acute phase of need. They're experiencing unsheltered homelessness and they have complex needs potentially, especially we know the people who are sleeping outdoors currently in areas like Chinatown um, have some of the most complex needs out of all people experiencing homelessness. So we wanted to ensure that the budget for something like this was accurately reflecting the cost to ensure that we could support them effectively and in a way that does not have negative consequences for um, other users of the nearby spaces and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of other solutions, I think administration has put forward a number of additional suggestions towards addressing unsheltered homelessness that'll be considered through the 2023 to 2026 budget process. Some of those things include an Indigenous-led um, shelter, which is actually the concept, the planning work is already funded for that. Um, we also are looking at an enhanced encampment response team that would include multidisciplinary supports um, uh, to better uh, connect people to housing who have higher, those more higher and complex needs like we see in those areas like Chinatown. And um, we've also are currently very heavily engaged in planning for winter shelter, which um, could potentially you know, morph into the plans for winter shelter could morph into a year-round solution if that was the direction that council wanted to go in terms of managing, better man better supporting people experiencing unsheltered homelessness currently. So given this, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues or the mayor has a subsequent or a next step from here, but um, one other question while we're on it. Do we have a, like if you want to go camping in Edmonton, is there a campsite or a place to take your fifth wheel in Edmonton? Yes, there's at least one um, city-owned facility in Rainbow Valley that I'm aware of in Snow, in Snow Valley. Right, and are there's are there others? There's not a lot, Councillor, but this is one of the uh, pieces we did feed to Explore Edmonton as part of their tourism strategy that we needed to find ways to increase camping opportunities within city limits. And it's something that is being worked on by Explore Edmonton. In interesting, because I imagine that could be appealing for ma many, many folks of not, not just the unhoused, but for others. So I saw that come up in the Victoria example, but was wondering. Um, so so I, if, I guess then the so what, now what, if I could paraphrase, not this, we don't recommend taking this course. We have recommended some others, but they're not gonna come forward until the four-year budget conversations in November. So in the meantime, we're we carry on as as is today for the next three or four months with the other interventions we're already doing. Yeah, I think I mean I think the first opportunity for council to weigh in on this piece would, in terms of our normal work that we're on, that's currently underway, would be the winter shelter, which would come um, hopefully early fall. Um, you know, I want to say ideally in September we'll be here before you with the options. We're engaged in discussions right now at the admin level with the government of Alberta, and once we've advanced that sufficiently, we'll be bringing those options to council. The other piece though I would say is just, I think this is what comes out in the report, is that it's very difficult to scale up a any kind of solution rapidly and immediately um, in this space because we do have to hire dedicated support workers, like all of these options require supports on site, and to hire skilled staff, we need both some lead time to be able to, you know, to enable the agencies to do that recruitment, but then we also need the time to train them. And as well, there needs to be some um, commitment to a contract of a certain amount so that those staff can be retained, right? And so when we just react and implement solutions very quickly, it, it can be a challenge. So I appreciate that there's an urgency and an impatience on the part of council and we share that on admin side as well. But I think what we need is like the consistent approach um, that approves something over the course of the next four years, like the budget cycle. And then that way we can put in place an effective solution that is achieving the goals that council states. I mean, we can be assured of we'll achieve those goals, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan's Dan, Dan Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to admin for the, the fast turnaround on this. And, you know, I think I think it was a misunderstanding on my part that uh, I had I had understood that there was a solution that was sort of ready, ready to be rolled out um, this summer. So 
you know, appreciating that we can't, can't get anything up and running, I, I suppose the opportunity that this report provides to us is to make sure that we are ready to get up and running in the spring. So uh, with that in mind, I do have a motion I'd like to put on the floor, um, which is that administration bring forward three separate unfunded service packages to A, implement the prototypes identified through the summer 2022 encampment response strategy, B, take a hotel-based uh, approach to expanding responses to unsheltered houselessness, and C, uh, deliver a tiny home village. Second. Okay. Thank you. Can we just we need to go up first before we get seconded? So can we put it up? Madam Clerk, you have the... This is moved by Councillor Stevenson and second by Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, so again, I, um, you know, was hopeful that we could find some some low cost, uh, quick quick to deliver strategies for the summer, recognizing what a significant impact encampments are having um, for businesses and communities, and also for the folks living there. You know, I know Wetaskiwin, um had some camps set up last year that were sort of in, in the order of thousands, not even tens of thousands uh, to deliver. So I, w I was looking for a solution like that, but understand that that's, that's not possible. Um, so yeah, wanting to make sure that we are getting lined up to, to have a response in place for the springtime. So part A of this motion really speaks to the outcomes of Councillor Tang's previous motion, looking to identify prototypes that are co-created with individuals who are currently living unsheltered. I believe administration is currently working with some external researchers to do that outreach, to, to speak with folks, to develop what those prototypes would be. So this would ensure that there would be consideration of funding to actually implement those um, prototypes next summer, next spring and summer. Uh, in terms of the different options that were provided in attachment one, uh, for me, it, it seems I see that a hotel-based approach offers uh, the, the best cost benefit in terms of capital and ongoing operating. So I think that that's an approach that I'd really like to see expanded uh, next summer, or at least have the opportunity to consider an unfunded service package to do so. And uh, the tiny home village, again, I think in terms of, um, you know, intensity of land use, cost of operations. I don't know that it's, it necessarily provides the most efficient response to unsheltered houselessness, but I think it can also be an option for reducing barriers for those who may even feel uncomfortable in a more institutionalized setting like a hotel. So again, just that full, full spectrum of different options. Um, I think my only remaining question to- no. you, uh, you introduced the item and motion is on the floor. Right, so go ahead, Council Stevenson, go to questions to admit at this time, Madam Clerk. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Um, so, just in, again, in terms of like what we can be doing in the here and now, I think sort of another really critical thing I just want to get some clarity on is, is the intake process for our new PSH units that are opening up and just what work is being done to, to connect folks who are currently living in, in encampments to make sure that they, you know they are in centralized intake, that they are being prioritized, that they're getting their paperwork, their benefits in order, so that, again, when those units open up, that that, that can have a considerable impact in terms of moving people in. Um, thank, or thanks for the question, Council Stevenson. So just to be clear, Homer Trust maintains that coordinated access, which is the central prioritization system for all, essentially all affordable housing geared to people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. And so, the intake point for coordinated access is the by names list and there's over 60 agencies that feed information into that as well Homer Trust has a team of people that are constantly in contact with people on the by names list confirming that they can maintain contact locating people who they've lost contact with and working with outreach to ensure that so just because someone's sleeping outside it doesn't mean that they're not going to have access to um, potentially have access to a supportive housing unit like the team works really hard to maintain connections to p folks who are on those waiting lists for those units um, but there is a central coordination and prioritization piece and so people who've been waiting the longest will obviously be prioritized and who, who meet the acuity threshold will obviously be prioritized for those units first 
And there's no talk of potentially prioritizing folks in encampments. Well, supportive housing is a solution that often disproportionately is serving the needs of people who are sleeping outside. And that's because it's geared to people who've experienced chronic homelessness. And we know that people sleeping outside are more likely to be um, experiencing chronic homelessness than those, seeking, than those staying in shelter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Sure, so just first of all, um, one quick question that I wanna see if I, if I understood correctly. This number on the, by, the Homer Trust by names list seems to have reduced. So can admins, that's exciting if that is true. I just wanna confirm that that is true, that the most updated data shows a reduction in our by names list. Yes, there's been a slight reduction and that goes to this point that um, there's a constant effort to update and maintain the list. And so if mm -hmm. people drop off the list, if we lose contact with them for longer than six weeks, or I think it's six weeks, 90 days. sorry, 90 days, then those folks would drop off the list. Or if somebody's housed, obviously then they get off of the by names list as well too. So, but generally speaking, a reduction in the by names list reflects uh, outflow incre being higher than inflow that month, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we want to see that trend continue ideally. Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I just wanted to flag that. I think that's good news. It's small, but still good. Um, I, my question to the mover, is your intent for these unfunded service packages to be grants to Homeward Trust? No, no, uh, no I, would, I would look for a range of um, different agencies and groups that could uh, take this on. So for example, um, you know, Niganan Housing Ventures uh, acquired the Sands Hotel through the Rapid Housing Initiative. Oh, yes, I will add that I think the intent of Part B is also to, to get ourselves lined up for Rapid Housing Initiative Round 3, which I think has been announced. Um, but anyway, it would be a similar model like that, so individual service providers could uh, acquire those properties potentially. Oh, okay. And, and for example, and then the prototypes could be run out of uh, Boyle Street or... Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I get that. However, like I'm still, I have in the back of my mind our, our recent audit and, and, and again, where we're kind of, again, perpetuating the concerns of the city auditor with some of these items. So that's what's come to my mind. And my second question, I guess, to administration, would B and C be capital profiles as opposed to service packages or both? Um, I think it would be, op both of them would be largely operating unless we were to retain ownership of an asset. So if we were going to buy a hotel in the city was going to maintain ownership of it, then that would be capital. Or if we were going to buy a bunch of tiny homes and then maintain ownership, then that would be capital. But we could work um, with finance, obviously, to s bring forward the appropriate but we, packages. But I, and I, we read so many agenda packages, so I, I cannot in my mind right now think of what but didn't we just recently read one that administration is going to already be bringing a housing service package forward for the 2023 to 2026 budget yes so there's <laughs> there is the affordable housing investment plan there's actually yes. a number of service packages that councils requested on the top general topics of affordable housing and homelessness the largest and most significant being the affordable housing investment plan which was presented last week Okay, that was it to executive because that's probably where I'm thinking of it then. That's where it's in my mind. So how does this interact with that? How does this motion interact with the work that's already, like is this redundant? Is this helpful to administration? Were these things you were already contemplating? I'm just trying to understand. So the prototype work is already underway. I think this takes it a step further and asks us to bring forward funding asks as well, instead of just identifying ideas for things that could be piloted. Um, so that's how I would see part A changing what we are doing. Part B and part C, I think those wouldn't necessarily, I mean, okay, I'll say part C would not be necessarily work that we'd be contemplating doing on our own, um, okay. just because it isn't you know, the most efficient model for housing folks um, but there are some you know relative merits to it that have been identified by your colleagues and so if the council wants us to proceed in that way that would change the way that we're approaching our general work and then b i would say with rapid housing we've obviously been looking at a lot of hotel acquisitions we're also you know that's also an option those in the trailers are another option that could be explored as part of winter shelter planning so that's not necessarily a huge directional change um, in terms of work that's already underway okay that answers my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So we'll take a break here now, and we'll be back at 1.30.
and until that time we are in recess.
All right, I would like to call this meeting back to order. And we'll do a quick roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. You are Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. I think she's stepping in so soon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay, and we were on this motion on the floor that we were asking questions on and on the report. Uh, Councillor Salvador, you're next. Um, time. Okay, apologies. That is why I take my name right off. I need to get the computers. I think you have a hot mic there. Uh, you know what, Mr. Mayor? I'm actually okay. Uh, I'm going to yield my time. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question for administration. Um, so this motion looks like uh, I would like to take the report that you provided for us and maybe consider it over the four-year budget. Um, but it still doesn't address what's happening this summer. So I just... Um, does this motion preclude you from, from options for this summer or uh, would there still be things that are possible this summer that you would you could do that wouldn't require uh, a motion from council? Um, Councilor Paquette, we are, uh, we, ha we are doing a number of things this summer already as part of our encampment response that, yeah. uh, report that we brought previously. Part of that is you know, preparing for extreme weather, um, our enhanced encampment response, all the engagement that we're doing to try and identify prototypes that are referenced in this motion for this fall. So there's a lot of work underway with respect to this summer. I think if we want to yeah, look- Yeah, so all, all the things we're already aware of. That's right. I think if we wanted yeah. to look at a enhanced like shelter option for this summer, it's very difficult, like as the report outlines, it's very difficult to do that on, um, because we, staff need to be hired, need to be trained. And so the most effective way to ensure that there's um, if, if it's council's desire to increase the number of shelter spaces or ensure that there's more places for folks to go is to get that really good information and to make the plan um, going forward in advance so that we can implement it and have it in place. And so I think this report aligns with some of the other work that we have underway, including with winter shelter, which will be the first opportunity that council has to weigh in. And that may be an opportunity for you to augment um, what is currently in place as soon as possible. That's sort of the first opportunity that's coming back. But there's just a practical constraint around timing and the need to be able to fund, um, have funding in place and to be able to hire hire staff. And so it's very difficult to have something in place when we're already for this summer because of those practical constraints. Yeah, absolutely. I understand. Now, I'm assuming that we've had, uh, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I would guess that we're uh, seeing uh, a continued rapid increase in the number of people who need assistance um and so with our current strategy what's that going to look like um uh, well i think the one positive thing is I, although obviously we've seen a significant increase since the onset of the pandemic in the last f um, few months we are noticing a trend where the rate of growth and the number of people experiencing homelessness is slowing down um, so i think that that's a positive development but we do have a a number of um, solutions that we are suggesting to council that are um, would either be considered through the 2023 to 2026 budget, things like an enhanced outreach team, the Indigenous-led shelter, um, looking at winter emergency shelter, which is potentially a solution that could be extended into a year-round solution if that's what council's um, desire would be. And I think those are probably the most effective avenues for us to be able to plan and support you in decision-making um, to increase yeah. the number of shelter spaces as soon as possible. Okay, that's actually good news to hear that there might be a slow, let's hope it's a trend. Okay, so, um, and then last, um, I, I'm hearing that there might be a little bit of a um, disconnect uh, about um, people maybe not understanding that part of our, our strategy here is also uh, getting people into actual like treatment. And I think that maybe that's being lost in the conversation. That is still sort of, 
something that we're actively engaged in and really, you know, that, that's a priority, right? For people who want to uh, go to treatment, we are assisting them. This doesn't preclude any of that, does it? No, certainly no. not. We recognize that there are multiple barriers um, for people exp that lead to people experiencing homelessness, and one of those absolutely is addictions and mental health challenges and treatment and recovery-based programs, as well as uh, you know, a whole suite of addictions um, programs needs to be part of the solutions for homelessness, there's no question. Yeah, um, I, I'm wondering if uh, we don't talk about that enough, if, if that message is not getting across. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think I just wanna break this three parts down just a little bit more. Um, for part A, when you say prototypes identified through the strategy, so this was related to the motion from, from the first time you presented on the strategy, and, and my understanding is that some of those ideas is not specific to shelter, uh, whether it's encampment or whatever. I just want to check on that. Yes, that's correct, Councillor Tang. Yeah, um, and I also want to distinguish between a prototypes versus sort of full-on pilot that would that would essentially be um, funded by a service package. You know, prototypes are meant to be cheap and quick, and so if we're bringing forward an unfunded service package, then we're essentially scaling those without knowing what those prototypes are. I think that's a fair point, but I don't know that. Um, we would necessarily be envisioning a huge resource draw for okay. for A. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. Um, and then the second point, um, and I think I, 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 I appreciate this point because one of the things that went through my head when I read the report was like, wouldn't it be just cheaper to go with the hotel approach? And even I would say it would, be, it would even be cheaper if we did a pilot on universal basic income for all those 60 individuals for three months. Um, and, and, and if that's you know one of those things, I wouldn't necessarily be um, impartial to that. And I think the third one, I think I am a little bit stuck on whether service package is the best way for a tiny home village. Um, I, I guess to the mover, would you be open to an amendment rather than sort of getting set on a service package? Um, I'm interested in the feasibility of that um, to begin with, knowing that there are community folks um, who are working on this concept in various sh ways and shapes, and I'm not sure if city funding is necessarily the deal breaker. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think um, I think that the idea of a tiny home village has been has been bounced around for many years now, and my intent would with this would just be that we we actually follow through on that. Um, so I take your point that that there may not need to be operational or capital funding but there may be a land requirement to make that feasible. So in some ways, I, I think we know that it's technically a possibility. Um, the issue has been that not all the right resources have been at the table. And so for me, the, the service package just allows us to say, oh, is that a worthwhile investment of city resources, um, whether it's land or capital, then maybe that's a clarification that the administration can provide. Sure, yeah, would you like to, because yeah, if it were land, would that still be a service package? Yeah, I don't think it would have to be, Councillor. I mean, I, I think the other thing to understand is there is a tiny village in Edmonton right now that, that is being run, uh, so we can certainly uh, look to that one. And the city did provide free land for that that partnership to, to carry on, so. But not the operation or anything? Not the operations, or the no, capital. They, that was all right. done by by the, the founders, and I'm talking about Home for Heroes, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you know, the one does exist. I think we can um, look to that model to Talk, now, it's a very different circumstance, and of course, there are a bunch of federal wraparound supports that go with us for, through veterans, go with that through Veterans Affairs and other pieces. So, I, But I think we can use that model as a bit of an understanding of this one. Right, and so I guess just to answer that question then, is it a service package or is it a feasibility study? And so that's what I'm trying to figure out is, I mean, I would like to kind of break up that third component. Like yeah, I think... Part I two. think ideally feasibility first yeah. and then service package. But in this, I would say we would have to do the feasibility study and then bring that with the service package is what we'd have to bring. But Okay, so then maybe I am wondering, uh, maybe it's not to break that off. Maybe it's to amend the m motion. Uh, as, so bring forward three separate unfunded service packages and feasibilities for each. 
just to be really explicit about it. So that's not just implied. I mean, it's possible that the feasibility study for the tiny home village, for example, would find that it's not, we wouldn't recommend proceeding. Um, so then maybe we wouldn't, so it would, I think it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't 100% make sense to totally line the timing <laughs> if that makes, if, because that would might be our recommendation as administration, but council still may wish to proceed. So maybe we could look for C with a report back on the feasibility to, and, and I don't know the answer yet. Like I think we would wanna look at the Homes for Heroes and how that's working yeah. and also consider um, the proposals that might be out there in the community that's been referenced by yourself and Councillor Stevenson and get a bit more information about what folks are working on and see if there is a role for the city in that before we would rush to a service package. I think that would be fair, yeah. And, and so you will get all that from the current wording as is or would you? Well, I would say we'd have to do more than that okay. in the current wording. Mm -hmm. So in order to do the service package, I think we need to do a feasibility study. Mm -hmm. And notwithstanding whatever our recommendations would be on that feasibility, we'd have to go to the next step of preparing the package. Okay. So we would do both based on the current wording. If you just wanted okay. the feasibility study, then I would suggest doing an amendment to only do the feasibility study. And then, you know, we could report to council on that. But that's that's where we are. Okay. I'm out of time for now. But okay. sure, thank, thank you. Oscar. But as part of preparing service package, feasibility study will be done. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how we can bring a service package yeah, forward without, without feasibility without study. Talking about yeah. feasibility. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The first question is about the summer 2022 services. Uh, I understand the motion on the floor right now does not address that, but we do have mentioned something and in the report, uh, on the page two of the report. Uh, we list one, two, three, four, five, five services in place. Uh, can you tell me a little bit from financial perspective, what is the total number of uh, financial supports we provide those services and for summer 2022? I, we don't, I don't have that. <clears throat> um, handy right now, Councillor Tank, or sorry, Councillor Rice, but we could get that for you, no problem. Um, we have, I could give you an estimate of each of those budget items, but I think it'd be more accurate if you gave us a second to pull that together. <laughs> okay, uh, sure. And because by looking at the services we already provided in place for summer 2022, and uh, from my memory may not be uh, accurate 100%, this could be already more than $46 million already there. So. Uh, I just waiting for your final number and to verify that. Um, the sec second question, uh, second questions about the potential medium and the long term and regarding the part C of this motion. Um, so right now, and based on homeowner trust data, our uh, homeless um, population is 1,285 people right now. Is that is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. Um, so that is not the update. It's 2,768. Okay, so this is number I got from reports, from hope in the report indicated. I think that might have indicated the pro the number of people who are provisionally accommodated now, because not everybody who's experiencing homelessness is unsheltered or staying in an emergency shelter, a significant segment. And currently the number I have is 1,516, which is like the up-to-date as of today number, um, is so almost you know half of the people experiencing homelessness are provisionally accommodated, which means that they're staying in transitional housing or couch surfing or in some other type of interim housing arrangement. Uh, okay, uh, so, I, I do understand and our uh, Mayor Sohi and our state administration put a lot of effort to collaborate with working with provincial government, try to get the housing support and to support this population. And is that our role and really to keep coming, keep coming unfunded service package on the same issue over and over? I don't think that's a question for administration, Councillor. I, th I think, uh, but I would say that it really is, a, you know, where Council wants to support these people. I would say uh, from a community perspective, as I've said before, you know, taking care of these folks is, you know, critical uh, business. Um, 
but really ultimately the answer to that question really needs to be councils and we'll, we'll, impl we'll, we'll execute what we get okay, asked to execute. Okay, that, that's fair. And, and back, to the, back to the tiny home cost. So the example gave in the reports and for only 60 unions, a six unit, the cost could be from $1.8 million and to $6, 6 million. So that is the annual number or is for the long-term perspective? That is the purchase, the capital cost of buying the modular. And so it can, they can range from a self-contained sleeping area that's a few hundred square feet that's sheltered to a home like three or 400 square feet that has plumbing, shower, kitchen. And so that's okay. where you see the huge range in cost. Only for 60 units. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to support this motion. And the, the reason, and it already reflected in my questions. The first question I, I, I ask, we already have at least so many services already exist and for summer and also for the ongoing. And the second, and if you look at the cost, so this cost is not final cost yet. It's just a capital piece and for the first piece. Um, I, I think we do need to put the continual efforts and to work with the provincial government to get support from them. And it, instead of for our city only to keep, keep put the funding and then to repeatedly and for the same issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So that concludes your speaking part as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Salvador? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to Councillor Stevenson for bringing us forward. Uh, just a few questions, particularly around C. Um, yeah, I had some similar questions to Councillor Tang, just around wanting to kind of proactively have that feasibility component, just recognizing that in my experience, um, you know, tiny home villages aren't aren't always the most efficient um, use resources in terms of, of bang for buck and and also just outcomes. Uh, so I guess my my question is, if we're being presented with an affordable housing investment plan, is it going to be presented as like a holistic plan and holistic package, or as I read this motion, each each will be brought separately? I'm trying to understand how what that's going to look like and what's going to be in front of us. Like, is it going to be one package and then these are going to be optional like add-ons or yeah I, I would say we you know uh counselor we're trying to get the strategy in place and then of course we're dealing with motions that we get along the way and we would try to wrap them up together as much as possible but i would also say that i i don't think we would go down the route of c on on tiny home village if we weren't directly told to look at that because as you've mentioned, it, it, it isn't efficient from a space perspective, from a land use perspective, from a climate change perspective. There are already issues that we have concerns about. Uh, so we wouldn't, I think without this motion, we wouldn't bring that forward as part of the package. We can bring the details of that forward based, based on this specific motion for sure. Um, and then what we'll try to do is package as much of it as we can together without delaying the, the housing strategy report. Um, and, and add these things on as we, as we go, I guess. Yeah. Mm, but it gets right. to the point that was made you know, by the auditor in terms of coordination. Um, I understand the value of these coming forward, but it does make that a, a more of a challenge for us to have it holistically coordinated as right. per the auditor's recommendations. Right, okay, so if, if this were to move forward then, and I'm hearing that the feasibility analysis would be done as part of this work, that's correct? I think it would have to be. That, that would be the first step, uh, kind of similar to what we did with the, uh, with the, um, uh, encamp the summer encampments recently that we reported today. Okay, and then based on that feasibility analysis, would it be explicit in the service package that's brought forward? Like for just for example, the tiny home village that administration doesn't recommend yeah, going forward? Yeah, and I would say much like the, uh, the report we presented today, we presented our feasibility, which is we do, don't recommend okay. the managed encampments, but we said we can do it, and if you want to do it, here's what, how much okay. it would cost to do. So I think it would bring, be brought forward in the very same way. Okay, and then would the same thing be uh, said for the prototypes that are identified? Because I'm sure, like, but the point of prototypes is some are good, we want to move forward with them, some not so, so good, but good that we tried them. Um, we'd be seeing the ones that we want to expand and move forward with. 
Yeah, I think so. I think it's just the timing and figuring out exactly what that looks like because we don't know what those prototypes are yet. So I don't want to hazard a guess of how long it'll take to prototype something to know if it's effective or not. But I think for sure if there's something we know that we want to pilot that we need resources for or prototype that we need resources for, um, that could be included in the service package. Other than that, though, there is, you know, obviously always the quarterly updates and other opportunities to bring forward um, packages if council wants us to or funding increases if council wants us to in response to the outcomes of those prototypes. Right. Okay, great. And then just last question. Um, um, based on the update we received for uh, our affordable housing conversation just last week, uh, one of the major priorities was getting ready for that round three of rapid housing. Um, and this doesn't in any way, uh, I guess, affect that, correct? No, and I just would remind, uh, just as a reminder, the rapid housing program only applies to um, developments that are being used for a minimum of three months for housing. So it is, it's meant for permanent housing. So I don't think it would apply to an, a bridge housing or a shelter style um, hotel development. Okay. Um, Although we could confirm that with CMHC because they are <laughs> reviewing all of the rules right now for RHI, which is why I think the details haven't been announced yet. Sure. Okay. Well, that, that answers um, all of my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? I've got the chair. Yeah. So when, what are the timelines for the, uh, the housing strategy to be brought forward? Uh, the, the affordable housing investment plan service package should be brought forward as part of the budget. No, this strategy that Mr. Corbett. Oh, sorry, for homeless, for, yeah. that would be the um, corporate response to homelessness plan that we discussed in the, uh, with audit committee a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And so the timeline for that was the end of 2023, I believe. Okay. Because it was meant to align with a new updated community plan to end homelessness yeah. as well. So, because what, what, I'm, cause what I'm struggling with is, uh, is that there are, number of motions, council driven motion on this, then the work you're doing, right? So come budget time, uh, I would like to have a advice from the administration that will say, okay, if you have certain amount of dollars, this is the best use of those dollars, not be driven by certain packages, right? So even though we have made a number, but would, would that analysis be presented to us as part of the budget, because you know we wouldn't have unlimited amount of money, right? So, what would be the best use of city resources to tackle some of these? I say, would you be able to give that that advice as part of the budget process? I think we'll be able to give it to a degree, okay, Your Worship. And I, yeah. I think we we would definitely, within the portfolio of housing and shelters, we would definitely give a recommendation on what the best bang for buck would be, uh, given the, the amount of dollars available. Yeah. But I think with these, if these motions, uh, and maybe we will have other motions in the next c coming weeks and months, that just adds a level of complexity to it. Yeah. But that's okay, we can do that. No, I, I understand, I, 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 I actually understand where Councillor Stevenson and why the intent of all the other motions is, uh, is uh, absolutely understood and, uh, and appreciated. I just want to understand what, what I, want to understand is that uh, your professional advice and uh, objective advice, that's what I would seek to make a determination out of, say, if there's 10 service packages unfunded, okay, which are the top two we need to fund or three we need to fund? Yeah, and I think we'll be able to do that. I think what really helps us to do that is uh, the community safety and well-being strategy that council has approved, and we can use that as a bit of a guideline okay. to not just the housing and shelter plans, but all the, the service packages. So I would see us coming po coming forward as part of the fall budget, and we said that we would do that as part of the overall community safety and well-being strategy. Here is all the money that yeah. we think should be spread across the seven pillars, and this is we think what the best use of, okay. of the funds we have, and then we can prioritize okay. the service packages that come forward as part of that strategy as well. Okay, and so I that think that's the best way to present it because okay. that's the real strategy we have it's the most recent strategy, it's the most comprehensive strategy, and it will in time have the best metrics for us to, to evaluate success okay. or not in okay. each of those pillars. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because, uh, okay, good. That gives me, uh, thank you. Uh, that's the answer I was looking for, and that you'll present us with your objective analysis. Got it. Thank you so much for that, and I will I'll return the take chair. the chair back. And so that concludes the questions to uh, to the motion. And uh, anyone to speak? 
Councillor Paquette, you wanted to speak to this, right? Am I right? No, okay. Uh, okay, having no one to speak, I will go to Councillor Stevenson to close. Yeah, just very briefly, thanks to everyone for the conversation and the questions. Um, again, this is such a such an urgent crisis in our community, and and I always want to remember that we are we are paying for this one way or another right now. Um, I believe we had a report last week that spoke to uh, at least two million dollars a year, just in terms of the most direct uh, encampment response that we currently have. And I know that there are so many more impacts uh, that we as a city incur, and that and that. Um, you know, affect the, the community as a whole, um, particularly those living in encampments. I'm really pleased that we'll be able to, to do this work and hopefully have some solutions in place to, to help mitigate this next summer um, uh, and excited that we're continuing to invest in those longer term solutions as well. So thanks so much to the team for their ongoing work on this. Really look forward uh, to seeing what comes back in the fall and thank you. Thank you again so much for all you're doing to address this situation in our community. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please uh, vote. I'm a yes, Madam Clerk. It's not submitting for me. Yeah, we're just going to cancel the vote and re oh, sorry, we've got it all. It's all come through. We're just waiting for one more vote. We have all the vote. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. So, no. Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure if you would indulge me, but there's a private legal attachment attached to this report. Would you like to keep that in private, or would you like to make that public? I'm I'm happy to move that we keep um, attachment. It needs to be kept um, private, right? Or two of the July 4th, 2022 community service report CS01347 remain private pursuant to sections 24. And 27 of VoIP. Okay. Second. S second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, the next item is a snow and ice control programmed approach for the 2022-2023 winter season. This was a report at uh, Community and Public Services Committee, and I will go to the chair of the committee to uh, make introductory remarks and uh, move the motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, this was discussed at Community and Public Services Committee last week, as you mentioned. Before I uh, go to this motion, I just wanted to um, uh, offer Councillor Stevenson an apology for how the end of the meeting went uh, last Tuesday. Uh, I just want to apologize for uh, my tone and the way I responded to her questions. It was, it was uh, no excuses. It was uh, not particularly professional, and I, uh, I'm really sorry for that. Uh, we did talk about the snow and ice uh, report. Uh, we had quite a robust conversation. I think that it was acknowledged by uh, all those in attendance that uh, we had talked a lot about, you know, the operation and management of the snow and ice program uh, in the previous meetings and previous conversations. And so the, the conversation we had last week was largely concentrated on uh, funding options and the speed with which we might fund changes to the snow and ice strategy. Uh, the report offered uh, essentially a, an implementation strategy that would see, uh, I believe the number was 7.1 or eight or eight million dollars. Perhaps I can be clarified uh, in uh, dollars this year to begin uh, funding some of the the choices that council had endorsed at a previous council meeting. Uh, there was uh, effectively options offered to pursue the roadways one and the active pathways one options. Uh, there was not mention of, an, uh, of a 0 0.5 option or an active pathways three option. So I think there were some remaining questions from councillors on that. Uh, the recommendation of the committee was to, uh, uh, that the Parks and Road Services Grant, and I'll move this to put it on the floor. 
uh, that the Parks and Roads Services branch budget be increased by $4.7 million from the Financial Stabilization, Stabilization Reserve on a one-time basis to fund the snow and ice control program for the 2022 portion of the upcoming winter season and two, that administration prepare a capital profile and operating service package for consideration during the 23 to 26 fall budget deliberations to support Second. approved enhancements to the snow yep. and ice program as outlined in R1 AP1 and attachment two of the June 27, 2022 city operations report C0, pardon me, C00177. Uh, and I'll just perhaps uh, offer I'll second, that. second back on. Yes, my apologies for interrupting. No, that's fine. The uh, four point seven million dollar number was essentially a middle ground number that allowed some work to begin, uh, but work to um, uh, and but signal that further funding would happen, albeit over what time is sort of the open question that would come to us back at the four year uh, conversations in November. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you, Marcelli. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice, you exempted this, so I'll go to you first. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So some of the questions already answered uh, offline, but I, I still have one quick question and to administration. Uh, specifically for 2022, we have a few months in the winter. Uh, administration and provided the recommendation for $9.5 million to fund this program and for this po portion. So right now in the motion, we owning uh, say 4.7. So how this difference will impact our achieved this enhanced service level and in 2022? Uh, largely the difference there is, is between the, uh, I guess option A and option B. Uh, what, what is included in option B uh, would be to move some of the enhancements into 2023. And then uh, in 2022, what that 4.7 million largely would do is, is contribute towards um, hiring of personnel. So some of the uh, enhancements around windrows, um, clearing public squares, internal paved pathways, things like that um, would be pushed into 2023. So option B essentially would, would uh, alleviate some of the pressure or the, the pull on the FSR, um, but still front loading the hiring of people to maximize equipment utilization for uh, roads and active pathway clearing. So if that is the case, and specifically, we identified the specific measures for the improvement. So that means for the $4.7 million for 2022 portion, we will not achieve the outcome, the measures provided here, and in terms of respond to the days and services. Is that understanding right? Uh, no, we would, um, there would still be a, a noticeable improvement on uh, service levels for clearing active pathways and roads. And so we would adjust uh, the administrative procedure um, to match what our resource level uh, would be able to accomplish. And for, for example, just give one example for the days. And from 5.3 days and reduced to 4.1 days, so that type of outcome was still, still achieved with $4.7 million, right? Uh, with with yeah, this, with R1, um, R1. Uh, I, I just take R, R1 as the example. Yes, so in, in year one for R1, for, ex for instance, uh, yes, arterial roadways, uh, the procedure would still be reflective of a 4.1 day uh, on average, on an average snowfall to clear uh, priority one roads. Um, the, some of the enhancements like additional curb cuts or windrow pickup, those types of enhancements would have been pushed into so 2023. will not happen in 2022. But actually, this type of improvement is actually based on the survey results, based on what we heard, and actually is our residents expected. And then right now, it's pushed to 2023. Uh, into January of 2023. That's right. Some of yep. the enhancements are moved into 2023. Uh, and the, the bulk of the uh, 4.7 would be for personnel to improve um, clearing of roadways and active pathways. Uh, I understand that they pushed a little bit further for January 2023 is due to the minimal uh, room and from F FSR. So right now, if we use FSR for this $4.7 million, we still have $4.9 million left. And in that room, 
and in the FSR uh, for the minimum, for the minimum, to keep the minimum, is that correct? Just ask Ms. Padbury to comment on the FSR. Yeah, that's correct. So this is the only reason for us to push the 2023? Basically, Councillor, the, the trade-off is that we are trying to minimize the demand on the FSR for 2022, so that is part of the reason for two options. Uh, okay. So I think for the financial perspective, and we picked the option B, not option A. Yes, it's a balance of how much we can afford. Okay, thank you. That, that is my question. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Paquette? Just to speak, Mr. Mayor. To speak. Okay. okay. So you. just to uh, um, so ask um, anyone else questions, have any questions? So, oh. Councillor Prince, uh, so, sorry, Councillor Prince Bay, you're next for questions. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question was in regards to um, the community responses. I see that the um, through I, I'm not sure if it was through survey the snow survey that respondents sixty percent uh, showed support of having an increase in uh, snow removal on the roadways, but I guess my concern is or my question is you know the active pathways I see it's kind of a split forty seven percent we're in favor of maintaining the uh, active pathways as it was uh, in the 2021 to 2022. So I, um, is it possible in order to increase the roadways but keep the active pathways at the same level? I guess that would be need council direction, correct? Correct, Councillor. What What's presented now is is a programmed approach that includes both uh, an active pathways component and a roadways component. So if there was a desire to only do a part of that, then we would need a different direction from council. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, hmm. oh, okay, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Councillor Tank? Um, I just wanted to clarify the FSR balance. I thought earlier in your presentation we said the balance was $3 million, but can you, Ms. Pabry, can you just clarify? Okay. I just want to make sure we have money for this. Sorry, just to be clear, there's money, there is sufficient funding in there for the motion that was passed last week. Okay, oh, but I meant like earlier in the day, we were talking about, we were talking about the balance in the FSR and I thought I heard the number 3 million. So I just want to clarify. Okay. <laughs> Truly. So if you, um, so the unappropriated balance in the FSR is for, it, so it depends on how you look at this. Option A, if you do the, or sorry, option B, $4.7 million, that leaves 3.152 unfunded. If you did option B, you would be below the minimum by 1 million. So you're, you're talking, so there's $3 million left if you pass this motion, but if you tried okay. to pass, pass the higher amount, gotcha. you would be $1 million below. Okay, so the $3 million is, is what's going to be left after this one. 3.1. Gotcha. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So that concludes the questions from Council. Now to speak. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
and I want to express my gratitude to administration for this work. Uh, it was uh, years uh, of work and years in coming uh, because snow, snow and ice control is not a simple matter. It, it takes an enormous amount of logistics and planning. And uh, to get to where we are today um, took a lot of people uh, doing the hard work. And so it is absolutely appreciated. Um, while many people, myself included, wish that we could go even further, uh, this is an example of where the budget is running up against choices. Um, a lot of uh, the improvements that Edmontonians will see in their snow removal this coming winter um, will be born of uh, just squeezing that, that, uh, that last vestige of efficiencies out. So we will see that. Um, and then this uh, modest amount of money will cover the rest uh, from the FSR. And then, of course, it will be up to council to decide what the budget allocation will be going forward. But the one thing that is clear is that we have uh, received assurances that uh, barring any unforeseen uh, um, changes to, to extreme weather here in Edmonton, that we will be seeing an improvement for the people of Edmonton. And so that is something to look forward to. Um, and it was raised earlier that FSR is, uh, is reaching a point where we can uh, cannot draw from it and cannot rely on that as a source of funding. Um, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, in the last couple of budgets uh, previous to this current council, uh, council and administration made the very responsible choices to maintain the FSR, um, which was why we are in um, the position we're in today, which is being able to fund a number of things from the FSR and, uh, and to not have to pass on uh, that tax increase to the public. So um, what, even though many of them are gone, I would like to also express my thanks to previous uh, councillors uh, for that decision when it could have been easy to just take that money to do things uh, that, uh, that they wanted to do but instead chose the prudent course. And uh, last, uh, um, you know, uh, there's there's been a lot of work on the council side as well. And uh, I do want to thank uh, um, the chair of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of this committee, um, Councillor Carmel, for uh, doing the hard work of trying to um, find a way through. And uh, as we heard, it can get frustrating. And uh, so that's something to watch for. But uh, um, I do thank Councillor Carmel for the work in shepherding us through committee. And Mr. Mayor, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. And to close, Councillor Carmel. Sorry, Councillor Principe to speak. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just uh, had the request. Uh, I would just like to um, separate uh, number one and number two for voting purposes, please. Yeah, that can be done, Madam Clerk, right? Okay, we will do that for voting purposes, absolutely. Okay, and thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just speak to it. it. I am in support of increasing the budget for snow and ice removal, and I do appreciate what administration has brought forward. And um, I know that, you know, it's <laughs> we've been asked not to um, maybe micromanage, and uh, unfortunately, I feel but maybe I might be doing that right now, but just with the active pathways, uh, I, I'm just not uh, very confident with where we are um, allocating our resources for active pathways, where we are looking at 0 0.5 days for the bike network, where city sidewalks and ramps is 2.8 days. Uh, I feel that that's a fairly large discrepancy and, and I just, Again, I, I just can't support the uh, AP one, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. I see one, no one else to speak. I'll go to Councillor Cartmel to close. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, echo Councillor Paquette's uh, 
thanks to administration, this was a really good series of reports, and I really do think that we've established a bit of a baseline here that we can start, you know, having fruitful conversations going forward. So uh, kudos to Mr. Sebrick and his team. Uh, and I, you know, just on this motion specifically, I just uh, continue to feel that $4.7 million is a relatively modest amount to allow us to get started on this work. I don't think we're done with this. Uh, there may be some further refinements to make when we get to the four-year budget conversations, whether that's, you know, part of the AP1 or part of the Roadways 1 uh, approach. Uh, this at least allows us to begin to get some, uh, you know, some work started and some personnel added uh, to the mix without diving deep into a particular line of adding equipment or changing strategies or layering on other pieces. So. Uh, I do think this allows us to course correct in a few months when we get to the four-year budget and in the meantime get some work done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. So please vote. Point, point of order, Mr. Mayor. Oops, yeah, part so one. Is it just separate? Part, part one. Uh, we are not separate R1 and AP1? No, no. So there are two motions, two parts of the motion. Part one will we vote first. Okay, so can and I request R1, AP1? Uh, this might be too late at this time because the uh, item has been spoken to and closed by the chair, uh, by the mover. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so please vote on part one. Chance is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we please vote on part two. Give all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried as well. Okay. Mm, that is 6.7 was approved. Now next one is 6.8. And I will ask Councillor Knack to take the chair. I've got the chair. Thank you, Councillor Nack. As the chair of the executive committee, I will, uh, uh, hmm, where's that? Here we go. This is an uh, item that was uh, requis requis requisited, requis requisited from, uh, my, there sound certain words that are very hard to say. <laughs> no, 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 it's just my, thing, my tongue doesn't twist certain ways, right? So, uh, was requisited from um, the, uh, the committee to council. We had a uh, number of people who spoke on this item uh, from the building trades as well as from uh, some other associations. We also had a presentation from some of the businesses, uh, and but we were, we were able to conclude questions to the member of the public, but we're not able to ask questions to the administration on this. And that's the reason it was requisite to, uh, to counsel, but uh, to expedite the process, as Jira will also move the uh, recommendation in the report, unless somebody have, Second. anybody have, no, okay. That was infor for information, because I haven't heard any motions on. Yeah, so I'll move the, I'll move the uh, report for information. Thank you, and that's been seconded by Councillor Rutherford. And next we'll go to, if there's any other questions of administration delegation, I'm not seeing any. Trying to put my name up, I just have one very quick question. Not seeing any, oh, sorry, Councillor Kett. Go ahead, Councillor Kett. There we go. Yeah, just one simple question for administration. Um, is it possible, uh, you know, it looks like we've got annual reporting. Is it possible to get um, memos, just simple memos on a quarterly basis as well, or would that be too onerous? Yeah, 
I think that comes later, the annual delegation report. We can do quarterly if needed. Yeah, I don't need a full report, just uh, you know, a, a way to check in rather than just on an annual basis, which is a long gap. So if that's possible, great. If not, that's okay. But it would be great if we could get that. Sorry, I'm hearing that it's sorry, Councilor if, Patrick, I, just... if I could just add, um, the semi-annual reporting is under the city administration bylaw. Yeah. Yeah, so it requires us okay. to come back so twice to annually to council. Yeah. Okay. That, that answers that one concern. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Wright. Hi, thank you. I do just have a couple questions um, following up from some of the comments made by the speakers at committee. Um, I think it was Terry Parker from Building Trades Association uh, was concerned with consequences of non-compliance, um, like perhaps taking people off of, or companies off of bidders list. Is, are there any consequences? Well, that is going to be something that we in administration are working on. At this point, we were encouraging and asking proponents to provide their plan on how they are going to comply with the social procurement requirements. Uh, but in order to put consequences, we need to modify our contract languages, and that's part of the work that we are going to do after this. Um, yeah, at this point, we don't have consequences in the contract, but we will be working with our legal support to include those languages in our contracts uh, moving forward. Okay, that's excellent, thank you. And I just had uh, one other question um, as far as, um, is, is I think you kind of get what you pay for, so are we sometimes always focused on the lowest cost? Not necessarily. Or, but how does that factor in? Um, not necessarily, depending on what we procure in city, we, we review different options and we choose what is the best option for each procurement. So we do value based, which is a combination of a technical score and the price, mostly for consulting, engineering uh, services. That's, that qualification piece import, is important for the city. And for those that we feel is more straightforward, we go with the lowest fee fee model, mostly for a straightforward construction projects. But even for, for those, there are mandatory requirements, spec requirements that contractors are supposed to comply with in order to submit a bid. So it's a mixture of options that we use depending on what we procure. Okay, so some consideration is given yeah, to the value, as you said. Okay, excellent. Yes. Um, and I think that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else on the board for questions. Anyone wishing to speak to the receipt of information? Not seeing anyone on the board. Mayor So, do you have any closing comments? Nope. Thank you. Let's uh, please vote. You have all the vote. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. Oh, should I hang on to the chair for the next item? Go ahead, Mr. Yes. Chair, Mr. Mayor. Hang on to the chair, because next one is also the uh, uh, executive committee uh, report. And we, like these three items were cross-referenced, so same speaker spoke to uh, this uh, report as well. And uh, Again, we were able to ask questions to the members of the public, but we were not able to uh, uh, get to administration on questions. But there's a recommendation in the uh, in the report, and I'm just going to find it here so I can move the uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, here we go. That executive committee recommend to city council that revised sustainable procurement policy C556A as set out in attachment one of the June 29, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01160B approved. That's Councillor so Paquette wanted to second that. Thank you. That's seconded by Councillor Paquette. Any other introductions on this? Mr. E, yeah, I know I, I, I have some questions to administration on, uh, on this. Right? And. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for the report and uh, also the presentation that you gave. Uh, the The question I have is around. I know you answered the question on enforcement, right? Uh, 
the the reporting like how do we monitor the the success do we have any benchmarks around like how many indigenous businesses that will be able to engage or or the amount of procurement like what how are we going to gauge the success of this yeah as you mentioned mr mayor <clears throat> we are going to measure the percentage of contracts that are going to be awarded to indigenous group in addition to the dollar value we have an initial figure of 5%, uh, which is coming from our historic data of the number of indigenous businesses in Edmonton. So we are going to target that and uh, try to get our percentage of contracts and the value towards that 5%. Uh, we are working with some external companies that they do data analysis and data reporting, and uh, we need to start sharing our information with them to start reporting on the progress. Once we have those figures, we will be able to report um, on the progress as part of our annual delegation of authority reporting to the council to keep track of how many, what is the percentage of the uh, work that is going to indigenous. So this is a new process for us in administration, but we have some uh, support from external resources to come up with the we have required reporting templates and all of that. So it is part of the plan, but as we get into the implementation, we will know more about how exactly those reporting components should look like. Okay. And is there certain threshold for for the projects? For example, the, the federally funded projects, there's a threshold of like $10 million or so, right, for, for in, including some of the underemployed groups is do we are we looking at because that might be too high a threshold for for indigenous community business part participation we in administration haven't identified the threshold for this one our, our goal is tries to maximize including the requirements in all of our procurements as long as the procurement permits for like those indigenous components uh, we should we will try to maximize so no there is no such a dollar value or something attached our plan is to come up with a guideline for administration and staff to give them a specific stuff. If, if you're doing, for example, a construction project and this is the value, this is a good candidate to use, let's say, apprentices opportunities for indigenous. Yeah. Or some other projects may be a better candidate for indigenous content to specify a specific percentage to include indigenous labor. Because indigenous mm. businesses are exempted from trade agreements we have more flexibility here. So okay. uh, we haven't yet finalized that implementation plan, but I would expect it to be beyond uh, what we are doing for social because of the exceptions from trade agreements. Okay, so for example, the the building of the, uh, uh, is it uh, Chikikiaski Pavilion, right, out for the, for in, in the Fort Inventor area, indigenous project, led by indigenous communities, so that could have more involvement of indigenous businesses, right, without going into violating some of the trade agreements. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that's a good example, Your Worship. Yeah. For example, we can do sole source contracts to a much higher degree with indigenous uh, owned and operated companies based on the trade agreement exemptions. Okay. So it's a good example of, okay. uh, of how you can do a sole source particularly, okay. but also within competition. So. And, and that's something that we Sir will definitely time. get good, done. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Sorry. Our just... chair over there. Um, thanks for whipping us into shape. No, thank you so much for this uh, this work. I, I am really pleased to come up, see it coming forward um, and, and think it's an excellent step forward. I think, yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on the mayor's line of questioning just around some of the specific um, measures. Uh, Maybe just to start as well, will there be an opportunity for some of that more qualitative feedback as well as Indigenous businesses sort of provide feedback on the procurement process and, and barriers that they may continue to face? Will there there'll be a, an like a channel for that ongoing communication? Yeah, so as uh, we, it was mentioned in the report, we were working with an um, advisory committee that has been working with us and had representations from different indigenous groups and we did uh, a lots of engagement already to get to this point and that is going to be a continuous effort. So our plan is to continue to work with our advisory committee through the implementation as well and keep that 
line of communication open. Great, and, and sorry, I'm thinking specifically around the performance measures as well. Is there some survey data that could uh, be used in terms of us capturing some of that feedback? Are you referring to like after they participate, after, after there was participation in a procurement? Yeah, so again, just performance measures, you know, we have some really, you know, there's some quantitative, like the number of businesses we have, but I think it would also be important to capture the number of businesses that are still facing barriers, for example, or have, you know, raised challenges about, about becoming vendors, something like that. Yeah, I think this is something that we can easily build into the process. It's not there, but we can take this back and work it out in our processes. Great, great, thank you. And I think, um, you know, I, I really appreciate the point around the, um, you know, the potential for indigenous set-asides as well, so that that would be, I, I'm just wondering if that's a different performance measure that we would want that well above 5.39, we want that to be effectively 100%, I think would be, would be the target for some of those projects. That's a fair comment. I think if the capacity is there and if it's an indigenous business, the goal is to maximize that to 100%, like when there is a business, indigenous business. But as we start implementing and gathering data, <coughs> excuse me, it can also help us to see if there are any gaps. So right. if the capacity is there, that could be the goal, yeah. Perfect, yeah, and I think that would really help, you know, if we're seeing, let's say, the, the measure is 50% out of 100, then that helps us identify, okay, what, what do we need for that, that specific um, addition? Great, yeah, and I think I think that target again. I, for some reason, I'm sort of grappling with with linking it to the population. I, I see how that's sort of like an equal approach. Again, just thinking about an equity approach. Um, if we were to look at sort of the proportion of businesses in Edmonton that are Indigenous led, would that be higher or lower than five percent? Do you reckon? I know that's probably an impossible question. We don't have that details of level of information at this point. We just have the 5%, which is the population. population. Okay, no, I appreciate that. And I think this is something that can continue to evolve. But, you know, again, really appreciate the work uh, that's gone into this and uh, really think that this sets us up for, for a shift in our practices and, and some success as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think this is such a great direction, and I'm very much supportive of this. Uh, I was curious, the the, uh, the motion that was referenced in the report is from February, so it talks about you know, transparency of the procurement process in general, and uh, with this particular focus on Indigenous procurement, so this will be administration-led, or is, is this conversation in the works for a few years, or? So you mean the implementation of the plan? Yeah, because I was just looking at the report. It references the the motion from this council in February, but that kind of is referring to transparency of the procurement process in general, uh, and not necessarily specific to Indigenous procurement. So I'm, um, I was so I was wondering if this was administration uh, led and. Um, I think it's a good direction, that's all. So two different reports. Um, so I think the one that you're referring to from February, that is the report that we just spoke about right. on the goods and services procurement policy uh, versus the indigenous framework was, report, which is what we're on now, which sorry, is I was been longer report. term work for us. <laughs> sorry, I was looking at the wrong report. That's why I was like so confused. Um, uh, so I'm glad the target is 5%. What is, do we have a, do we know currently within the city of Edmonton, what is the current percent of procurement from indigenous businesses? We don't have data and that's okay. mainly because we in city are not planning to and we were not verifying the, um, in the indigenous heritage verification. Mm -hmm. So because of that part, it's a bit challenging for city at this point to produce um, that data. Got it. Um, I think that'll be a, a good baseline to have once we kind of figure that out. Um, and then I guess I was curious, um, you know, this is obviously very tied to Indigenous framework, but I'm just also thinking about, you know, could, could this be also be a framework to guide our alignment, say, with the anti-racism strategy and open up the opportunities for BIPOC vendors, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, businesses overall? 
well, could that be the next stage? We have our social procurement framework that touches on other okay. uh, underrepresented groups gotcha. and how we can optimize the involvement. With indigenous, because of the exception that exists under trade agreements, it's a bit unique I see. In, in a way that we have more flexibility with doing businesses with indigenous groups. Yeah, interesting. But I would add to that, Councillor, that um, I think there is merit within the, within the New West Partnership of pr pursuing a consideration, much like we have of indigenous vendors, mm -hmm. of BIPOC vendors. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a huge deal of work, requires federal and provincial, oh, yeah. uh, but, I, but I think there's some merit in that as we go forward, because that is the one distinct difference is we don't have that same flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this just comes from a bit of my own experience having been an employee and trying to um, actually seek out. Um, and sometimes I think there, there's a capacity on, um, you know, on the other end as well. I th and I found the sustainable procurement policy itself wasn't, you know, for a lot of the vendors, they're just trying to kind of get by. And there is a lot of requirement within that policy for them to abide by. Uh, but as a way, it did shut out, I think, a lot of people's participation. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just put that out there. I think it's worth a conversation. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Councilor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is uh, Ms. McCabe online? I am, Councillor Paquette. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, it, how are we coordinating across administration and other organizations uh, to provide capacity building and support for Indigenous build, uh, businesses? Because it occurs to me that we can open the door, but if there are a lot of, if there are not enough indigenous businesses or not un enough people in indigenous communities who realize they can actually start or school up a business um we may not have a lot of people walking through that door yeah that's a a really great observation councillor paquette and some of the work that we're doing through the economic action plan and the indigenous um framework at the city is about capacity building uh we do have some work underway in this space but i don't we don't have a lot of work um, uh, underway, and it's definitely something that I'm committed to working with the group on, uh, working with our Economic Investment Services group uh, on over the coming years. Right, okay, that that sounds great. And then um, I guess, I don't know if the, this should go to you or back to the, the delegation. Um, I do have a quick question though about um, ver the verification piece. Uh, it gets pretty tricky. Uh, because we have to make sure that we're not penalizing non-status folks uh, before we're even able to get them to their door. But we also want to make sure that we're not awarding people who are claiming Indigenous identity who don't actually have any cultural or uh, um, family ties to that identity or any official ties. So I don't know who that would go to. Yeah, I, I can try, Councillor Packet. In terms of verification, um, you're right. It, 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 it's challenging and it's going to be um, a bit uh, complicated to implement, but we have listed the organizations that throughout our consultation we felt are the right group that we should go to to get that verification um, of heritage from. Um, in terms of um, those that are not registered, that is something we in administration, we still need to work on. Um, it's something that we know it's on our list and we have to work with other owners across the country to see what solution are, are out there to make sure we are not excluding anybody, but also we are applying the framework and the policy in a fair, open and transparent manner to those that are really meant to take um, the advantage out of this framework. So yeah, it has two folds and we need to explore that second piece a little bit more to see how we can be, be more inclusive as we are doing the heritage verification. Okay, and uh, all right. I mean, for non-status that one, yeah. that's the part that throughout our consultation, we realized it's an area that needs some more work and it's on our list okay. to work on it as we work on the implementation plan. And are, are you working with the IRO on, the, on this piece? The Indigenous Relations Office? Yes, we are. Okay, good, good. All right, and uh, okay. So it 
sounds like there might need to be some work done in that area, but rather than make a motion, maybe I'll think about this over the break and uh, bring forward a, an inquiry um, at the next uh, you know, appropriate time, Mr. Chair. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Very quick, just one quick question. And for this framework, uh, is just uh, something on the top of the common standards for the procurement, or we just uh, separate apply for this framework only? Um, sorry, can you please elaborate on like the question? Uh, the question is uh, regularly and for the for the general procurement process, we have the standards to follow, and so for this one specifically, we do we need still follow the standards, or we only apply um, the framework only? We have some flexibility in specific to the indigenous content. So as you could see in the report, we have six recommendations, yeah. and depending on which one we want to follow then we have to incorporate this into our standard processes. So if it is like uh, indigenous content or augmenting the evaluation requirements, then we will be adding indigenous components into our regular evaluation criteria of the procurement we are doing. So and what I heard here, what I heard here is like, so is flexible. So we are not, uh, so follow the specific standards and from regular process, procurement process. So I would say it this way. So we have regular procurement standards yeah. and this framework, uh, it provides the, this, this work provides the framework in which we deal with indigenous procurement as part of the larger procurement framework or procurement practices. But, but as part of that, because of the trade agreement differences, there are sometimes different standards that can be applied to indigenous Okay, that, that's his answer I'm looking but for. But that's coming from the trade agreement. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. I don't see anyone else on the board. Anyone wishing to speak to this? Not seeing anyone on the list. Mayor Sophie, to close? Yeah, thank you so much. I actually want to start by thanking Councillor uh, Paquette for uh, leading the charge on, uh, on this uh, or the last term and, uh, and, and, and this term and our administration uh, responding and uh, really being, uh, you know, uh, forthcoming with, uh, with this as well, right? So really want to commend the uh, administration because uh, when, we, when we think about reconciliation, economic reconciliation has to be part of, uh, part of that. And, uh, and we all know that the indigenous communities uh, have uh, historically and they still continue to uh, face systemic barriers to uh, to fully participate in the in the economic opportunities that our city uh, has to offer through our own procurement process because we do invest billions of dollars in the in the operations as well as in the in the infrastructure then we leverage our own uh, resources for federal funding and provincial funding and private sector funding i think this is, provides a really good opportunity for to unlock the potential of indigenous businesses in a, in our city through this uh, indigenous procurement uh, framework so this is a very important step in the in the right direction uh, and uh, and you know i I am pretty confident that our administration will uh, look for very practical ways to support that and, and advance that economic reconciliation. So I'm really looking forward to the uh, to the implementation of the uh, of the framework and how we can sub continue to support the development and employment opportunities and economic stabilization of indigenous businesses in our community. So thank you for all the good work you have done. Thank you. Please vote. Give all the votes. Thank you. Display the votes. That is carried unanimously. Uh, next up, 610. Do you want to introduce it one more time and then I can turn the chair back? Yes. This is the uh, Hangar 14 Aviation Heritage Facility Rehabilitation and Investment Study. Uh, we uh, heard from uh, uh, Mr. Abbott 
and Mr. Lee representing the Alberta Aviation Museum Association and, uh, and Mr. Ridley from the Edmonton Heritage Council. Uh, representatives of the Alberta Aviation Museum were concerned about the, uh, the impact of uh, disposition of this facility on their long-term viability and uh, uh, they would like to have some certainty how, how, how the impact will be uh, mitigated and some questions and we were able to ask questions to the members of the public but were not able to ask questions to, uh, to the administration because of the time shortages that's why this is requisited to uh, to counsel from the uh, from the committee and uh, I do have a number of questions uh, 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 mr. chair but I can move the recommendation and maybe we'll go to questions I, I or there's motions there are motions on this okay good all right okay do you want to ask your questions first or would you like to go take the chair I back think uh, I'll, I'll maybe yeah, I'll take the chair back and then we'll uh, the what, the, what the motion is. Okay, Thank good. You. Okay, and cons I'll go to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I uh, would like to put a motion on the floor, just recognizing uh, our, our short time today or the number of items we have to get through. Um, so the motion I'd like to put forward is that administration develop a disposition strategy that man maintains the public museum used within hangar 14, including but not limited, limited, oh, sorry, I'm just going to get, the administration develop a disposition strategy that maintains the public museum used within hangar 14, including but not limited to partnering with other orders of government and private partners, and that the strategy is limited to a maximum of two years, at which time disposition options without conditions would be pursued. I can get a second. Yeah, second. second by sure. second. Councillor. Uh, can you please, uh, I just want to see it on the, on the screen. Is, uh, yeah. There we go. We got it on the screen. And it's moved by Councillor Stevenson, second by Councillor Paquette, uh, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Please make the introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so this this is a this is a really challenging one. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of visiting the museum both, uh, you know, in my official capacity and with my my family, and it, I truly think it is such a gem in our community. They are doing some phenomenal interpretation, not only around you know the building and the aviation history that's so connected to our city, uh, but also the social history of, of aviation in Edmonton and, and what that has meant for uh, women's rights, what it has meant for the residential school system, um, working towards reconciliation. They are doing a phenomenal job of programming there. And I think, you know, we've been discussing a lot recently about, about a disposition strategy, about the need to right size our, our building inventory. But we've also talked about the importance of, uh, you know, using different principles to assess those strategies, and one of them being, you know, the public-facing nature of, of the asset. This is a building that, again, goes way beyond just the museum use, in addition to the thousands of visitors every year. Um, there's a, a very active volunteer group. Um, that building is always, always hopping. It's used for other uses, other special events. Uh, so again, a, a real asset to our community, a really outward-facing asset to our community. You know, I do, I was initially thinking, again, it's always hard for us to be considering these types of decisions in the absence of a broader strategy. Um, so, you know, one approach would have been to, to try to hold off on this decision until we have a broader look at our, our heritage management strategy plan, our overall capital disposition plan. But I think recognizing the extent of the upgrades that are needed, it is, it is wise to recognize that disposition is a likely scenario. But what this is really intended to do is to recognize that reality, but also provide the museum with time to pull partners together to come up with a strategy that enables that uh, public use to remain. So having had some very preliminary conversations with the, the group that is working on Hangar 11, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm to, to consider what might be possible. Um, again, this, this facility has national importance, so I think the opportunity for other orders of government to be involved is there. And what this is primarily doing is just providing some time uh, for those conversations to happen. 
So again, the city would not retain ownership in the long run, but this would provide time to, to get a strategy in place that both maintains this heritage asset and also that really critical public use that's occurring on site. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Councillor Stevenson, for bringing this motion forward, because um, I, I think we need to have a second look um, and not just go straight to um, demolition on this. Um, I'm just wondering, um, to, um, to administration, um, you've just sort of done a sort of a, a desk appraisal, I guess, of um, or an assessment to come up with that $41 million? No, it's a detailed engineering report and I just want to clarify your first comment it, this is a historically recognized facility we can't go directly to demolition so the approach we would take is sale with the condition that it's a uh, historically designated okay yeah and I and I and I I do recognize that um, and yeah so I, my other questioner was uh, with the province um, because it is designated under the Alberta Historical Resources Act um, partnering with the province and perhaps the federal government. Ha has that been thoroughly sought out? Um, so uh, I, I might ask our folks from Heritage to help in terms of the degree of support we've had from other orders of government. Uh, as it relates to uh, renewal of the facility, we haven't approached that. And, and the reason is that uh, the degree of repair, but I don't know if David, you want to add to that in terms of the what we've sought out for federal and provincial support. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, in terms of provincial support, I don't believe there's been any direct ask. Uh, designated provincial historic resources do qualify for up to a hundred thousand dollars annually uh, to assist in upkeep of the heritage components of the building. Um, I don't believe we've. Uh, applied or tried to access that type of funding, but that's the scale uh, only that it is at. Um, and in terms of federal funding, I don't believe we've uh, we've pursued anything on that regard either from a heritage point of view. There isn't much federal funding for heritage uh, preservation. Okay. Um, um, would there be sort of like, um, so there might not be sort of any regular or standard, standard federal funding, but would there be the option of sort of a, a one-time ask? Uh, th there, may, there may be, uh, for an, an example, locally, the Ortona Armory Rehabilitation Project uh, did qualify for a uh, Canadian Cultural Spaces grant. Um, so there may be opportunities similar to that for Hangar 14. Okay, great. And that 100,000 that you had uh, mentioned um, annual funding, could that... Could that or should that help cover those maintenance maintenance costs that's in the report on page four, which says between between 110 and 450? Those uh, provincial grants are largely oriented towards rehabilitation work to historic components of the building. So restoring windows, things like that, that's the sort of qualifying uh, grants. If it's repair of electrical components and plumbing and things like that, those those types of works don't qualify for those grants. It's really focused on heritage preservation work only. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and then I think I just have one other. Uh, no, I think that does cover it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my question to administration, I have a few questions. I guess with the motion on the floor, I know in the in the original report, it talks about, you know, that the rehab is at 41 million and that by choosing that rehab, we're potentially deferring 19 other facility projects. Is that correct? My understanding is correct. I guess this motion here, as I'm understanding it, is not to invest any capital dollars or renewal dollars in this, but basically give the, the, the current tenant two years to see if there's an alternate strand, strategy to fund that 41 million. Is, is, is that your understanding as well? And then I'll ask that to the mover, but I'm just. So, so the way I take this uh, motion is we provided this as an information report administratively. We, we can go out and, and dispose of this, but based on the nature of the facility, uh, we felt it needed to be 
we needed to be clear to council that we were considering this. Um, so that doesn't change for us. And I think the motion identifies that we're still pursuing the d disposition approach, but what we're doing is uh, affording the current users uh, to be a, a condition of sale for a period of two, two year term, uh, at which time at the end of two years, we would remove that condition. That's the way I read this motion. So uh, my question to the mover, is that your, is, is that interpretation also your intention? Yes, absolutely. So again, I recognize that, that we do have a number of other priorities. This again is not intended that we, we fund those, those improvements. Uh, the, the, the end result is a, is a disposition, but it's just providing the um, museum sort of a first right of refusal to come up with a strategy. Okay, and then one of the things that, I, you know, on, I'm on executive, so I, I heard the speakers that day, and one of the concerns they had uh, was around, they only have one working furnace right now. Um, and I wonder if there's also reputational risk based on this motion, if that furnace was to fail and then some of those assets within the museum are destroyed or, or um, harmed in any way. Is that a reputational risk we're taking on with this motion? Or will we, in the stopgap, fix the furnaces so that that will not be a potential risk? So similar to another facility that, that we have where uh, we've signaled that we wouldn't uh, replace, or sorry, uh, rehab if it got to a significant cost to invest, go in a pool, we would take a similar approach with this facility where we would invest to keep it going and our pursuit would be on the basis of making sure that we could uh, find a buyer and, and move on from the facility. So when you say invest, is that at that amount of like between 110,000 to 450,000 or? That's correct. That's, that's the amount we're talking about, which is already integrated it, into a base budget? And, and at, at, at our best estimate at this point in time, with aging facilities, uh, and I believe I mentioned this on the capital investment outlook, uh, we invested close to uh, over $30 million in unplanned rehabilitation of some of our facilities, not planned rehabilitation. So there's so that risk too, that there could be unplanned, to, like to is. keep that maintenance for two years, there could be something significant that happens that's a that higher cost than the 450. Absolutely, that's a risk with a facility like this, correct? Okay, and I received a lot of emails with people concerned about the historical preservation, but my understanding from executive, and so I wanna confirm it, is that because it is historically de designated both provincially and municipally, and we have that guidelines to, uh, uh, the disposition guidelines for historically city-owned historic resources, the goal is not to destroy this historically significant site, but rather to um, just not have the city be the owners of it, just to clarify for the public. That's correct, actually we can't. Exactly, that there's, there's guidelines and protections in place. That's correct. And that being said, there's less likely to get a buyer the longer that state, that, that hangar is in disrepair or is, is in worse condition from a capital perspective. Like, is that a risk as well? That is, that's why we've identified it at this point that before we make a significant investment, before it gets to the point where it's uh, beyond repair, this is the time to pursue disposition. Okay, thank you so much. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I unfortunately missed the speakers um, at committee, uh, but appreciate the, the, the recap. Um, I guess I'm wondering how long has the administration been working with the museum to get to this point? Maybe Mr. Jebney can help me with this. Yeah, Councilor, we've, I mean, the museum's been there almost 30 years, and we've done a lot of work with them since 2019 on a revitalization plan, uh, which is more around operations than around the building. Okay, so there hasn't been a whole lot of dedicated conversations on the, bu on the building itself. No, there, there were some conversations when the building, w the lease was renewed, uh, I think back in 2017, there were some good conversations around the state of the building at that time. Okay. Um, but I get, there, there have been conversations with the operators around the state of the facility and those have been regular. Right, and I guess just given your last comment, Mr. Lachlan, that uh, you know, your recommendations for now, 
because there's implication if we keep waiting. I guess I'm just wondering, is two years too much time, too short of time? Do you have any thoughts on that time? Well, I'll ask um, our folks from uh, real estate to sort of weigh in on that because it's really around, this is applying a condition to the sale of the facility. So uh, Neil can provide more commentary on that. So two years gives us enough time to explore the option, but then if we can't find a buyer, um, still explore other options without this being a condition of sale before the building okay. theoretically gets into a state of disrepair. And are, are there interests right now? We, we haven't put it out to market, so we don't have okay. a gauge on interest yet. Um, and then I guess a question about that, uh, the facility renewal program for the other 19, um, are they in various states? I'm, I'm wondering if, um, actually, you know what? I withdraw that question, I think. I think that's been answered. Um, I had, I was wondering, I'm assuming the conversation around tourism is part of all this. I, I'm asking because I'm just wondering for, um, you know, the historical designation, um, you know, when it comes to Alberta tourism or even federal tourism, um, are there any opportunities there? Well, I think this motion well, provides space for our folks to to look at those opportunities. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor uh, Matt, can you take the chair? I've got the chair. Thank you. So the the strategy for federal and provincial involvement, I think back to my time in Ottawa and the Winnipeg, Avia uh, the Royal Aviation Museum was in a similar type of a dilemma because the lease was expired, they were forced to move. But there, instead of city leading the strategy of engagement, community led the strategy of engagement, right? And what we heard from the Aviation Association about their capacity issues, is there a way for us to actually help build their capacity so they can engage private sector, they can engage federal government and the provincial government because that would only might, might be more successful in, uh, in, uh, in mobilizing instead of us leading that engagement strategy with the province and the federal government. Because we'll be competing against many other needs that we have, and the Aviation Association can do that work with your support, with your administration support, and our support, but lead that independent of the city. So it is still our facility, Mr. Mayor. So in terms of any requests, it would sort of be coming with that element to it? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, so in terms of competing with others, um, you know, unless there was a, a deal that was made prior to submission or, or uh, any grant opportunities, it would still come as the city of Edmonton unless there was a sale. Uh, yeah. In terms of supporting the group, uh, I think that's something that if this motion passes, uh, I think that's essentially what we're getting in terms of direction, so we'd have to figure that out. Yeah. Because cause I, I, I agree there was no federal program for such a, such a support, but the provisions were made because of uh, the private sector took the leadership on, uh, on coming up with initial money, then leveraging that money with federal and provincial support, right? So that's what I'm getting, even though we own the facility, but uh, the Aviation Museum Association, an independent organization, this is their home, right? Without this home, they will have very difficult time getting anywhere else, right? So, so if they could lead that, that's what I'm getting at. And Mr. Corbold, if you have any thoughts on that. So certainly if, if they assembled and they were able to get, as it's noted in the motion, private investors, um, then it becomes a bit cleaner for the city of Edmonton and that they become the owner of said facility yeah. and they then can pursue. Yeah, so with the, um, with the intent of transferring ownership, right? 100%. And then they, yeah, I th something to think about that because they might be more successful because of the community-based organization and uh, leveraging private dollars. Well, and, and based on this motion, that's what we would be investigating is what options are available, private, uh, provincially, federally, 
with the the current tenants to see what options are available. Okay. I know. But just, I, just so we're clear, I, I just want to make sure I understand what the question is because are you talking about, Mr. Mayor, uh, us providing sort of operational funding so they can hire more capacity to do I, that? Or? I don't know what that capacity building would look like, but I what I am kind of seeing in my head is the success of Winnipeg, right? And their yeah. success was because community and private sector led the advocacy of engagement with the province and the federal government, and they also were able to generate money in the community. But I heard from the association, I hear Aviation Association, that they don't have the capacity to do that kind of work. Yeah. And, and I would say we could certainly help them with the technical capacity and as much as we can, but, but I also think, that, you know, they, they should be able to, if they need to, you know, add more staff to the association, I'm sure they could get that through some private funding or... Yeah. So I, I put that. So I, you know, we'll do everything we can to support yeah. them. <clears throat> but in the end, I think if they want, they're talking about actually hiring staff, they would need to do that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Because the intent would be, we would have to dispose this building eventually because uh, the repairs are going to be so cost prohibitive without that participation from se private sector and other outside government will be almost impossible. So it's in, it's in the, uh, in the best interest of the Aviation Museum Association as well, that they lead that work, or be maybe eventually become owners uh, with uh, some sort of partnership with other other private sector. Agree. We recently had a an example where private sector did step up, and it was Hangar yeah. 11. Yeah. Okay. Is this motion clear then uh, that we would have to dispose of this facility, right, uh, or does? Because I don't want to, we don't want to give a false hope to the, to the association that somehow we will continue to own it and they'll continue to uh, uh, stay there, uh, and uh, but we'll work with them to explore all the options. This is clear that either at the end of two years the facility will be disposed of, where the current tenant is part of a solution. Okay. Following two years, it's we're disposing of it without conditions. Okay, got it. Thank you. I can return the chair. Good. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back. Oh, it's, no, I'll actually move. Oh, no, sorry. Councillor Rice, you are next. You haven't had a first round. Mm, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the motion on the floor and right now the intention is going to the direction we still on the direction try to figure out the dis disposal this building, right? Correct. Uh, so I just want to think from different perspective. And at least uh, city across the world and then even across North America, if you look at historical designation, I understand the, the cost for the repair or renew and is huge uh, based on the condition of the facility. Uh, like I ask this question in the executive committee as well. And because we have to, I think the decision for me and I need to make, we should make the decision is based on we are going to dispose of this or we make the decision based on how to find the solution to keep this museum. And museum is already, museum means old buildings. So right now, to me, and the intention for this motion, uh, it seems we are going to the, it seems the decision is already made. Is that an understanding right? Yeah. That's the question to the mover? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I did frame it this way to provide that clarity that I think, that I think disposition is, is, is the realistic option. Um, and all this is meant to say is that let's let's give a try that if the city is no longer the owner that there's at least an opportunity for the museum to stay um but that oh okay yeah. so um i get i get a clarification for the intention and however uh i would like to say the question to the administration if we we're talking about yes this motion by us two years time and use this two years time to find different options. And can we, can we be very clear, find the options, find the strategies, and based on what we want. 
So if we want just, uh, yeah, after two years and without any condition, we just dis disposition, or we find the, really the way to help museum to stay? That is my question. So also that is our decision needs to make today. Uh, the council's decision you make today. Is that right? And so otherwise we mix the two, say, oh, we, we use this two years to find, to work with different partners and, and then try to build the capacity and try to find the solutions. But what specifically we want to focus on? And I think that's, if that's to be clear and it will give us the way to find the solution. So to be clear, we, we're we not in a position where we're saying we'd like to do away with the Aviation Museum. What we're really getting to here is where is the Aviation Museum? Is it within an existing facility that's owned by the City of Edmonton, which comes with a $41 million at minimum renewal requirement? Um, but we're receiving direction here that we would move in a direction where um, the Aviation Museum would we'd work with the AV, Aviation Museum for two years to see if there's a different strategy to keep them there. If not, then we would dispose of the Aviation Museum building. But as part of that, we would also be looking at where else could we accommodate the Aviation Museum that is more cost effective uh, for them, whether we reach that two year time frame or not. So we'd be looking at both strategies. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Councillor, that I think it's important to understand there are two values here mm -hmm. that don't have to be tied together. There is a heritage value of Hangar 14 itself, given the history and historical precedence and importance of that facility that was used in the 30s and 40s. That is a very uh, important value that is pretty much protected from the heritage laws. Yeah. Then there's a value that is completely different, which is the the uh, artifacts that are within the museum right now, which could could essentially be used uh, and be quite frankly better protected in a brand new building, uh, as we've seen with you know the 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 nation's uh, hi historical military history museum in Ottawa, brand new building to protect the the assets they had. So I think it's just important that there are two values to consider. They don't have to necessarily be tied together. So. Okay, thank you. My time is out. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Mr. Corbo just summed up the gist of my questions anyway. Uh, but um, I do have one remaining question. That is, uh, you know, the, the museum folks themselves may feel that this is uh, a very uh, limited amount of time in order to do an enormous amount of work. But we are offering assistance, um, maybe just for the benefit of counsel, Mr. Corbell, do you mind uh, sort of laying out what that assistance would be in the form of uh, specifically? Yeah, I think others are better to do that. I guess I would generally say, you know, mostly it's going to be technical assistance and support in terms of, you know, the work we've already done into the facility and tied really to the fact that we own the facility now. Uh, we're not museum experts, so I don't think we can offer a lot of specific assistance on sort of museum and, and not-for-profit fundraising, but we can certainly help on the on the technical side with the facilities and, and also just because we have a, a perspective through our real estate folks on, on the market and what, what are the opportunities. So that's where I would say we would mostly focus our efforts on. Okay. And, and one thing that we're looking at, I, I'm sure, is uh, the, the price tag to bring this up to uh, the standard that uh, it should be. Um, sounds like the price tag for an entirely new building. Um, so I guess the, the equation would be, um, or I guess we also might have existing facilities. So that's really the, the question that we'll have in a couple of years, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. And I would hope that it would actually be significantly less than that level of investment for a new facility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be a facility with a lot of bells and whistles, and it's certainly not a purpose-built facility simply for that at that price tag. Yeah, okay. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Like, I know this probably looks like, ooh, 
two years and then disposition without conditions probably sounds scary, but the reality is that this is a this is a process um, and it doesn't actually end at two years, does it? Oh, no, no. And in addition to what Mr. Corbell mentioned, our folks in community services uh, in, in the partnerships group regularly work with the Aviation Museum on on regular uh, and you heard Mr. Jevney say it strategic planning and support. So that will continue. Yeah, and this definitely gives time for a more robust uh, public conversation. I mean, even with uh, with this timeline here, that I think that may help focus the public's attention on this to sort of voice what they would like to see happen as well. Yeah. Generally speaking, that's what happens when we have timelines on things, isn't it? Well, I I, I, w I will. Sh I will say we're not doing going out and doing public engagement on a, on oh, a no, sale. Oh no, no, nothing like that. Um, but certainly through regular channels, if there's uh, feedback provided, it would be uh, something we would incorporate as as this yeah. progresses. Yes. I think it's fair to say that most of us as counselors are already getting emails in our inboxes. So I think that uh, conversation will likely continue. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Paquette, can you move the second round? Yeah, I move second round. Second, second by Councillor Nack. Please vote for the second round. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I think Councillor Wright, you were next. Yes, thank you. I just um, I initially clicked on again because I, I wanted to clarify whether Mr. Lachlan was saying can or can't, but I, then I think I heard him say can't with a little more emphasis to, to Councillor Rutherford. So we, we cannot demolish the hangar, right? It's provincially protected. Right, okay. So then, um, so then my question, maybe to yourself or maybe the mover where it says to dispose of it uh, without condition. The, the condition that it can't be demolished would have to stay on there though, right? Correct. The, the condition that would be removed is just that the museum remain in place. Okay. Um, but the okay. other, other condition in terms of the provincial asset uh, would, would stay. So that's a, a good clarification. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then, so after two years, um, to dispose of it, we still would need a buyer, right? That's correct. What if we can't find one? Would we go below market value or? Well, I, I think based on the liabilities that we have with this facility, and Neil could probably weigh in on this more as well from a market perspective. I think we'd be open to many different options, which include below market. Okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and then it would be up to the new buyer to do do whatever renovations were required with whatever funding they could get. Well, they would have to uh, any any development or or refurbishment of the facility would have to be in line with the provincial um, protection that's provided under uh, heritage. Okay, and our bylaw would still stay in place then as well. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councillor Wright, Councillor Prince Bay. You haven't had a first round. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as a member of the Edmonton Salutes Committee, I kind of felt com compelled to speak, not to speak to this, but to ask a question. Uh, I just want to ensure that um, we will still be supporting the museum and making sure that they will have a home, whether it still be at Hangar 14 or and that the, the aviation heritage will be maintained. I'm not sure who can answer that. So ultimately that does become a council decision because it is related to budget, um, but it's administration's intention that that continues. 
Okay, that's that is my intention as well. So uh, thank you for that. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe, Councillor Steve, Councillor Nack. Sorry to jump in. No, no, go ahead. There. But I, I guess I do want to ask on that. So, do you need any additional direction from Council to to make sure that we we are going to work closely with them? So, if, if for some reason over the next two years we can't find a, a solution that would allow them to stay, do you need something to make it clear that we want them to be in a space uh, and that we will that we will essentially work with them? to do that, and I imagine there might need to be some type of financial um, element to that. So I just, I want to know, do you have that direction or do you need that direction from us still? I don't believe we need that direction. I'll see if Mr. Jevney would want to chime in. No, we would, we would certainly continue to work with the museum on what the options are if the Hangar 14 didn't work out. So I don't think we need further direction now. We would at the time, uh, as Mr. Laughlin said, there could be budget implications and we need to bring that back uh, once we knew what those were. So and there and I would just add, Councillor, th this gets to the, the second important aspect I talked about, which is the, the exhibits themselves. I yeah. think it would be a shame for those exhibits to have to find a home outside of Edmonton. Correct. Based on uh, what, they, what they've been through, where they've gone, many of them have performed here uh, in Edmonton and been based out of the municipal airport, for example. So I, I don't think we need any more direction at all to, to do our best to, to find a home. And I would also say that um, Explore Edmonton as part of their um, uh, tourism strategy has looked at and considered all museums, including this one, as an important attraction to Edmonton. So I think it's absolutely in our interest to, uh, to support that. So we have a clear expectation that we want Edmonton to be the home for this, ideally yes. in this location if there's a way to make it work. If, unfortunately, there's no way to do it over the next two years, we have a direction, to, you already have clear guidance to go and do that. And if there is a financial requirement to retrofit a building, to do upgrades, to address different things, we, we, you would come back with that already. Absolutely, uh, that's yeah. my understanding as city manager, and it may include even a transition period where we may have to come to council to get funds to support a transition period where maybe some of those artifacts are stored for a period of time until we can find a folk. So I think uh, absolutely is that would be administration's okay. intent. Uh, would that include, you know, I know that they have um, put in upgrades to the facility over the last, I think, couple of years, and, and obviously those were likely hoped to be in place for an extended period of time. Again, if, if we can't get through it on the motion as is, part of the work we would do is determine how do we make sure that they're not essentially throwing away the value of what they've put into, you know, if we, if we need to move upgrades or different pieces, that's, that's also part of what we would be doing as a body of work is determining what they've invested, what can be taken from there if it had to be moved and how it would be best moved so that we're not asking them to again spend money on things having just spent money on things. Correct. That's great, okay. All right, thank you, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Salvador. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, I think it was mentioned um, that this is, yeah, nationally relevant uh, historical asset, historic asset as well as a uh, museum. So I'm just wondering if, if we're exploring disposition, is it possible that there could be acquisition from another order of government, like to actually you know, take on the building? I honestly think we're open to whatever and whoever and <laughs> as quickly as possible. Wonderful. Okay. Um, that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Councillor Knack and Councillor Principe uh, already asked two, two questions I wanted to touch on. And yeah, just wanted to make sure that we don't need to be more explicit in the motion to say that administration work with the Aviation Museum to develop a disposition strategy. Is that is that understood in terms of the intent? That is understood. Okay, perfect. And and there'll be an opportunity to connect with the museum as well. I think sort of that that division of labor, like they're not on their own. This is gonna have a lot of that, that support from the city in terms of exploring some of those other options. They can go out and talk to people as well, but but it will be um, a supported effort. They're not just sort of on their own and you know, they won't talk to you until two years from now kind of thing. No, the, the, they have been engaged. They will continue to be engaged and they'll continue to be part of this as it progresses regardless of where this lands. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, well, I, I, 
also just wanted to confirm as well, well maybe just to, to go back, because I think it's a really great point about you know the two the two separate values. There's the building and then the use of that building. But I think there's also that that sum being greater than sorry, the, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts in terms of like the unique opportunity for those uh, heritage assets to be in that heritage building. And I, I don't know, Mr. Johnson, if you can maybe speak um, to maybe some of that value add in terms of maintaining the use in, the, in, in that specific space. Uh, certainly, I, I, would, I would definitely say it's quite rare to have a circumstance like this where we have a historic aircraft hangar from the Second World War occupied by a provincial aviation museum that showcases the history directly of planes from that era in the building. Um, so often these historic artifacts are put in sterile new buildings and you lose that, it's still interesting, but you lose that direct context and, and that education component of walking people through the building and saying, yeah, this type of aircraft that you see hanging here on the ceiling actually rolled through this building in 1943. That's really rare and it's really powerful. So, you know, trying to maintain that would be ideal. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, and just want to confirm as well, I think I think the 41 million number that we see in the report, that is, um, you know, an investment plan over a number of years, correct? Um, and that there were some other options as well in terms of that, that rehabilitation approach? That that is over a number of years, but that was our our base level of investment that we would recommend if this continued to be our asset. Right, and so I guess that's the piece I want to clarify is recognizing that you know disposition strategy ultimately means it it wouldn't be a city asset. Just want to confirm that the condition for the city releasing that asset to another owner wouldn't necessarily be that same bar. That there's potentially some flexibility there. I would hope not. Okay. Because the basic level of investment is to get the facility back in functional. So $41 million does not incorporate other council policies to the like degree that they should be. Yeah. So if, if this is a heritage facility and someone is cutting costs from a renewal perspective, I'd be very concerned. Great, but just recognizing again, though, that this this isn't. For However, oh, go ahead. Sorry. If we dispose of it, that would be at the new owner's discretion. Right. It wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't be registered on title or anything. Anyway, but all that to say that forty-one million is over. I think a decade or two decades. So it's not that we have to have forty-one million locked down in two years, but that we have the strategy and the partners to provide that long-term sustainable maintenance of the building. And maybe I should clarify then, because with this direction, we are not proposing any investment in the facility. So we sell the building, it's on the new owner to invest what they deem is appropriate and we'll share our engineering studies that, so it's, I think we have to when we're doing a, a sale like this. Right, Just, but just in terms of what would satisfy you at the end of two years that an appropriate strategy has been developed? Um, for us it would be, uh, and Neil can add to this, assurance that the, the buyer has good financial backing to support that it isn't a, a case of where it, the liability remains with the city of Edmonton based on a deal falling through. Um, and then it, it, it really becomes uh, the, the owner's requirement to adhere to provincial requirements related to the heritage component of the facility. And Neil, I don't know if there's more that you would add. Yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot more to add. We want to satisfy, that, satisfy ourselves that we think their proposal is uh, able, like they're going to be able to actually keep the building going and, and keep the museum in place. But um, like Adam said, it'll be, once we sell the property, it's it's incumbent on them to do it. And if the building falls down, then that's, you know, that's on them. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So we'll stop here. We'll, we'll be back at 3.45. Until then, we are in the recess and come back to Councillor Rice when we come back.
I mean, we should call back to order. Do we have enough people, though, to call back? Uh, I think we might have quorum. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do a quick, uh, do I, we need to do a quick roll call for yeah, online. Yeah, please. Uh, Councillor Wright? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm here. Uh, uh, Councillor Principe? Hello. Councillor Stevenson? Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette? Hello. Hello, Councillor Tang? Hello. Hello, Mayor Sophie will be here soon. Councillor Hamilton? Hello. Councillor Rutherford? Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador? Hello. That was a great greeting, Councillor Rutherford, I like that. <laughs> Councillor Carmel? Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. We have 1,204 days left in this term. Thank you, thank you. Did you know? Uh, uh, Councillor Rice is next. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nack. Um, so, the investment study is already done uh, in 2021, uh, but the direction of this motion is towards so we're not consider any investment and then as a results in that study right so uh, we would um, perform necessary operation and maintenance needs to ensure the facility continues to operate and we would do this until we get to resolution uh, from a sale perspective from a capital investment perspective no <coughs> okay um, for for this two years period, and then we still have historical disengagement policy and the climate po resilience policy in place. And when we do that uh, operation, operational maintenance, and do we have idea and how much cost for us to do this and compared to that for $41 million number? Yeah, it's identified in the report that the annual operation and maintenance costs range from 110,000 to 450,000. So even with the uh, safety concerns, uh, the condition and the outline is a report. Still in that same range. That's correct, and it could go up and down depending on the year and depending on this, uh, the need within the facility. Okay, so is that a possibility to explore the uh, strategy and then how we, because right now the motion on the floor is only focused on one strategy, is this position strategy. Is there any possibility to focus on some like financial strategy to look for different options? And by that way, and at least, and from museum perspective, from museum's value perspective, uh, they are not feeling uh, we are just to use this two years to get them out of this hangar 14. And how we can support and this museum and to keep that value uh, at the same time for us looking for the strategies, different possible strategies not only focus on this one direction. So that, that's a bit along the lines that Councillor Knack asked, that regardless of whether it's two years, whether it's four years, the commitment that the organization has is to make sure that we continue to support the Aviation Museum. So that work will happen um, irregardless of the timing of this sale and we don't feel we need direction from council on that. Yeah, so I do have a little bit of concern to sit uh, for the tone of this motion already set up. So the tone is already set up from this motion, say we're going this direction. And then and back to my first question I asked earlier, I do want to look for the different options to say, uh, to open the wide door and for say the, uh, to look at the strategy, uh, what would happen if we retain Anchor 14? So what would happen if we are going the direction this motion uh, said and in two years and for the dis dispersation? So, so I think that could be the more wider um, opportunity and for us to looking for um, 
no matter, like you said, no matter uh, for these two years, we're, we were looking for different options. And how about uh, we just make sure we are not just the set tone here already, we just follow this direction and go in doing something aligned with this direction and in the motion. So the, in consideration of the entire asset inventory, uh, the information we presented in the capital investment outlook, this is our recommendation that we are going down the disposal of the strategy route from City of Edmonton ownership. If council would like to provide different direction, you'd have to provide that. Administration feels that from an asset inventory perspective, uh, the city not owning this and not investing the renewal dollars uh, is, is a better holistic asset management consideration. Okay, I think that is, uh, my time is out. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Prince Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I still, I, ha I am concerned that we, we have a gem here and I am concerned that we could lose it. That is my fear. And so with the amendment, or sorry, with the motion here, I at first was very supportive of it, but my concern is um, when the report that we have, I, I didn't see any discussion about um, speaking with private partners or looking into governments, other uh, governments like provincial and federal government support um, to retain, for the city to retain the property. Did, did we do that in this uh, report? No, we didn't. And Mr. Johnson answered it earlier that there's typically not federal or provincial programs to the degree that's needed to support this facility. Again, uh, our recommendation um, is that we pursue this uh, disposition, but if council would like to provide a, um, a strategy for us to maintain this, then uh, we would need that direction. And, and frankly, we would need that direction very urgently because we would have to allocate at minimum $41 million out of the upcoming capital budget for your capital budget to accommodate, sorry, maybe not all 41 million, but over the, over the next series of capital budgets to complete the necessary basic rehabilitation, um, which is why from an asset inventory perspective, we feel that um, this strategy is more appropriate because of the asset pressures that we have in terms of we're we're very, uh, we're very uh, wealthy when it comes to the number of assets that we have, but uh, uh, the resources to accommodate the necessary renewal are, are not where they need to be. So we do need to start looking at opportunities where we can uh, create better balance to ensure that we have enough renewal dollars to maintain all of our assets. Yeah, and I do agree with you on that aspect. But I, I do fear that we could be losing, like David had mentioned, to actually have that museum where in World War II it was actually happening. You can't replace that. And this is a hidden gem that maybe Explore Edmonton, you know, might be able to capitalize on that, and which I'd like to see. Uh, the, now, mo the motion does provide the opportunity for that. Okay, and see, my fear is that it's just a disposition strategy, that there's no strategy for keeping it as a city asset. That's correct. So that, if, if that's council's desire, we would need that direction to re retain the facility, and then we would prepare accordingly, from a capital perspective, the allocation of renewal funding for this facility. All right. Now, I'm not sure if um, this is in order, but I was considering making an amendment um, to, and I don't think it would be a friendly amendment because I think it might change the direction, just to have options of a disposition strategy um, versus um, keeping the asset, the city keeping the asset. Having said that, continuing with the other parts of the motion as well. 
Yeah, <clears throat> that would not be friendly, Counselor. Yeah. Uh, Principe, because that's a totally two different directions, right? Or two, yeah, two directions given to administration. Right. Yeah. So it would just be like administration uh, develop options, disposition strategy, or um, maintaining the asset, and then you know also partnering with other levels of government and private partners. So you're, propo so, you're proposing an amendment to do the motion? I am proposing an amendment, yes. And, and I don't know, like, if, if administration could tell me, is, is that necessary in order to achieve what I, I'm looking for? We would need direction that you want us yeah. to retain this facility because the report is written in a way where administratively based on council's asset management policy dis disposition is within our our authority um, so if you're directing us okay. otherwise you'd have to provide that direction okay so i would like to make an amendment um to the motion so councillor principi just to clarify so i've just sent you the wording what i would say is that your amendment would be to add the words options including after develop in the first lie and then after uh, would be pursued, it would also include retaining the city retaining the asset. Yes, that's correct. So where, sorry, Madam Point Clerk, of order. Uh, just hold on for, where would that be included, sorry, Madam Clerk? So we're just gonna have to put it up on the screen, but I'm typing it as the councillor was saying it. So there would be two changes to the motion. So right now the motion is to just do one thing. Yeah. Um, councillor Principe would like the motion to do two things, come back with a disp one a disposition strategy as outlined in the motion. And the other thing would be that the city come back with um, considerations on how to retain the asset. Yeah. Not to retain the asset, but just to come back with option A and option B. So disposition is already in the main motion, right? That's right. So all we need to do is add the retaining option to retain the building. That's right, but I need to add the words options at the first oh, part. Got it, okay. And then the second part would be at the end. So I'm just yeah. drafting that right okay, now. Okay, no problem. Constra, yeah. Constra and Rutherford, sorry. Sorry, the, sorry, go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, Councillor Rutherford has a point of uh, order, sorry. Point, Councillor Rutherford. I, I guess I just am trying to understand from from the motions that really changes it takes out any direction to the motion to like no direction in my opinion and I, I'm just trying to understand when is something an amendment and this is to city clerk and when is something actually substantively changing and, and uh, the the motion in a way that would be out of order when the intention of the amendment is to do the complete opposite of the main motion, which this isn't, it's to retain that direction and, and supplement okay. it with the second okay. thing. That's why it's not out of order, okay. it's in order. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rutherford. So, sorry, Councillor Principe, your time is out. Uh, maybe you wanna sign up for next round. Uh, while the uh, clerk is typing it up, Councillor Knack, you wanna go next? Sure, so I just want to check, the, the, the amendment is not yet on the floor? It's being worded, that, no it's not. Okay, yeah, okay. no I just so. want to know what I should be asking. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. Um, a, a few more questions uh, related to this. So I know we spent a lot of time talking about the Aviation Museum itself. There's a number of other tenants in that, uh, that operate out of that space. And uh, while I, it probably goes without saying, we, we probably should in fact say it out loud that, that we would also be working with the other tenants, I think Air Cadets and other groups around the same way we'd be working with the Aviation Museum, right? Is that is that fair to say? Correct. Perfect, yeah, okay. Uh, so meaning, what, and I guess I should be very clear in that, what that means is that we're not gonna, if by chance we couldn't figure out a way to, to sell it and have these folks continue to operate out of them, we wouldn't simply say, you're out of luck, go find to sell it yourself a new place. We would be working with them in advance of that to hopefully have them in a city building, potentially all together as a collection of, of tenants like they are right now. Uh, absolutely, and from a asp asset perspective, we'd like to make sure it's in a facility that doesn't come with significant renewal okay. requirements and there's co-location and we're, we're maximizing the uses of our, our, our asset inventory. Yeah. So the the other piece, and I guess, you know, while the amendment's not on the floor, I can ask this out uh, this piece now, is that 
essentially the strategy for not removing or to, to keep it would require a portion of that $41 million over the next four years. That, that is the only option before us. Do we, do we have a sense based off the reports that you've done is approximately how much of that $41 million do you think we would need in this next four-year cycle? Because it's really only one option, I think, right? Um, I'll see if uh, um, Murray is on the line. He probably has the specifics in terms of outlay for that. Be great. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking it up right now. Uh, could I get back to you in of one minute? Of course, please? yeah, absolutely. And uh, while while that's coming up, there's not really the decision point would be if we wanted to not sell it, we're going to have to put in whatever the dollar amount is that will be told to us in a few moments here. That that and that would have to come in this four-year cycle. And I'm guessing almost two degree, maybe even slightly early. It sounds like because of the urgency here. Or could that decision at least wait till the budget, based off the current status? Well, I think I think it can wait. I think uh, um, I guess what's difficult for us is if we're looking at options, but then also going down a disposition strategy. We're really unclear on the direction sure. that we're proceeding. Yeah, and that um, motion's not on the floor, so I'll, I'll not ask about that yet, but I was just getting a sense of what, what the dollar amount and, and what that actually looks like. Yeah, is. so yeah. Uh, if Mr. Johnson um, yeah. is, uh, when ready, uh, yeah. he, can, he can share that sure. in terms of the investment. Um, while that's coming, the other question I saw uh, online uh, during the break here is is just to make it clear that if this motion were to be approved, this is not asking the current tenants to go find a buyer or to them themselves find whatever amount of money needed. If they wanted to be the owners, that would potentially be an option. If they wanted to go partner with folks, that's an option. But, but this is a, a city of Edmonton-led disposition. We are the ones who would be going to market uh, with a condition on it and ideally trying to hopefully find a buyer that would be interested in, in supplying that. that that's, that's how I read this, right? We're not asking the tenants to do that work. That's correct. Yeah. I would just add, Councillor, that I think it's a team effort. Uh, and, and getting to the mayor's line of questioning earlier, they may have better success as, as an association than we do, well, and so I think we'll work together on that for sure. Without a doubt, I guess I, just some of the comments I, I think that I've read uh, potentially from one of our speakers last week is, is I think there might be interpreting that, that this motion would say you have to do all of that work. If they happen to have a partner or partners that are willing to do some of that work, they can, but we're taking the lead on this body of work. This is a, this is a city of Edmonton building, so we wouldn't be asking them to find Forty million dollars or anything like that. No. Okay. If they happen to find partners again, great. So uh, I think I'm down to the end. Do we have any uh, answer on the amount of what we'd be expecting over the next four-year cycle? So concert. Yes. Th Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for for waiting. It is thirty million dollars over the next four-year cycle, with uh, the balance coming in the following uh, couple of cycles afterwards. Once assets deteriorate. Okay. So that would be what we would be required. To. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Okay, Councillor Nack, so I think uh, Madam Clerk needs a little time to talk to administration. Uh, so we'll pause here for a little bit. We don't have to take a break, but we'll pause. A, yeah. Okay, so Madam Kirk, what is? 
Yes, yeah, so uh, thanks for the let, letting us have that quick pause. So I think there's just uh, some clarity needs to be provided around what the motion on the floor is. Okay. Um, and that will help inform whether or not a part two or an amendment is actually in order or not. Okay, what clarity do you need? So I'm going to ask Mr. Lachlan to explain what authority is actually being given to administration in the first part of the motion. So as part of the asset management policy, uh, administration has the authority to dispose of assets because of the nature of this we brought this forward we're having discussion about it um, so we're simply getting direction on the method of disposition we're not planning to bring a report back we are proceeding with disposition based on this motion and it's on the basis of for two years working with the group that's in the facility to see if there's options where they could uh, maintain, uh, continue to use the facility. At the end of two years, we would remove that condition and continue to dispose of without those conditions. So this isn't a, a motion for a report back. This is direction that as part of the disposition approach, we would take uh, the, the two-year approach with the folks within the facility. So this won't come with a report back if this passes as is. Okay. So what wording do you need to change in order to have that direction to be clear? That the wording needs to be changed in the motion? Well, I guess it would be that in a, in administration implement a disposition strategy. Not a develop, implement. If that has created confusion, apologies, but our understanding or, or the way we've interpreted this is that you're providing direction to dispose of it in this manner. Okay. Is that's the intent of the mover? Yep, that, that is friendly. And I, the intent of the seconder now is that of all of the assembly because it's on the we need assembly's approval, right? To see if that's, they see that as a intent, Cause, Madam Clerk. I would say that would be helpful, yeah. but right now the way it's worded, it's caused a little bit of confusion. So okay. I think clarity. I so would take out devolve, yeah. Impl yeah. Yeah. We'll put implement, insert implement. And therefore an amendment as as contemplated to do something other than this would actually be out of order okay. because this this motion as it's restated provides more clarity therefore you can't provide an amendment that does the complete opposite of what the main amend, main motion oh provides. i see okay so Thank okay you for allowing us to all pass. right so uh, okay so then how do we deal with consular print space uh, uh, intent so can we just deal with the first question, which is, can I just change what's up on the yep. screen that would be that administration implement a disposition strategy? Yep. Yep. So once that's up there. Is that okay, everyone? Oh, no. Point of order. Councillor uh, Rice, what are your uh, point of order? See, the report already provided for the information received. And if this is implemented, uh, disposing strategy, and then the motion should be just to receive the information. Madam Clerk, any thoughts? Or I can clarify. Yeah. So if it was received for information, this condition that's currently on the screen wouldn't be in place. We would simply undertake through um, real estate's lead the, so, yeah. the selling of the facility and the land. This so, motion puts a condition on how we would dispose of the facility. And also add as a timeline. Yeah, it does that, that. That's part of the condition, yes. So it's a different than receiving for information. Okay, so if that is the case, uh, so help me understand the pro procedure. And we deal with this motion first, and we change of the implement. And after this motion deal with, and then we are going to uh, princip consent of principles motion. Sorry, I'm not sure. What's the point of order? I missed that, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, a point of order is, <clears throat> is the information already uh, explained. Yeah, so for the, uh, for the other part, we have yeah. to come to that later on. We have to deal with this first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So implementation is inserted in there? Yeah, that's correct. So what's in eScribe and which, uh, which is up there, um, I think just provides a tiny little bit of extra clarity. Okay. Is that friendly house? And then to Councillor Rice's point, then to try and make an amendment that does the complete opposite of the motion on the floor would be out of order. Yes, it will be. So Councillor Prince Bay's intent would not be 
cannot be accommodated. Yes, my apologies for any confusion. Okay. So if this passes, then she cannot bring forward a subsequent or anything, right? So just to be clear, the motion on the floor is to implement a disposition strategy. Yeah. Councillor Principe, not to speak for her, I believe, was looking for an option retain to retain it. the asset, yeah. which would be the opposite of disposition. Okay, so what I need to understand, Madam Kirk, is that it is out of her intent is out of order, and how do we, what, how we give opportunity to Councillor Principe to bring that forward? I she would, would suggest that this motion should fail then, and then Councillor Principe Oh, Prince I see, okay, got it, directions. okay, okay. So if this fails, then she has the opportunity, got it, okay. Okay, good. All right, so we have the motion, so uh, Councillor Neck, you concluded your questions. Can, can you move the, that'll be the third round? I'll move another round of questions. Second. Uh, just waiting for my vote to appear. Oh, I, call, I haven't called the vote yet. Okay, please vote. There you go. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Back to the list, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks so much. And thanks to Councillor Knack for really clarifying that this is not on the shoulders of the museum alone, that, that the city is looking to sell this property in a very active way with the condition that, that the museum stay on site. So that's great to hear. Just wondering, um, maybe just to address the, the concern that Councillor Pr Principe raised, would it be possible to request that we receive an update at the end of two years prior to the condition being removed so at that point we can make a further decision about retention if, if we so deem that that's a direction we want to take, having exhausted other options? Uh, councils. I mean, it's in council's purview to get an update on on approaches that administration's taking. I, I, I guess I would just flag um, what direction administration is receiving if it's to not implement a disposition strategy. And, and I hear, and I think this is just trying to like walk that line where we are giving clear direction. We want you to implement a disposition strategy disposition strategy over the next two years that has this condition, if that disposition strategy in the next two years is not successful, we just a report back to council at that time. Yeah, that's totally within council's discretion. I, okay, and it, I think that that, it, might, that might address the concerns just so that um, it won't automatically go to uh, a dispos disposition without conditions so that we have a, a second chance to, to review and at that time see where we're at and with other priorities and, and if that's an investment. But Councillor Stephen, that's against the intent that Mr. Loughlin earlier identified. I, I don't think that's what I'm hearing from administration, that that wouldn't, that wouldn't derail. It's not telling you to do one of two things. It's saying we're going for disposition at this point with a condition and then just checking in again in two years. Right. It just, it's, uh, the way you introduced a counselor so that we could revisit. So it's, yeah. are, are, you, are you committing to disposition or are you wanting us to look at different options? So, um, I, so totally appreciate the challenge with this particular situation I will foreshadow we'll have a number of these as we go forward on the basis of our asset inventory um, but I think what creates a challenge for us is are we going down this path or not yeah and and I think that's the clarity they need clear like. direction and 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 that's fine and I think this this motion does provide that clear direction um, and then it's just checking in at two years yeah, yeah but I if think we, the if difference though counters if the check-in yeah. is with the express purpose of revisiting the decision that is I would say is yeah. not in order okay so it that's, is, that's it's essentially good. the same thing as a motion just two years down yeah um, but of course you know 
council can change its mind too. Yeah, and I, you know, I would suggest that in, in two years we have different information um, to, to help inform that decision, but but I take your point. I mean, I this is my motion, I am comfortable with it. Just looking for ways to maybe address some of the concerns raised raised by others. And just, just for my clarity as well, looking for these private um, partnerships, looking for other orders of government to be involved, Am I hearing from administration that that is mutually exclusive with us retaining the asset? That in order to unlock some of that other investment, that that it, it doesn't necessarily make sense for the city to be the owner of that asset. Is that kind of a fair? I, 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 I think uh, there's pros and cons to both. Um, so I think Ultimately, with any disposition, implementing a disposition, uh, the, the end goal is that it's no longer part of the inventory. But if uh, the weight of the city of Edmonton as a potential seller with the federal government, the provincial government, or other private sector investors um, helps, then we're here to help. If it doesn't, to uh, the mayor's comment earlier, where maybe it's a little bit easier for groups to, you know, we're we're looking to make this happen, then then we'll be in the background supporting. So I think that's part of what we need to figure out when we when we if if this passes to to figure out the the approach with the group. Okay, great. So, it, but it, it's not precluding those opportunities if there there was some value in the city taking that role that that this doesn't preclude that necessarily. No, just ultimately a decision on what that sale is. Especially, well, not especially, if it's below market value, Neil should be speaking to this, not me. If it's below market value, it would have to come back to council. Right, great. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Prince, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, it, again, I'm, I am comfortable with half of the motion, but maybe not so much the other half. I would still like to see the option, but I understand that it's uh, um, not in order. I do have a question. The The actual museum itself, though, it is an Alberta museum. Is that correct? Is it run under the Alberta government? No, it's a local not-for-profit, Councillor. The name is just Alberta Okay, museum. so it's a local non-for-profit, but it's just, yeah, it's just the name is Alberta. Okay, yeah, that was that was my only other question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince. So, Councillor Tang, to speak, any more questions on the motion? Seeing none, so questions are closed. Now we go to speaking. Uh, Councillor Tang. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess I just want to, I guess, stress one of the points that Mr. Uh, Lachlan just mentioned earlier around asset management, because I think that's the lens I've, been, I've taken with this issue quite a bit. Um, you know, I... I think this is a good motion. I think it addresses a lot of the concerns that partners and community members have brought forward. You know, there is no dismantling of the building. You know, it is, um, the historical preservation is, is certainly part of that condition. Um, and it gives the time and space for the city administration to work with community partners to pursue, you know, various options. Um, and I think since the election, you know, it's taken me quite a bit time to wrap my head around our asset management policy. And this isn't the first time we have to deal with an asset like this at this scale. Um, you know, a while ago we've, we've talked about other uh, infrastructure we've had and I think what effectively we're trying to do is to introduce a big change and we're asking people to adapt to that change. And oftentimes it gets quite emotional because um, people have always been very used to city owning the building and that and oftentimes people don't necessarily want that big change um but we've also had lengthy discussions about the state of our um budget and our, our financial you know state that it's not sustainable to continue in the path that we're on with many things um and one of which for us to do is to right size our inventory and to me this is part of that bigger much bigger policy um direction and if we're gonna be making, you know, if there's contemplation, you know, which I think we've heard lots uh, today, uh, to change from that direction, then I think we need to think about so, like a lot of other assets that will come forward. Um, and I think each time we're gonna be talking about more changes 
and there will be people who will want to maintain the status quo, um, but that I do think we'll miss out on other opportunities. Opportunities we otherwise might not have considered had you know, mo motions like the one today is, uh, is being put on the table. So you know, at some point, um, we, we keep talking about trade-offs and um, asset management policy is one of those things that um, I think is part of that conversation. So I think for me, you know, I think it's a good motion. I, 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 I hope our, you know, my colleagues keep that piece in mind um, because if we're looking at revisiting the, the asset management policy and that's a much, much bigger conversation for all of us to, con to contend with. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I will not support this motion. The reason for that, I think, is the focus difference. I, I mean, the, uh, in the mixed and for this motion, the half is okay and another half uh, is not really reflect the strategy we could use the existing capacity to develop. And for example, if due to the financial reason and then city cannot retain this facility, and then the question should come to is how we focus on to find or develop the financial strategy and instead of just only one direction disposition strategy. And then this building, this facility has so many meanings, different layers um, and under different policy. And if we already, uh, as a city, and put so much effort in the past, and uh, we have the museum and in the place as attraction and for our city as well. And then that financial strategy uh, development, that piece is missing. And to respond to the financial challenge and to renew and to maintain this facility. Now, due to this reason, I cannot support just the going this one strategy and without different options. Uh, that concern or principle is going to to bring up. Um, so just just any like that and a sell my time. Thank you, Councillor Rice, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will be supporting this motion uh, simply because I don't believe that, uh, well, let's put it this way. There are a few options that come out of this motion. One, uh, there's two years to find uh, partnerships and funding for the museum before we start moving in any other direction. In two years, we may have a different outlook on our budget that may uh, lead to a different decision about the disposition of the, of the hangar. Um, hopefully a better picture. Um, and even if there is not, there are still options. Uh, the council, uh, council in two years may decide, you know what, we, we looked around, it didn't turn out the way we wanted to, so let's just rehab anyway. That could be a choice that the council faces in two years. It's the will of council, obviously. Um, but it could also be that, uh, you know what, we're going to relocate, uh, all the displays to another facility that doesn't present as many, uh, challenges. And the other option is we could build a brand new facility. Um, those are all options that nothing, no doors are closed here. The only thing that's happening is that we're giving a timeline for trying to find some partnerships because frankly, our budget is uh, stretched to the max, as we all are very aware of, and we need to start looking for alternate solutions. Um, now, this may be a motion that doesn't please uh, everyone, and I can see why, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I fought for funding for the uh, museum years ago. I'm a supporter of the museum, and in this motion, I don't see, um, an issue that that in any way sort of uh, disadvantages the museum. It only provides more options, and I think that's uh, that's a positive. So 
because of that, because of all those reasons, I, I am going to support this. And uh, I, who knows, I, I'm actually pretty confident that uh, um, in a few years, we'll see some positive movement here. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Neck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And, and um, yeah, uh, this it's tough because I, I understand that the ideal scenario would be in an ideal world where money wasn't an issue, we would probably hang on to this and we'd continue that relationship as we currently have. But what we've heard today is, is I mean, we can do that, but it costs us $30 million. So, well, 41 over, but over the next budget cycle, $30 million. That's what it will cost us. So, um, and, and I think when we had the operating, or sorry, the capital investment outlook, it was pretty clear in my mind that we don't have that ability to do that. At least I, I don't, I don't see how, how we could, um, uh, unless we obviously change our priorities as a council on a number of other, uh, major issues that we've, we've outlined. So, um, unfortunately I don't think that's a realistic option and, and that's why I, 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 I'll support this because I think this gives us some paths forward. Um, it'd be great if we can find a partners, multiple partners, we can work with everyone and find a way forward. Um, you know, I think about how the scenario worked for Hangar 11 and I recognize there wasn't a condition on Hangar 11, but in the case of Hangar 11, we did have a private developer come forward. They then came to the city and we actually uh, provided a heritage grant that is going to be provided over multiple years that was above and beyond what we normally do. And I felt that was a really creative way to to use a space like that. So maybe we'll have another partner who wants to do something similar, but in this case also include a number of the tenants. There's nothing stopping them if there's a new buyer to pr coming to the city uh, for a proposal like that, um, where we maybe look at heritage funding and, and use more than what we normally might to be able to continue to use this space because it is a really special space. So, um, you know, I think, and, and I think the main message for, for what I heard today is again, we're not asking um, the partners who operate out of that space, who lease that space, who, who use that space right now um, to do all of that work. If they happen to have folks available and, and they find some partners and they find some, some interested parties that wanna work together, great. But we're also gonna do that as, as we would uh, because this is our space and we wanna make sure that we're we're um, being as creative as possible for something like this. So I'll, I'll support this. I wanna thank Councillor Stevenson. I know it's probably not easy being in, in the ward she represents, but, uh, and I know it might not please everyone, but I think um, it's, it's a very practical approach to dealing with a really challenging issue. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I am um, supporting this motion and I, and I do recognize um, Councillor Principe's um, concern. I, I don't wanna see the museum abandoned, um, but I think this gives them the option um, to work with the city, to work with other uh, levels of government to, and, and maybe a private partnership as well, um, so that they can you know ma maintain those assets, whether it, um, and then who knows um, when it comes time to actually dispose of it, maybe they can get it for less than market value, um, which I think would be a bonus for them. Um, so I, I do think it, it puts some time constraints um, and I'm not sure why this has um, been held over, I guess, this long to allow it to, to go into to disrepair. Um, but I, I do support uh, the motion and thank Councillor Stevenson for putting it forward. Thank you, Councillor Wright. I see no one else on the list. I'll go to Councillor Stevenson to close. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks everyone for your comments. It's always nice coming at the end because so much of what I want to say has been articulated beautifully by my, my colleagues. So, you know, really want to echo uh, Councillor Paquette who put it so well that, you know, this motion does, doesn't disadvantage the museum in any way. It just provides more options. Uh, so that they can stay in that space in a, in a way that's sustainable in the long term. I think the risk of proceeding um, otherwise, you know, to take this forward with a $30 million ask in our, in our upcoming capital cycle is that it may not be successful when we look at some of the, the many other urgent priorities that we face. 
Um, and, and at that point, I think we, we risk just losing, losing it completely. So really pleased um, and hopeful that my, my colleagues will support this so that we have two years to come up with a plan. Uh, I really want to take a moment to, to appreciate administration coming forward with this, recognizing that you didn't have to. Um, I think that it was a, a great call to, to allow us to have this conversation um, and sort of express our values in doing what we can to preserve uh, this very unique use in this very unique space. So thank you for coming forward with that. Um, and, and just to, to say that I have confidence in, in the creativity of the team. I'm really hopeful that we can come up with a, with a disposition strategy that does achieve this objective in the next two years. And I'll certainly be doing my part uh, to champion this project with other, other partners in the community, other orders of government, to make sure that it is a viable option moving forward. So thanks again so much to administration for this. Uh, and again, you know, just really wanting to communicate to, to partners that this is, you know, the city city taking on this work uh, to come up with a, a strategy that allows the museum to stay in place and, and maintain that uh, asset in our community. So thank you so much. Uh, hope for your support. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. I am waiting for it to come in. I, it hasn't come in. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So our next item is 6.11, and Councillor Knack, can you take the chair, please? Happy to take the chair. Thank you. So this report was at the, uh, uh, the executive committee, and we heard from a number of speakers, part of the uh, three reports that were debated related to uh, procurement, and we did not have the chance to uh, even though we asked questions to the panel, uh, members of the public, we didn't have the chance to ask questions to the administration, uh, and thus it is here. Uh, I will move the recommendation, uh, but Mr. Chair, I also may have a subsequent after uh, 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 questions. I know Councillor Nack has a number of questions, and I have some questions as well, but uh, I'll wait for Councillor Nack to go first. Because Councillor Paquette to go first. Oh, okay, yeah. sure, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah if you, so you put the motion to receive for information on the floor, do I have a second? Yeah. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Wonderful, uh, then I'll wait to see if anyone has questions on this. Councillor Jans, you had selected it, you don't have any questions either, so it must be selected, correct? It must be selected. Thank you. I've been told by the mover that Councillor Paquette may have questions. Councillor Paquette, are you trying to click on it? There we are. Councillor Paquette. Go ahead. Okay. Councillor Paquette, can you hear me? Or oh, you're on mute still. You were saying something very insightful. I'm sorry we couldn't hear it. I actually wasn't saying anything insightful. I was, I was saying that I had this written in my notes, and yet uh, I can't see <laughs> my notes, which is really frustrating. So maybe this is going to be quite short. Um, yeah, so just a, a quick question to Mr. Corbold, and this, was, this may have already been covered, but I'm just wondering, um, I don't know how else to put this. How is this working out for you? So Mr. Corbell just left briefly. Oh, well, I guess this, and that was the shortest uh, session of questions ever. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Stevenson next. I just need, I'm going to speak very briefly on it. Thank okay, you. Okay, just to say, I don't, so oh, I do see uh, potentially questions from Councillor Tang. Um, 
yeah, I guess I wanted to ask about the social benefit procurement criteria. Do we have a target we're aiming to reach in terms of number of projects with that criteria? We don't at this point. Um, we are in early stages of implementation and including social procurement requirements in our solicitations, so we haven't yet been able to establish a target. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, is it, uh, okay, so I guess this is part of, well, potentially part of that answer as well as, you know, if, are there certain types of project we're trying to incorporate a social benefit criteria or is it just as many projects as possible? But it sounds like you're still in the early stages of. Well, we try to include them in as much as um, we can in, our, in the different opportunities that we are putting out there. There are no specific guidelines on what projects should have the social procurement component in them. But as you mentioned, we are trying to maximize use of them as, as long as it makes sense. Yeah. So as we know more and we have more projects going out with social procurement component in it, we will be in a better position to come up with that detailed list of which project should have what type of social procurement right. requirements. But that's part of the uh, expanding of the program and implementation of the next phases as we are implementing the indigenous procurement framework, that work could also inform the work we wanna do with social procurement. So we wanna be more specific on giving more guidelines to the administration and staff on what to consider when they are procuring and how to include uh, social procurement requirements in their procurements depending on what they are buying basically. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too, but you, you answer my, yeah, you answer my question. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sohi, you have questions? Yes, I do, and uh, you answered one of my questions in earlier reports about the, uh, the accountability part, right? But I do have a question around the reference that was part of attachment three into the uh, Biosocial Canada report, right? Uh, and within that, there are a number of recommendations. Uh, so the implementation of those recommendations. I want to get a better understanding how will that take place uh, and, uh, and the reporting mechanism around that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the recommendation, as it was mentioned in the report, we agree with all the recommendation coming from Biosocial Canada. And what they have suggested is, an, is, a line, is in, in an alignment with our next steps of implementation, which would be enhanced training, coming up with more thorough um, documents and guidelines for administration and staff to identify if my project is has this much dollar value and this much complexity and this much, let's say, um, type of construction work that it falls under the specific requirements of the framework and then start including them based on those um, guidelines. The recommendation also speaks to more engagement from the supplier, education and training for the supplier, and that also aligns with our plan to augment our selling to the city uh, presentations that we used to do before. And now we want to introduce, I would call it the new generation, which is going to have more information about um, how they can do business with city and then incorporate social value requirements in their um, procurements. And it also talks about establishing a multi-stakeholder sustainable procurement advisory committee and given the experience we have with the committee we established for the indigenous framework package, um, we are considering those experiences in establishing that advisory panel as well. Okay, and as part of the next report, you will update us on uh, some of these recommendations, how they're being implemented? Exactly, we will be incorporating the updates in the next annual delegation of authority report, which is coming to the council. Okay, and uh, within that will be the if, if, a contractor has committed to certain uh, uh, value or uh, certain outcomes, and then how you hold them accountable will be part of their annual report as well. I, exactly. I think for by the next year, though, thinking about the timeline, we, we should be able to demonstrate the plan yeah. of how we are going to incorporate that into the contracts and having them being accountable. But if we are going to be able to demonstrate tangible outputs, it depends on like how long the implementation is going to take place because and we need some time for contractors to build those credit background and building yeah. those performance histories with the uh, CD. So 
and you'll also report on the enforcement. Yes. Okay, got it. That's the questions I had. So I probably don't need a, a subsequent, uh, Mr. Chair, because uh, if they're going to they're committed to reporting on that, right, then we'll see how it goes next year. If, uh, I love it. If that time. Even okay. more efficient. Uh, yeah, would yeah. you be willing to move another round of questions? I, think I will okay. move the second round of questions. Thank you. Uh, do I have a seconder? Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Tang, I think. And uh, please vote. We're just waiting for one more vote. Sorry, uh, mine didn't come up. I'm a yes. Thanks, Councillor Prince Bay. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, yes, thank you, Councillor Knack. Mr. Chair, uh, and I apologize. I actually, uh, just as you called on me last, uh, I got some uh, unsettling news that turns out to be okay. So I'm sorry if I was a bit rattled because I was. Okay, so... Um, very quickly, what are our goals and targets to increase our social procurement this year? Because we're up to 40% this year, yeah? Well, as I mentioned before, uh, Councillor Packett, we haven't yet established any new goals. We just want to increase uh, inclusion of social procurement requirements in our procurements and then start connecting what is happening into, in the procurement phase to the contract obligations of the vendors. But we don't have, we haven't defined a definite target for what that number should be for next year. And I, and I would just okay. add, Councillor, uh, if it's Andre speaking, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not too worried about the fact that we haven't identified a goal at this point, given the successful change we're seeing. If we were stagnating at sort of 9%, I would be more worried about it. Um, but the fact that we have gone up to 40.6%, for example, I think is important to note, so. Okay, it's just that we've had a sustainable procurement policy since 2019 and advocating for uh, social procurement. And uh, we were, we, it was a little rough out of the gates. It sounds like it's going a lot better, but um, if we don't have goals then, um, how are we going to track and measure it in a way that actually delivers uh, meaningful and useful data to us? Yeah, and sorry, I was not making the point that we shouldn't have goals, but uh, as, as was indicated, we, we'll work on that and we will present goals to council. Um, I was just indicating because we have seen some progress, um, those lack of goals have not gotten in the way of progress based on the data that we see in the report, I would say. Right, okay. So uh, from a, an administrative perspective, if we were to have some targets what would we be looking at? I think we just don't know the answer to that question yet. We've got to do some more work on it. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't, you know, don't mean to put anyone on the spot. It's just that we've had this policy since 2019. And, and as I mentioned at first, it was a real struggle. And uh, it sounds like things are on the right track, but um, there is a little bit of cautiousness there because, uh, so I don't want to slip back into where um, it sort of fell into uh, secondary priority. And what I'm hearing, though, is that that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I don't believe that's the case. And, you know, I, I, I would love to be ambitious and say 100% should be our goal. But as anything achieving 100% is always difficult, you know. So I, I think I'd just like to spend a bit more time getting a very, um, you know, accurate, accurate and attainable and... Um, want to meet them you know once we set a goal we want to meet those expectations we want to make sure it's doable yeah and what i'm really interested though is in the data that we how we collect that data how we um find out like okay so um you know x demographic x contracts x impact and tracking that over time um do we have a system for that so that we can actually like follow a trajectory of uh, how our procurement is going, not just on our side, but the impact it's having in the community. Yeah, so we are working on uh, with um, some consultants on data gathering and data analysis pieces to build that framework on how sh we should be collecting data and um, reporting on 
how this work is progressing. One of the things that we are working on in that area is that uh, the information we need is very much dependent on the input from the vendors community and the ask from some of the consultants that do the data analysis is get the information from um, those consultants directly on how vendors are um, doing their social procurement aspects and there are some um, confidentiality pieces that needed to be sorted out, FOIP requirements needs to be addressed. So there are some details that needs to be sorted out before we give um, or have the contracts information to be transferred to a third party for data analysis. Um, but we have plans for that, um, just to make sure that the data we are gathering is being analyzed and reported properly. That is key for the success of um, yeah. the work we want to do. No, just I'm sorry to interrupt. I've got, I've got time for one more question. That is that um, uh, when I I made a motion once on um, on consulting, it took over a year and a half for that data to be compiled. Whatever solutions we're looking at for data, can we find one that doesn't take a year and a half to compile data that we That's already have time. that shouldn't be about That's going through time. spreadsheets? Thank you. You can answer that question. Yeah, okay, I think you get the point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, I would like to circle back the Mayor So he mentioned that accountability piece. So there are two questions here. The first question for the procurement process, and if you look at the framework for the process, is this framework uh, include all this, how we hold the contractors accountable pieces and then have very um, specific uh, approach and in, included in the process or not? Or is it separate the process and after the, all the agreements signed? Yeah, the framework doesn't get into the details of how we should keep the vendors accountable towards uh, the social procurement obligations. It is. It has some guidelines on connecting those um, pieces together, but implementation of how we are we are going to hold them accountable is separate from the framework. It is going part of the implementation work that the administration has already started. So even from implementation perspective, and then given the factor of what we heard from auditor a city auditor and also what we heard from some of our citizens um, regarding this accountability piece. Um, do we need actually firm, firmly build something and in the place instead of just to say this is a part of implementation? And be, yeah, I understand for the implementation uh, for ending contract agreements management uh, we should have that accountability piece. Uh, what I'm saying here uh, is lack of specific uh, methodology or mechanism or whatever the words we can use and in the process. So that's why I would like to circle back uh, Mayor so his question, do we need the subsequent motion for that or we just wait for like, one year later, they come back, and because the, if we wait for the report to come back, but the rep for the reporting, we need to have the requirements set up first, and for us to report it against the requirements. If we don't have that requirements set in, in front, and how we can report it, uh, like constantly come back to ensure that accountability piece. Yeah, what I can comment on that is um, the city procures, as you know, many different goods and services in different ways and types. So depending on what we buy, we may have different recommendations for social procurement content. Like what we can include in a procurement of a complicated or a complex construction project would be different from um, a, a standard um, services or a consultancy work. So we need to have that flexibility to be able to offer what measurements and what um, sort of contractual obligations we're going to introduce based on what we're going to ask. And that 
takes a bit of time for the administration to finalize and start including those requirements in the contracts. So in Flatsy's case, can we provide that uh, the direction and it was a with a motion and then to start working on, or you can just start working on and from administration without this direction? We are working on it, so we don't require further direction. Okay. So, and we have a specific timeline, we can see that. Yeah, you'll see, we'll report back next year with the annual report on the progress that we've made. And if that time, if, at that time, if our progress isn't sufficient and you'd like to offer more guidance, we can do so then. Uh, I have to. I have to think. I have so to. Just follow up. Sorry, microphone there. Sorry, just to follow up. Like as we implement the by, um, I think they're called the by the social. Sorry, the by local, by social. I'm getting my words mixed up. Sorry. As we look at the by social recommendations and work on those, that's where we'll be able to get from that the some more detailed targets and metrics as we do that work. But all of that is currently planned for this year, and we'll report it back as part of next year's uh, annual report. Is that is that fair to say uh, this response will uh, also address um, something and in the auditor's report as well? I'm just a little unclear at which auditor's report you're talking about. Uh, our city's so, so. auditor's report. And then... So Sorry, I'm going to just jump in. And I know there's nobody else on the board, but just to, to be clear, if you have more questions, we should do another round of questions. I just want to. So okay, I have one more question. And That's for perfectly send, fine. Send, so uh, send me. You, you are allowed to move yeah. another round of questions if you like. It doesn't have to come. So would you be willing to move another round of questions? Yeah, I move. Perfect. I just Thank want a very quick seconder? question. Seconder. Second. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. I'm a no. Thank you. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, another round. Uh, uh, Councilor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, very quick question. And, is it, and because the report attachment one, one right now is a semi annual report, so is that possible to get that report back in the semi annual purpose? Or, or we have to wait for one year? And then because I, I do expect. Uh, the uh, report and refract uh, two things. One is a uh, recommendation from uh, auditor's report, and another one is a specific measures and uh, to look at accountability piece. I think legal uh, already commented on this. Um, I think there was a change made on this requirement to change it from semi-annually to annually to reduce the administration um, foreclosed in reducing the reports. So um, I think our recommendation is to continue with the annually as per the change that was recently made. Okay, so this report uh, is recommending the change annual to the annually. So you're cur currently, the, bi the bylaw requires us to report annually. And so we wouldn't, we, c we wouldn't bring forward more frequent reports without direction, but we, we, if you're looking for information or an update, that is something that I could provide by memo at certain points in time when there's something to report, but I would not suggest changing the mm -hmm. bylaw to move away from annual to something different. Uh, that's fair. And specifically, and info the bylaw is annually, and why this attachment is a semi-annual report. It's uh, so, Kim Kellis Howell from Legal. I suspect what happened is it used to be semi-annually and then we moved to annually, so perhaps the template hadn't been changed. I'm not sure, but I think that that's probably likely. Okay, so that that's ends my question. I will follow off, uh, offline and then maybe like uh, like your uh, I like your suggestion and some updates could provide it by memo. Thank you. Okay, Brett. good. Thank yep. you. Uh, I see nobody else on the board for questions, so we'll go to speaking. And Councillor Stevenson, you can start. 
you know, I just really want to basically just say how, how important I think this work is and just want to acknowledge, again, it was noted before, you know, from one year going from 9.5% up to 40.6% is really worth noting. So thank you so much for that work. Excited to see it continue um, and, and just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Councillor Paquette to speak to it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I do have some concerns. Essentially, we're working backwards to measure our success on a policy that we passed in 2019. Uh, yes, we've had successes, 9% to 40% competitive procurement and 69% local. We're doing great on local. But we didn't build in evaluation from the beginning, and that's a problem. I'm not seeing a lot of data in this report, frankly, and that's because we don't have a clear methodology for reporting our successes and identifying where we need to focus improvements. And uh, I mean, I don't want to tell administration how to do their jobs at all or get my nose into operations, but I'd love to be able to champion our successes, to turn back to Edmontonians and back to Edmontonians and say, yes, we're committed to contracts that provide community benefits, living wages, training and skill development and the other social value criteria We've told Edmontonians these are our priorities. We should have the data to back up our work, but we don't. So um, I will vote to uh, receive this information, but I do feel that it is very thin information. And I am hoping that the next time we get an update, uh, it will be far more robust. Um, and again, uh, you know, the last thing I want to do is sound critical. Um, so let me put it this way. I think that data is critical, especially on this file, in order to measure how we are doing and to be able to report back to Edmontonians on it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, don't seeing anyone else. Mayor Sohi to close. Any nope. Ready to vote. Thank you. Please vote. Chance in favor. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried, and I will return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Mack. Uh, so, Madam Clerk, we're going to bylaws. Yes, please, and just a friendly reminder that we do need a decision on seven one today. That's the one we're going into. 7 1, bylaw 20117, single use item bylaw. This was exempted by Councillor Rutherford. I don't and need a presentation either, Mr. Don't Chair. need a presentation? Okay. So we are going to directly go into questions. Just give them a second to settle down in the chairs. Okay, they're all settled in, Councillor Rutherford. Go on, go on, let's go. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, just, I guess my overall question is around exemptions in the bylaw and specifically the exemptions of charities. Uh, it's a pretty umbrella term in terms of, uh, you know, the, the federal definition of charities is educational, religious, the advancement, the advancement of religion, alleviation of poverty, very specific things, but very broad at the same time. So I'm worried that this blanket exemption is gonna have a lot of, not is gonna really dilute the purpose of this bylaw. Yes, thanks for the question, Councillor. So I'll jump in and I might even have uh, our, our city solicitor jump in as well. Um, we looked quite extensively at how to capture some of the social serving agencies that we heard very loud and clear from Council. We wanted to make sure we weren't um, disadvantaging in the work that they do for the city. Um, and in assessing how to include that in the bylaw, 
um, we tried to strike a balance between, as you say, how all-encompassing the definition is, um, but where we can also make significant progress on the on the real ambitions of City Council to see fewer of these materials in circulation. Um, so we've worked with, with our partners in law to identify how to limit that scope as much as possible, but the other thing that we have done um, actually pretty extensively even since the last time that this was at Utility Committee is get out and engage on all of the situations where we can limit the impact of those exemptions, really be accelerating any transition to voluntary compliance and making sure that the scope of the federal regulations which you've mentioned are having um, an impact in the way that they're meant to. So as you know, um, we will see certain materials just fail to be available on the market um, yeah. in a certain time frame and so part of what we see the exemptions doing is make sure that rather having rather than having some of those materials that are banned go straight to landfill they may be used once by a social serving agency before they're ending up in the landfill yeah and i get that i think that we're, we keep saying social serving ag agencies and i think that what i i'm worried about is that some organizations that are classified as charities are not social serving. They're for the public benefit and public good as per the definition, but they're not social serving agencies. And on the flip side, they're social serving agencies that are not registered charities. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe Christine, I'll have you jump in and talk about where we landed with the, with yeah. the definition. Thanks so much, Jody. Um, Christina Hodgson from Law Branch, not the city solicitor. Just wanted to <laughs> <laughs> point that one out. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, we did look into this very closely um, because obviously, for example, churches that have uh, church groups but also have um, community halls where they host events. Um, those community halls are not actually under the charitable organization side of things. We spoke very closely mm -hmm. with our business license counterparts to determine where um, that limitation ended, essentially. So we, we didn't want to broaden it all the way to nonprofits, because nonprofits is even broader. It is, yeah. But we did want to make sure that it was at least a registered charity, either federally or provincially, to at least limit it a little bit more. Um, but not limit it so much that we've missed out on quite a, a few agencies. Um, and with the federal regulations that are coming in, it doesn't appear that they will actually have exemptions for charities. Um, so we do think that these exemptions may actually disappear after about two years. But the, the federal thing is specific to plastics, right? Single-use plastics, whereas ours is single-use items. Correct. So this bylaw would still have exemptions that would not be integrated with that federal correct. legislation, correct? Yes, yeah. and then in, in that case, if those exemptions are not keeping up with our purposes, we can always go back in and amend them. Okay. The process to amend in that way will be rather difficult because it is a charter bylaw, which means yeah. we'd have to go through that process. The process to amend to align with the federal requirements, however, would be much simpler. Um, so it would be a two-part process if we were to go about that route. Okay, and I do see that there's sort of the, the city manager powers in which there's the ability to exempt any business or event organizer, et cetera. That again seems like a really big blanket of, of discretion on who, who ends up being exempt. Uh, can you speak to that, Mr. Corbold, in the bylaw or, or legal? whomever. I can go. <laughs> um, yeah, and a lot of that we did really discuss things like COVID and those sorts of pandemic type situations that may pop up. Well, and I see that those exemptions I had no issue with, but okay. down I'm talking about, and I, I'm out of time. I'll come back for a second round. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to ask a question about the actual use of reusable bags. Uh, this is something that actually um, Councillor Rutherford brought up before and kind of uh, brought to my attention. Do we have studies that show uh, that the banning of single-use items actually has the beneficial impact on the environment that we're looking for? As an example that Councillor Rutherford had pointed out before is that the reusable bags are used a certain amount of times and... Yeah, so does it have the, maybe it's not, they're not used as often as we, or as long as we would expect someone to. So are there studies that show a benefit to the environment when um, single-use items are banned? 
Sure, counselor, thanks for the question. Um, so we've talked a little bit in the past, I think, about life cycle assessment, and there's definitely um, an element of sort of all of the local environmental and energy factors that go into production and consumption that impact that. So we don't have an Edmonton specific study. I think part of what we know, and there is evidence, I would have to follow up if you wanted some specific references, um, that it does take a pretty seismic shift to get folks using their reusables to the extent that we require them to um, in order to get the benefits of that. Um, so certainly when reusables are used incidentally, maybe you know a half dozen times as opposed to on a fulsome regular basis, they may not be having that life cycle environmental benefit. But for us, that's why we've really looked to um, cases where we've been making a clear cut community transformation to show that once those reusables are using, are being used on a much higher rate, that they are having that environmental benefit. Okay, but we don't have any studies that actually show that. Uh, Councillor uh, Principe, Ms. McCabe here. The energy transition strategy um, has a number of actions in it that show that our circular economy are really important for reducing, um, for meeting our goals. And this is uh, one of the actions from the energy transition strategy is to really look at reducing single-use plastic uh, and single-use um, items. Some of the information that I have on this is that, um, sorry, I'm just pulling up some of the studies. 450 million single-use items are thrown out in the garbage every year in Edmonton with about 1.2 million items every day. Uh, and plastic pollution and climate change we know are uh, fundamentally linked. Uh, we've got um, Center for the International Environment Law, Yale Climate Collections, um, plastic and health, the hidden costs of a plastic planet are some of the um, references that I have uh, in front of me right now that helped um, uh, inform uh, this recommendation, this bylaw before you. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. McCabe. And, and I understand that, uh, but again, it's just comparing the two. If you're going to use 12 single-use bags compared to... Um, one reusable bag like if you're actually comparing the two if you use one reusable bag six times that would be equivalent to maybe 12 uh, single use bags which one would be uh, less impactful on the environment I was just wondering if there was a study like that so counselor again it does depend on um, a number of factors that vary from geography to geography, but you could say that maybe 50 uses of a, of a reusable bag is going to offset the environmental impact of those single-use items. And so again, that's why in addition to looking to reduce the single-use items, we've got a recommended minimum fee on the reusable bags so that um, those reusables are actually being used as intended rather than just creating a stock of of materials that are hard to create, but also very useful once they exist. Okay, and sorry, did you say 50, five, zero times use? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principal. Councillor Rice. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Chair. The first question in terms of safety concerns of reusable and clean equipment I just use term from the report. Uh, how to address this? Thank you, Councillor. So we've had quite a few conversations with Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services, and ultimately it would be um, those agencies that are providing guidance on what it means to um, handle uh, things that are used to consume food and beverage safely. Um, for us, the bylaw would indicate that a that a a business that's required to comply would have to have a policy on how to accept those reusables or to use reusables in their operations. And then ultimately it's Alberta Health Services that actually helps to outline the specific elements of what it means to be safe. So a business's policy might say, you know, we give our employees discretion to re refuse a cup that is clearly soiled, that is, um, you know, damaged, that, um, 
whatever the case may be, is for some reason compromising the ability to safely handle it. Um, but it would be Alberta Health Services who would be working with us to make sure that the guidance on, on safe handling practices are clearly outlined. It's not an area of expertise we're looking to develop. Okay, uh, so I understand that from uh, guidance and the policy perspective is more about uh, Alberta Health Services, and but from implementation perspective, how to, how do we address that uh, implementation enforcement process? Yeah, and that's where, again, we've been working closely with Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services to make sure that they can provide information to support all of the technical rollout that we will be providing to businesses who are required to comply um, with the bylaw. So I, I've... Uh, I get it, but I just the fund and that is the lack of information for the implementation for the enforcement from city's perspective. Um, I didn't say uh, that in the report. Um, so because right now, what's the information I heard from uh, here and it's just what we're working with AHS to develop that guidance and policies, business policies. I think, I think, um, Later on, when this bylaw become effect, and like year, July 1st, 2013, uh, we should have the implementation and enforcement specific and in place, right? Yeah, and I'll do my best to paraphrase from Alberta Health Services. What we understand from them is that all of that information about safe handling practices already exists. Um, so it's out there and it's available for those who are handling food and who are using reusables um, either now or maybe using them in the future. What they hope to do and what we um, aim to be partners with them in is make that information just that much more readily accessible on a specific um, um. element related to the bylaw. Okay, uh, so uh, in like federal government to enact regulation and will be by end of June 2022, is that already happened or not yet? So they have drafted the regulations, they've presented them online. Um, they have not yet passed those regulations. We have an idea what they will look like. Okay. Um, but they do intend to pass it in kind of a staggered manner. So it will come into effect later than ours, but also in a staggered manner as well. So first they're going to focus on the production and manufacturing, and then they're going to focus on the businesses providing these things to customers. So it will take quite a while from the time our bylaw is passed and takes effect to the time that the federal regulations take effect on our businesses within the city. Uh, what is the implementation budget and for this bylaw? And I know we still have one year to go, and then so specific for implementation, this, the budget will come, will come to the 2023-26 budget deliberation for discussion, or what is time now for that budget to be identified to implement this bylaw? So this bylaw is coming from the waste utility, and so it's already built into our utility budget. So it won't come forward as part of the regular budget process. It will be within the utility. Uh, but with the additional, uh, with the utility budget. Correct. So utility budget will come to the budget deliberation for discussion. Correct. So that will including this piece and, and in that budget. And th this piece has already been anticipated. This work has been anticipated in the current budget that exists. Okay. And as we move forward for a rate filing, this will again be considered within that rate filing budget. Okay, do you have the estimated number? Not with me, no. So we have about $400,000 that we allocate on a yearly basis towards a number of waste reduction initiatives. Um, and with something like this as an example, it ebbs and flows based on, I think some of the points you've pointed out, um, an additional amount of, of money that's required for um, education awareness, rollout, support planning. Um, so it is taking up a significant amount of that budget over the next year and a half. Um, and then it will become a, a smaller part of that overall sort of waste reduction Production allocation that we have within the approved waste utility budget. Okay, thank, thank you. you. My time is out. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, just back to the exemption issue, um, I guess I was a little bit surprised because at the last utility committee, I don't recall exemption being, uh, you know, a definitive thing. And I think, so if you can just help me verify, the direction was to broad, more broadly work with you know, the social serving agencies to, to find a solution. And at this point, uh, the best way forward is to have this exemption as part of this bylaw. Is that, is my understanding of that proce thought process clear? 
Yeah, I think that's roughly clear. Uh, we've had pretty extensive conversations with a number of, I think back to Councilor Ruthers, Rutherford's point, the, the um, charities that we believe are in scope for the concerns that Council raised for us the last time this was discussed. Um, and unfortunately, there's no way to create one master list that would include only those um, you know, essentially social serving yeah. agencies, but we have heard about some pretty significant limitations that they feel in terms of the overall set of priorities that they're working to advance um, and some of the challenges that would come with um, being tied to the hard and fast letter of the of the bylaw as it's drafted. Um, one in particular, for instance, is the um, food accessories on demand requirement. Um, we've just heard about the really high volume of food service that's uh, operated out of some of these agencies and that for them, um, there are uh, speed and also just uh, sort of orderliness issues that yeah. they had sig significant concerns about. Yeah. So that's where we've landed. I, I think it was Meals on Wheels who spoke at the committee and uh, uh, in recent volunteer shift, I, I noted how just the volume of, of plastics that, the, that, that they were using. I wondered about that transition period. Um, and so with this, uh, you still feel that between now and you know when the federal policy comes into place, it's enough time to and you will have a plan in place to build that help build capacity to help the organizations build that capacity to, to transition. Yeah, it's something that we pay attention to a lot right now, just making sure that we're ready for the transition, um, and also that we're being, uh, you know, as proactive and hands-on as possible at seeking voluntary compliance wherever we yeah. aren't um, regulating yet. And, and I guess just one final question to to law then. Because um, I think at first I was like, well, if, if federal policy is coming anyways, why are we putting in this in exemption to begin with? In particular, you mentioned that there's to backtrack or to align with the federal policy as it's additional steps. Um, so I guess I just want to verify too that this is the, having it in now is still the easiest path forward. Is that right? Yes, um, I do want to actually just make a correction. I guess the regulations, the federal ones, just passed June 22nd, so very new. It was a little late on that. Um, but yes, this is the easiest way to give us time to work okay. with these groups. Um, the ability for us to make these changes based on the federal changes um, is something that's actually rather easy for us to do okay. administratively. It's more the ones where if we do need to make material changes that don't align with federal changes, those ones will, t will take more time yeah. and take more effort. Um, but we think getting this bylaw out to really hit 80%, like really the large large issues, is a really good step forward for right now. Yeah. Um, and some of those, once we work some capacity in, well, maybe it's worth the wait. Yeah. There are two things that I wanted to really quickly point out. One is that we've gone material agnostic with our bylaw, which is different than the federal regulations. So whereas they're looking to reduce plastic, we just want to reduce single-use items in general. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is that we're already starting to hear about significant supply chain issues with regards to the federal regulations. So I think one of the benefits that we hear is that by um, having this conversation in Edmonton early and having businesses really become aware and start to look at um, uh, alternative solutions early, they're feeling better prepared to be able to comply with the federal regulations as they start to take effect. Great. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I, I think I'm, I'm satisfied with those pretty thorough answers. And obviously you've really spent your time, uh, you know, talking to, to various community groups. Um, because I do recall during the public speaking, you know, there's one very particular situation that was, you know, particularly challenging for people to make that transition. Um, and so, you know, the more we can, I guess, hone in on the specifics of the people's situation, I think the better. Um, but anyways, appreciate the work on this and uh, looking forward to passing the first reading. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Can you move the second round? Uh, yes, second round, please. Need a second. Second, second by Councillor uh, Neck, right? Okay. Uh, please vote for the second round. I am logged, uh, I'm being timed out. timed out, I'm timed out, I'm yes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Now I have to close this to see the vote. Here it goes, passed. Thank you. And Councillor Rutherford. Sorry, just going to the line of questioning I ran out of time for. So in section 34, I was specifically talking about C and D. 
So I know like A and B make absolute sense and even, you know, D3 makes sense from that public health perspective. Um, I guess, can, can you speak, can administration speak to, you know, the rationale for these exemptions and specifically C and D? Absolutely. So C, we're starting off with a list. We, we intend that list to get smaller. Um, so we don't intend really to expand that list to anyone new. We're trying to work with those businesses such as stadiums, uh, movie theaters, things that are very large like that, that may have either health and safety um, or security requirements. Work with them, move them off the list and the exemption there. Um, with D, this one, we take your point where you said that there are organizations that are just nonprofits. They are not registered as charitable organizations, but they do the good work that, non that charitable organizations do. We wanted a little bit of flexibility to that point to ensure that if there is a group, maybe it is a group that serves housing and homelessness individuals, maybe it's a group that serves older folks who need help, um, that they're not absolutely explicitly not allowed under the bylaw to have an exemption. Um, so it's very specific to those sorts of situations. But I'll let Mr. Corbett. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Councillor, I'd just generally say with, with those kinds of exemptions with city manager, they're very, they're not taken lightly. They're really for the unforeseen circumstance that gives us an opportunity to make an amendment. Um, because this it, is a charter bylaw, so it's yeah, so challenging. Sort of so it kind of gives you that loophole. Yeah, so it gives us an opportunity. And, and again, they're not, I don't use them lightly, but sometimes every once in a while we have a, a problem. And the only way of solving it is to either go to council and change the bylaw or get a city manager amendment. And that allows us the flexibility of getting through those issues. It would not be used for sort of a common occurrence. But but the intent would be to really consider those nonprofits that are social serving. Absolutely. In that exemption, because yeah. so that there isn't an inequity yeah. between the charities and yeah. the nonprofits that are social serving. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I just think of, uh, you know, Pope's visits with unforeseen things that yeah. are going on, right? That yeah. would be an opportunity that I could foresee yeah. doing a short-term exemption using that authority. No, That's what it's I'm okay. Um, I think I can move first reading. Second. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. And I, I'm... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just to, to introduce that, thank you for those com comprehensive answers that helps uh, provide comfort for me and, and happy to to see this going forward and down the hearing process it needs to go. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, I'll just speak to it. It's already moved. To speak to it. So that concludes the questions on the uh, the bylaw. And just where, where did I lost connection? Okay, uh, we'll go to speaking. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And, you know, we've got some more readings of this bylaw coming up in the future, so I'll be quick. Uh, look, uh, we have to start somewhere. Uh, we've got an issue, uh, and there's actually there's a lot of issues. What this bylaw will do once it's fully passed is it'll cut down on junk, on the litter, on the filthy boulevards and roadsides uh, to some extent, which will be welcome. Um, and one thing we know is that recycling, while somewhat effective, is not everything it's cracked up to be. We still need it. We'll still engage in it. But there is a limited amount of times plastic can be recycled. And there are also limited amounts of plastic that can be recycled for a first time. So we tend to uh, have been sold sort of this single-use disposable way of living and we're finding out quite rapidly that it is not sustainable we've got uh microplastic contamination becoming widespread and affecting ecosystems and uh you know while this problem seems overwhelming it's just like eating an elephant i don't recommend you eat an elephant but if you do start with one bite and uh that's sort of what we're doing here um and uh, for for the uh, for the nerds in the house, until we have Star Trek replicators, it doesn't hurt to be pragmatic. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rutherford, you already spoken to this, right? So, or you and you introduced the item. You want to speak to this? 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, I would, if that's yeah, okay, just yeah, for a couple yeah, minutes. Absolutely. Uh, this is really important progress that we're making in waste reduction. I think what I realized in reading the, the by, bylaw in its totality is just the nuance and complexity that at face value doesn't seem to be there. So I wanna just give extreme kudos to administration for working through all of those nuance and con and complexity around individuals that, you know, even the bendable straws, right? That they need those because of disability. Uh, we have, you know, various different organizations with different needs. So I think that you have really taken a thoughtful approach in a way that progresses us where we want to be as a city, but not in a way that doesn't bring people along with us. So I'm, I'm really impressed with, with the drafting of this bylaw and the thought and the, the care that went into it. So. Uh, thank you very much for that, and I hope that my colleagues will support. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. Am I yes? Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. I am uh, some reason not getting my... Yeah. Me too. <clears throat> I'm yes. Thank you. Thank you. Me too as well. Yes. Thank you so much. And friendly reminder, eScribe goes to sleep after nine hours, so you might need to refresh. I, that's what I did again. Maybe I have to do it again to wake her up. Uh, his. Him. 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 Sorry. Sorry. My, my apologies. And sincere apologies. Sincere. Sincere apologies. <laughs> sincere apologies. To wake up. We have them. all the votes. Sorry. Screwed up. I am so sorry. Please vote. Oh, sorry, display the vote. That is carried. I'm going to log in again to eScribe. Okay, there we go. Okay, 7.12, right? This was exempted by Councillor Jans. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I you believe need, there. You need a, any. I believe there's a motion to refer uh, forthcoming from one of my colleagues to committee for. I have no idea. This is 7.12? 7 7 yeah. Is yeah. there a motion to refer? I refer to where? I, I think there was a feeling of... Uh, you have questions to administration? I, I do, but I thought that with agenda management, there were some other things that we needed to get done today. We have, okay. We have another day, so... And today, tonight, okay, yeah. well, if, yep, if it's the will of the committee then. Um, okay, so 7.12, apologies while I reset my mental e-scribe here. Um, yeah, I'm, I, the one piece that jogged for me is the 10-day the delay versus the Thursday delay for report readiness. And um, I'm wondering what feedback we've gotten in the past from either members of the public or media or others about being able to engage and respond with uh, council items. Or has it always been 10 days or is this a new? Am I on the right item? Yeah. <laughs> is this a joke? Yeah. Okay, Sounds well, I, so, so I recall, if I, if I may, um, I recall back when I was on the school board, we used to have a certain amount of days and then they wanted to reduce when those reports would be available and it was very controversial. We had significant blowback from parents, community, et cetera, saying we want more time to be able to look at something and respond to it and not, not have to wait over the weekend to get answers, et cetera. So seeing the 10 days, I've always thought is kind of a best practice. A report comes out, communities can engage, neighborhoods can meet, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, then we have the debate here at, at council. Uh, seeing a reduction, what, what I would, if I'm understanding it correctly, the, a reduction of the Thursday to maybe a Tuesday, um, that would that would cut down on potential time for public engagement. So, 
I don't I don't know about my colleagues, but when I see something forthcoming, I try and you know put it in my newsletter, consult ahead of time. So I'm just wondering, like, has this always been the case? Is this a change? No, it ha it hasn't always been the change. Um, it used to be always on the Thursday before the. Uh, before the meeting. Okay. Um, it was very intentionally on Thursdays because we used to not have meetings there in consultation with administration. And I'm going back like 15 years. Um, it was the best time to have uh, agendas released because council typically wasn't in meetings at that time. There was a pilot uh, created, and I want to say in 2018, but I don't have the date off the top of my head, where we implemented a pilot to see how it would, to see what it would be like if we could release agendas 10 days in advance. We went through that for, I believe, two, two and a half years, um, getting feedback not only from administration, but from practical application of releasing agendas with, on average, just a third of the information has been a real challenge, which is why I've been advocating to bring it back in line with the original proposal, which was the practice was to release it on the Thursdays beforehand. So I believe at the provincial government, you're not allowed like walk on reports to cabinet and I don't know, I've never been in cabinet, but I've heard that if you don't have your report, then it just gets automatically bumped to the next meeting. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the, the case or not, but is it possible to have, because I, I personally really find the 10 days valuable, especially as a new counselor and that, that one jogged for me. So I don't know whether it merits a refer back just on that or maybe a change. The second area I just wanted to ask about was, um, so there's <laughs> what's written, what we've been doing, and then what's proposed. And this is around the um, inquiries. So can any councillor make an inquiry at any committee meeting or can you make a notice of motion at any meeting? And I guess I'm wondering what's written, <laughs> what are we, what happened? Because we've been kind of generous with each other in, 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 since, since swearing in. And then what's proposed here? Can I just get sort of clarification on yep. the change? So really simple, they're not the same things at okay. all. So an inquiry as defined in the bylaw is information that's readily available and you need to be actually, the bylaw says you actually have to be a member of that body in order to make an inquiry. The notice provision that is required, the notice for giving an inquiry is now two business days to both the chair and the clerk. That Whether that's your practice, that is just what was approved at the last council meeting. So that's an inquiry. What's being recommended in the bylaw is that, that the provisions around inquiries are then the same as notices of motion because notices of motion is giving notice that you intend to make a motion at a committee or council that you are a member of. That is a different requirement and we found that having two different procedures um, was providing some opportunities for confusion. So the recommendation was to align those and so what's recommended in the bylaw is you need to be a member of the body for both an inquiry as well as a notice of motion. Okay, um, so if I'm paraphrasing, the the proposed change would mean that if I am not a member of the committee, I am not able to make a motion at the committee, I'm not able to make an inquiry in the committee. You're that... already not able to make a motion. I'm recommending that you can't make an inquiry or you can't make a notice of motion because you're not a member of that committee and therefore privileges should not apply. What w okay, um, with 10 seconds left, what would be the... I guess the proposal for that change, why don't we want more councillors to have more flexibility to make more inquiries and motions more often? The proposal is what's in the bylaw, which is what I'm recommending, which is that membership ha comes with certain privileges and if you're not a member of that body, you don't have those privileges. Because the mandates of those committees are set within the bylaws and what we're starting to see is um, some extra flexibility, which I do think is perhaps causing some agenda management challenges. So the task that I was set with was to come up with some options that would perhaps help with the process, yeah. and that's what I'm recommending. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Councillor Rutherford? Hi. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I would like to put a motion on the floor that bylaw 20226 be amended by deleting um, the amendments in section 6 to 17. Need a seconder. Seconded. And then I'll introduce, yeah. Can I introduce now, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go ahead. So and I was planning to just do a straight refer back because I think there's just too many items in this bylaw change that 
I think there are, from hearing from my colleagues, we have concerns about. However, some of the amendments that are in the current bylaw are to align us with provincial legislation and regulation. So my intent is to take off the ones that are more driven by council, but keep the ones that are legislative in nature in the bylaw so that we can vote on that today and be in an alignment with the bylaw, be in an alignment with Alberta legislation and the MGA, while also then allowing us time to more comprehensively discuss those other changes. So there, there would be a subsequent after the, well, we would vote on this amendment. We could then move the three readings and then uh, ideally there would be a subsequent to refer back and discuss some of those other changes uh, in this, but I have to, it can't all be done in one. Um, so it is a bit nuanced, but that's why I'm putting this on the floor because I'm trying to think about for the sake of time, is this a decision that has to be made today? Are there other decisions in our agenda that need to be made today? But let's look at the speaker's list. We have lots of questions about it. So I'm just trying to, to make sure we're still in line with legislation, but give ourselves the appropriate time to really dig into some of these questions like Councillor Jans brought up. There's what's written, there's what we're doing, and then there's what we could be doing. And I think that we need to dig into that a bit more. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Knack. Actually, I think I probably won't have questions based on that at this stage. Okay. I think I'm good. Go ahead to the next one. Councillor Wright. Thank you. So to the mover, I'm just. No. So you want to delete all of the mo all of the bylaw six to seventeen? No. So I read it in a little bit differently, which was to delete the amendments from sections six to seventeen, unless the city clerk would like to clarify if this is actually correct. Okay. So I'm going to go back and look at the red line version then. Okay. <laughs> So just, just for clarity, Bill 21 um, has had some impacts on the Municipal Government Act. So what we did is we, incur we incorporated the Bill 21 changes as well as the other changes that were discussed at Council Services Committee into one bylaw. The amendment that I, or the motion that I have provided here, and we can just clarify what it actually means, is to amend the bylaw by removing everything that's not related to section or to Bill 21. So that if you look at the red line version, Councillor Wright, everything from section six to 17, if this motion passes, would be removed. And then council would be asked to vote on the amended bylaw. And it's very simple to see what the differences are because it's basically everything after five would be deleted. If that receives three readings, then it is entirely possible there would be another motion to come forward where we would then take this information and go back to another committee meeting for further discussion. It's just we would really appreciate the bylaw being updated so that your practices are consistent with the Municipal Government Act. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Okay. Councillor Neck, are you back on? or no, okay. Councillor Salvador? Uh, yes. Um, and Mr. Mayor, can I ask uh, general questions as well? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so I guess, yeah, thinking about uh, the changes that would be required under legislation due to Bill 21 uh, versus the, I guess, additional changes, is there any urgency associated with those additional changes? No, this actually came out of a council services committee meeting yeah. that I feel like was only last week. Okay. Um, and then another question about the 10 days versus Thursday before. Um, recognizing that there's been, yeah, as, as you alluded to, sort of, you know, a portion of those are actually making it onto the agenda at that 10 day mark. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, like, is that, is that due to sort of administrative burden driven by council? I'm just trying to get to the root of that. Yeah, uh, so the, the root of it is, is you work on a two week cycle. And so today, if we were having council in two weeks, the team sitting on either side of me would actually be working on a council agenda for two weeks, but they haven't actually finished the council meeting that they're in. So that's an interesting conundrum. In addition to that, what feeds into that is actually the committee meetings, which are the following week, which are the feeders into the council meetings, but those haven't happened yet. So at the start of every council meeting, when you see all of the addendum that's added, and I, I think last week, at the last council meeting, we had 25 additional reports to add and Richard's nodding, so I think I'm close. It's because those items, we didn't know what committee was going to do. So I think part of the reason is one, it's 
it's very inefficient. And the second thing is agenda review committee is in a very difficult position because they're having to guess what's going to come up from committee to council. So basically, there's a reason that right. we kept with it for so many years to have agendas come out the Thursday before the meeting. But again, it's the will of council and we'll make whatever whatever process you want us to follow, we're happy to follow. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, I really appreciate the additional background and explanation there. Um, I do share some of those concerns just around the tight window and, and what that means for, well, what it means for good governance, being able to um, not just read the reports, but really really absorb that information, um, do due diligence and speak with appropriate people prior to, uh, to getting together as a group. Um, I guess a follow up to that, would the reporting cycle affect that at all? Like the actual due dates of reports or it's simply based on the two week rotation? It's the two, it yeah. is truly the two week okay. rotation and, and it, um, I mean, you speak to late reports. I'm the biggest culprit of late reports. I walked on a late report today that because I was directed by committee through a discussion, not through a motion last week. Yeah. But the biggest driver of what comes up, yeah. most reports go through committee. They don't come directly to council. But those <sighs> meetings just happened last week, but yep. the agenda for this meeting was released two weeks ago. Yep. So what's happening is the team's releasing agendas to the public and they think that there's 10 items on the agenda. And then you actually come to the meeting and it's a, it's a different reality and so, yep. Again, it was just a suggestion that I was, I think we should go back to it, but again, it's 100% council's decision. For sure, okay. Well, that answers my questions. Um, thank you for that. Councillor Rice. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is very quick. Uh, in report uh, page four, so I do appreciate there are four uh, suggestions listed here. So my question is, to suggest number two, so this training is already happened, or this training is planned will be ha will be happened. So I held three council orientation sessions directly related to the council meeting processes, as well as Robert's rules of order. Uh, the first session that you had way back when you were first elected was actually we had our registered parliamentarian come in for a half a day and walk you through the general principles around having good meeting practices, as well as I've offered numerous training sessions that I believe most councillors here were there, as well as we regularly work with your offices. Uh, again, I'm happy to host more sessions if you think that that would be of value. Um, thank you for that. Uh, is that possible to uh, resend the training material and to us and because that's back to the, a little bit earlier time? I'd be happy to resend the training materials 100%. Thank, thank you. Um, next question is about number four. Uh, speak to my uh, experience and due to the meeting in the morning and meeting in the afternoon and the evening. I found, uh, I found the lunch learning sometimes it will be very challenged because we only have between 12 to 12 15 or 15 minutes and then we have uh like 1 15 or 1 o'clock to 1 30 go back to that so is there any uh option we could uh, provide this type of learning in a different time forming and uh, at that by that way at least i feel will be viable a time for us to for that lunch break and between the meetings and the heavy agendas. So if council does adopt a new council um, calendar for 2023, it is entirely possible that you won't be having council or committee meetings on Thursdays or Fridays. Therefore, we could schedule lunch and learns around that meeting schedule. I'm happy to have meetings uh, earlier in the morning or again within office hours, whatever works best for council. Uh, I actually, I would like to say two points. The first one is, uh, uh, this uh, lunch learning actually really helpful and I, I want to say appreciate the efforts and administration provided and that and sometimes even I was uh, follow up to request the presentation so for the presentation can we uh, have the standards process after we have lunch learning and can we have the presentation as well and because I found the presentation the information there and sometimes is really just to get to the point, and sometimes I, even I have example, I get to the point, information during lunch, and then I use it in the afternoon meetings. So 
is that possible to put that as a standards and then we don't need to ask every time and yeah, after. As, as far as I know, all lunch and learns that are facilitated by administration are followed up either with a memo or with a copy of the presentation. Uh, they're sent directly from the deputy city manager. I also receive a copy and then they're added on to open data. So if there's something specific you're looking for, please let me know and we're happy to resend that. Okay, thank you. That's my question, you have thank my you. time. Constable Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much. I, I have to confess that I'm actually a huge fan of the proposed changes, and so I'm, I'm tempted actually to vote against uh, this amendment and just proceed forward with, with what's been provided, recognizing that we continue, can continue to iteratively refine um, processes as we move forward. Uh, just a question though, um, two quick questions that, that will help inform my decision on that. In terms of the Thursday release, does moving to the three-week rotation shift your advice at all around that? I like it even more because then not only will one week of committee happen, but two weeks of committee will happen. And then the council agendas when it's released the Thursday after the two weeks of committees, it will be full. Okay, yeah, and I, and I really take your point. I think I, I really appreciate the discussion around equity, giving people enough time to review, but I think it is also confusing to see an incomplete agenda. Um, and, and I appreciate the comment in the report that you know administration will still work to release some of those larger reports ahead of time, which I think helps, helps offset that. The only other process I was a bit confused by was the, the recommendation that we can only discuss things at council if there's a motion on the floor. And I, I maybe misunderstood that, but I, I just wasn't clear, because I think you know sometimes I'll have an, a, a notion of a motion, but I do need to ask some questions uh, and get information about whether or not to move that. So just wondering if I could get a bit more clarity on that, that piece. Again, that was an old, I, I shouldn't say old, that was a practice previously um, held and it was changed with the last council. Um, and so it was again, just an option to provide more clarity around um, what it is that council's actually discussing. discussing. It also provides a bit more focus so administration knows what delegation to bring and it provides clarity to those of you who are participating in the debate, but that again is 100% an optional suggestion. But it is a suggestion based on past practice and experience that it did lead to more efficient meetings. It was a past practice that was adopted by previous councils. And again, the, whatever processes you come up with, we're happy to work with them. Yeah, 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 I like that. Again, I think I think we are all learning as we go and I, I like trying out new things. And I, I think what's proposed is really great, great advice. Uh, and I think worth, worth moving forward on and trying. So I appreciate you know, wanting to create space for more more conversation, but I think that I will likely vote against this and, and support moving forward with these changes presently. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have a second round, right? Ask for a second round. Uh, Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? For I've got the chair. Yeah, so the, Madam Clerk, as, as a chair, there are certain things that I struggle with and I, hope they do provide clarity just get understanding from you like even on the like I got good understanding the reports coming from the committee recommendation coming from the committee we go to the chair chair and make the introduction and we have a motion on the floor we talk for the motion right I don't have that clarity as a when when the reports come to council right so I think a clarity is important that what process we follow whether we it's free for, free for in a way that ask all the questions you want, then make a motion, or you table something that debate, or then focus on that that motion. I need clarity on that. This this is what we we're trying to intend as well. Are you asking for clarity about what's recommended in the bylaw? Yeah, like what did that's the clarity we need. I think we have in order for a report to be debated, it has to be a, a motion has to be on the on the on the floor. That's not what's currently in yeah. the bylaw. Yeah. That's what I was recommending to yeah. go back to the previous practice yeah. that we yeah. both operated under. Okay, that yeah. will absolutely provide clarity to the chair. This is the process we need to follow. At this time, it's not clear. So I think that allows at least me to manage the, the meetings in a better way. So if, right that, now, if, that is, if that is accepted. To be clear, the, right now the process is you don't need to have a motion on the floor. Yeah, but the new change would require us to have a motion on the floor. 
correct? Yeah. And it would be put on the floor if it's a report coming directly from administration. Yeah. It is whoever has selected that item for debate. My recommendation is you go to them first of all. Yeah. If they don't have a motion to put on the floor, you just work your down. Yeah. I'm sorry, you work your way down. The That's a better table. process. It allows uh, good debate and allow the agenda to be managed. Right. So, uh, on the on the change of non-committee members making. Uh, motions, but that those committee members have the ability to make motions at the, or inquiries or notices at the committee that they are, and everyone is a member of a committee. So everybody has that privilege on the committee they serve, right? Yes, but you shouldn't be making inquiries or motions, notwithstanding the membership question, yeah. if, if the report that comes back is not part of the mandate of that committee. So that's where we've yeah. run into some challenges right. where people are making perhaps motions at Community and Public Services Committee, but it's actually within the mandate of the yeah. exec. Yeah, and that will, the change will provide that clarity. If the bylaw is passed. Yeah. Oh yeah, for the yeah. bylaw. So yeah, there's absolutely. some time. Yeah, yeah. If the so bylaw is passed. If the bylaw is passed. Yeah. And mandate. Yeah. yeah, okay, good, all right. Okay, I will move the second round. Thank you, do you have a seconder? Your second. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, please vote. I'm a yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried, and I'll return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Okay, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, you, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, you mentioned that this was discussed at the Council Services Committee meeting last week, but that, to be clear, there was no motion or recommendation that came from that committee. It was discussion that was taken and then this was brought forward, is that correct? There, um, I was asked to provide an update on some of the recommendations, which I did, and it's my recollection, but I'd have to go back and watch the video that I was asked if I would bring this forward um, in quick terms. But it wasn't a motion, it wasn't a motion. It was not a motion. Nope. Because I remember discussing at the committee my concern about, you know, addressing this at a structural level when we weren't even following the structure at that meeting was something that I was speaking to, I remember specifically so just want to I just is that a normal thing to like not have a motion lead to something on council that comes to council I would say reports come forward from a variety yeah. of different fashions and if council doesn't want to debate an item then they don't need to add it to the agenda okay perfect um, and just to clarify the the alignment with the province is specifically for that electronic participation is that the right wording? I don't know if I'm... Yeah, and it's just, and again, it's just some minor changes. Means. We're not, I'm going to call them just housekeeping changes. It's housekeeping not going to change our practices Exactly. Yeah, okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I do share the same concern as Councillor Jans about the, the Thursday um, um, delivery of the, of the reports, especially since uh, community and public services has been so heavy um, on the Mondays. Um, hopefully that will reduce over time. But I do have a question in regards to the um, making a motion. You can still have another councillor of that committee make a motion on your behalf though, right? Uh, I would say that making motions on behalf of other councillors is not documented. However, if another councillor wants to make a motion, it is attributed to them. I can't speak to what other kind of arrangements have been made. Okay, because you just said that we shouldn't be making motions at a committee where it's not coming back to that committee. So for instance, I'm on community public services. If I want something for a report to come back to executive committee, how do, how do I get it back to executive committee if I can't it. make the motion at executive committee? You would make it at council. So if, you, so if you wanted a report to come back to executive committee, you would give notice at council 
and then the motion would be voted on at council and then as per the bylaw we would then review when the report comes back under which mandate does it most likely fall and if it was executive committee that's how it would happen but again if council wants to enable all of elected officials to make motions at all committees again that's something that can be changed it's just right now um, the way you influence the, another committee's agenda if you're not a member is by making a notice of motion at council yeah i guess maybe that's the only one that i'm left with a concern on um okay thank you very much i think okay thank you councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions on the, uh, can I can see the motion, Madam Clerk, can it? There you go. So anyone to speak? Okay, Councillor Rutherford to close. Yes, thank you. I, I really truly hope that my colleagues will support this amendment and then we can move the three readings on this specific bylaw so that we are in alignment. However, I do have some, some concerns about the process and it would be great if we could do, subsequent to that, the referral motion to actually bring recommendations as a committee because I do think that there's some other items that I haven't even asked questions on that I think needs a, a bit more comprehensive debate. Plus, I also don't know if doing it in council where is the best place for us to be having the debates about some of those items. Um, I, I think community services committee or council services committee is the best place. So I really do hope for support in, in, in doing this, especially since the, the, the amendments that are deleted are not timely. If we, if we do them in a month, in two months, but we've been more thoughtful with them, I think that actually is gonna make us stronger and better as a council. So please do consider that in your vote. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. So we have Would somebody like to move? Can move first. Who is? Sure, I can move first reading of bylaws. Just hold on. Okay. Just hold on. Can Andrew, Councilor Knack? Uh, no, someone else can move it because then I think we do need to now enter into debate. So I'll, I'll need to do amendments separately. Okay, so Councilor uh, Stevenson. So I should, you would like me to move it? Yeah. I'll move first reading of bylaw 20226. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Okay, we have bylaw on the floor, but we're close to six o'clock. And we'll take a break. Before we take a break, Madam Clerk, I my sincere apologies to everyone. Uh, I'm very guarded on the language I use, but I dropped my guard. I really apologize for that. No, I apologize. Yeah. I shouldn't no, have no, said no, a word. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll be back at seven o'clock.
Okay, I would like to call this meeting to order, and I will do the quick roll call. Councillor Wright. Good, good evening. Councillor Nack. Good evening. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good evening. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Good evening. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Still here. <laughs> Councillor Salvador. Good evening. All right, Councillor Cartmel. Good evening. Councillor Rice. Good evening. And Councillor Jans. All right, we're waiting for Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Paquette to join us. Okay. All right, next up, I so Councillor Rutherford, you uh, you're from the previous row, right? Okay, so uh, Councilor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So there are two amendments I would like to make, uh, and one of them in referencing attachment one, which is the new bylaw, bylaw 20226. Uh, the first change would be the deletion of point uh, six which is that section 211 is deleted and replaced with unless ex ex Exit. Which which attachment are you on? A? Attachment one, which is the new bylaw. Can we do these one at a time? Sure. Any yeah, ads? that's yeah. fine. Yep. I, I only have two, so I'll do the first okay. one, which is. Okay. So this is on page two of four of attachment one, section six. I'd like to strike that, which essentially would remove the, um, which would keep us at the ten days release date for agendas instead of going back to the Thursday. So I'll, I will move that first, and then I can do another one after. Second. Me. Okay, that's six one, right? Yes. Removing that one. Removing that one. Yes. Yeah, and so it's part six and seven because I have to look at both oh, bylaws, but it's the, it's the same thing. If the intention is to yes. get rid of the to get rid of the agenda release. Absolutely. Um, so briefly introducing that. Mayor Sohi, uh, you know, and I, I, I appreciate that I've made uh, great enemies today, particularly of the clerks, uh, from probably putting forward this amendment. Um, and I know it is tough on them. I, I do want to acknowledge that, that it's tough on both our clerks, and I think it is tough on our administration um, to accomplish this. But when we made this change, it was very much meant as a benefit to the public. And allowing them ample time to go through all agendas, not just what we deem to be the most important items, because we could select certain ones and say do an early release, but this is something that has been really important and, and really well supported and was received a lot of positive feedback from community members around giving them more time to review uh, complex issues, which for many of us, we might not need that time. Um, I think some of us might need the time, but I think for particularly members of the public, it is a really, really important thing that I would hate to, for them to lose after having now had it for, for some time. I think they've gotten used to it. I think it allows community members to be better prepared to engage their residents and their neighbors and their friends on issues that are important. And so I, I think we need to stick with the 10 day release. So that's my introduction and probably my close likely. Thank you, Councillor uh, Nack, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, uh, just to speak to the to the amend the motion. So can you wait until I go through the if the other members have any questions? Seeing none, I do have some questions. I just Councillor Nack, if you oh sorry sorry Councillor Jans, can you take the chair please? So taken. So Madam Clerk, can you explain the reason why this change is being proposed? 
Sure. Um, so the reason that agendas used to be released on a Thursday before we introduced the pilot, it's so that the committee cycle, which typically runs Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, had completed its business and any reports from committee could then go up to council. Yeah. The, the current process that's outlined in your bylaw is that we release everything 10 days in advance. So part of the pilot, we looked at agendas being released on Mondays, two days, Mondays, Tuesdays, or Wednesdays on a rolling 10 day basis. And it was just far too confusing. So we've always stuck with the Thursday, but we backed it up by a week. So the challenge we have right now is that when we release agendas for council or particularly for council meetings, is it doesn't have any of those reports that have come from committee yeah. up. And so ARC is approving an agenda, setting time specifics, approving uh, reports to be rerouted, and it has it does not have complete information. And based on some of our analysis, in some cases, it only has a third of the report. So there's a ripple effect of this yep. over agenda review and uh, reports not being released on time and all that. Because the committee, committee's recommendation not being part of the agenda when the agenda is initially being released, right? So I wouldn't say the reports aren't being released on time. The reports are being released once we get them from committee. But yeah. there's a process that needs to follow. There's a sequence. Yeah. And the 10 days is, is out of sequence. But again, we're happy to accommodate the will of count. Okay. Yeah, but it does create a lot of challenges for scheduling at the agenda review. Okay. All right. I think that's, I think that Please keep that in mind when you're making your decision to vote. Thank you. That's all I have on, I'll take the chair back. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. I'm just wondering, so when you say 10 clear days, we're talking calendar days, not business days, correct? Yeah, so we use the Interpretation Act from um, the province of Alberta is how we define things. So clear days, not business days. Okay. Um, so sometimes it's more than 10 days. I think the bylaw says at least 10 days. I'm just wondering if there's a happy medium somewhere in between there. <laughs> we, to be honest, we looked at releasing agendas 10 days in advance of the meeting, which means we would release agendas Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. One, it means we never stop, which is fine. Uh, the feedback we got from the previous council when we looked at these options is you don't know what we're releasing when and it's very hard to navigate um, being prepared to answer questions. And just from an efficiency of this system, I would strongly suggest that we release agendas once, which is on the Thursdays. But again, if council wants it to, to change it to it being 10 clear days, we would actually need to take that away and see what we could do from a staffing perspective. Because if we're here, we can't be releasing agendas because we have to focus on the meeting in front of us and that would have massive implications on administration. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Okay, to that concludes the questions to speak. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, um, so I, I will be supporting this motion on the floor. I understand what Mayor Sohi's talking about in terms of the uh, pressure, but I also have to look at it from my governance lens. And we as a council are, are much more diverse than councils of the past. And my, myself included, if I'm getting agenda packages on a Thursday with my kids and my commitments for, to family and community and community events, will I have time to read those and be able to be a good governor when that when that meeting rolls around the following week, um, I I don't think I I don't think I can I don't think I can do justice to the the work I don't think it gives that opportunity that some of my colleagues talk about all the time where we can get clarifying questions from administration to mitigate time at council meetings I think that we lose that as well so I think that at this point I I support going forward with with the 10 days, understanding that there's gonna be no ideal situation. But I would rather receive one third of the reports 10 days in advance and I can read those and then get the other reports as they come, as they emerge, than getting no reports until the Thursday before. So uh, for that reason, I, I have to support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Nack. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I'll offer one other perspective. I mentioned the public, but I'll, I'll use myself as the example before I was a counselor. Uh, before I was a counselor, I, I worked in retail. 
And um, guess what? You usually work every weekend in retail. You're working thir Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and maybe you're lucky if you get Monday, but I, I managed the store, so guess what? I didn't get my weekends off. Um, but I was also very interested in the work that this body was doing uh, as, a, as a volunteer on my community league. And, uh, and you know, at the time, Councillor So he would occasionally see me in the audience, uh, me attending as a, as a public member when I could squeeze that in, in between my retail job. And frankly, uh, having a release that was three days out or the Thursday before a meeting, which might happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, was extremely challenging on somebody who wanted to be involved in his city, but had very little capacity to do so because of the uh, occupation that I was working. So while I, I very much respect and appreciate, it is challenging for administration, it is challenging for our clerks. Um, we, we cannot forget that the folks that we represent have a very rain, diverse range of needs and, and they need to be given as much opportunity as possible to learn the issues, to become well informed, to engage their neighbors and their friends in order to provide as thoughtful as submissions as we would hope that they can do. And giving them just a weekend to do that, particularly for those who don't have, who actually have to work over those weekends, I don't think is a reasonable expectation on members of our public. And, and I know it's gonna be tough, and, and I know, like, I, I don't joke when I say I, I make an enemy of the clerks. I, I really do appreciate the, the challenge that puts on them, but I think we have to defer to our public and making sure they have appropriate amounts of time to be involved in the city that we, we so much want them to be involved in. So uh, that's why I feel very strongly about this particular change uh, and, and keeping it at the 10 days. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack, very compelling. Thank you for that, actually, and Councillor Rutherford as well. Thank you. Uh, I may actually change my vote, yeah. Okay, all right, so or that's it, that concludes. Please vote. <coughs> Councillor Biquette, are you with us? Councilor Paquette? I'm just checking to see who else are there. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, what's the next one, Councilor Nack? Uh, I only had one other one, and that would be going down to section 15, which is page three of four where it talks about section 38 being deleted and replaced with, and I would specifically want to strike uh, 38.6, which is that a counselor may speak to a motion or close debate on a motion for up to two minutes and, and retaining the existing five minutes. Okay, that's 36. Yes, 38, sorry, 38.6. 38, 38.6. Six. 38, six. Got it. Yeah, yeah. You want to explain that in five minutes, why? I don't even think I'll take five minutes uh, introducing it. Um, I, that's more about us managing our agenda, <laughs> so clerk, you don't have a significant issues with that, do you? Or maybe I, maybe I shouldn't, just don't let me follow the case. Constable Stevenson, you're next. Oh, I, I, I will not be supporting this amendment just because I do, I do think um, being succinct and efficient uh, in our summary comments is, is an important way to continue moving the meetings forward. Uh, so I will leave it there with. Okay, Councillor, that's it. Uh, can you take the chair, Councillor Jans? I suppose. I just want to speak to this. I actually, I'm going to support this because similar reasons that Councillor Rutherford identified in her uh, earlier remarks about the other amendment about uh, each of us have our own realities to, uh, uh, to deal with and, uh, and reflect on. And one of the realities that I face, because English not being my first language, uh, while I am speaking, I'm kind of struggling for words as well. While I'm doing that, it absolutely slows my 
think, thinking process, and so that means I need more time to make the point that someone may be able to make in two minutes, I might need three minutes to make that point, right? So I think that is why I all, most of the time I'm pretty concise on the what I have to say, but I sometimes do struggle that uh, even even three or four minutes to make a point are not sufficient. So I think that is the reason that I would like to uh, have more time. And that doesn't mean that we need to use five minutes all the time, and I don't use five minutes all the time. But I think that may limit some of the uh, uh, some of our uh, some of us ability to uh, to express uh, our closing remarks in uh, in two minute time. Yeah. So that will be my argument. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I didn't hear the seconder. Could you clarify oh, for me? Oh, seconder was Councillor Rutherford. Me. Thank you. Do we start speaking on it? We thought, okay, uh, Councillor Tang, to speak or? No, I actually have a, just a, a question. Go ahead. Uh, I guess to the mover, why, why, why wouldn't you want this to be consistent with committee when we're allotted three minutes for the second round and, or, you know. Uh, so, so in terms of the question period, I'm fine with uh, with whatever's been proposed for the change. This is just for the closing pieces right. that I wanted to. I guess okay. So I guess to Madam Clerk, then why is it two minutes and not so three? Just a friendly reminder that the bylaw was not changed, and that was just a pilot. So we never did change the bylaw no. to change that, and um, it was managed perhaps um, a bit fluidly. And so based on what's presented to you here, this would be, everything goes back to five minutes. Our recommendation is for, um, I'm gonna say a bit more fairness, because right now if you move the motion, regardless if you're the chair, or if you're the person who clicks on first, you actually get 10 more minutes in the debate than everybody else, and I thought that was a bit much. Um, that's why we were recommending two minutes to intro, two minutes to close, and everybody else gets five minutes. Multiple rounds of questions seem to be happening, so that I didn't see, I personally didn't see a big difference between three and five. It just meant there was more rounds. But if you would like us to change the rules at committee, now's a great time to make those amendments so that we're clear on what the practice actually is. No, it's okay. I don't need to add another amendment to the table. I just uh, thought it might be easier just to be consistent. Um, yeah, I guess I don't particularly feel either way. I think there's merit some for both two minutes or five minutes, um, but open to hearing from others. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice. A um, little, little bit of clarification between uh, number three and the number six. So 38, number three, and once made, a councillor may speak to the inter do the motion for up to two minutes. Is this just the introduction is not speak to the motion, right? That's correct. So it says introduce, so that would be yeah. whoever's moving the motion. That's our recommendation. Move the motion just for the introduce the motion for up yeah, to Yeah, so the, the only people that get to introduce the motion is the person who moves the motion. Okay, for uh, two minutes to introduce motion. And then if you speak to the motion, you can have five minutes. That is what we're recommending. Okay. Uh, next one is um, number four. The number four is talking about uh, only ask questions once. So that means we only allow the one, one round. Is that understanding right? That's currently what you have. That's why you have to pass a motion for second, third, oh, fourth, and yes, fifth yes. round of questions. Yes. Oh, that's just, it's too long day today. <laughs> okay, that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> that's all. I'll yield my time. Hmm? Thank you, Councillor Rice. I can move to second one. Yeah, uh, oh, yes, because that's <laughs> right. Thank you, Councillor Rice, for moving the second round. We need a second round. Councillor Rutherford, second round. Please vote for second round. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now Councillor Nack, questions to speak? Councillor Wright to speak or questions? I did have a question, but... I did have a question, but I think it's been answered, so um, 
I'll just speak to it uh, very briefly within two minutes. And um, I, I, I do agree um, extending the, the closing back out to, to five minutes because you may want to clarify information that you've received um, throughout the debate. And um, so additional time might be needed. And I know that my colleagues will keep their um, comments concise when, when they are able. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. That was 30 seconds. Right on. Councillor Rutherford. I'm just a speak as well. Go ahead. So I, I think we talk about the equity, but when I read this, the way this motion, uh, sorry, not the motion, the, the original bylaw proposed change without, it actually disadvantages the mover, I think, in a way, because it's saying two minutes to speak, to intro, two minutes to close, but then others have five minutes to speak to the motion. And I think that if you are the mover of a motion, you should have a little bit more time. You should have come with a little bit more research to be prepared to speak to. It's obviously something that's important to you, your constituents, or uh, others on council. So I think that for me, even a little bit more time for the mover is justifiable. I think when we look at it from an equity lens, the, the point that Mayor Sohi brought up about English not being a... Uh, a first language, I imagine myself having to try to do something like this in Japanese or French, and it would be really challenging to do in such a tight timeline. And I think we can all be judicious with our time, and, and rarely do we take the whole five minutes, but I think on topics that are important, and I think about the budget debate we're gonna have coming up. I think about some of the hard conversations we've had on police funding, and I think about some of those things in which two minutes will not do service, and justice to the topic at hand. And so for that reason, I'm also going to support this amendment. So Thank can you. I just clarify, the intention wasn't to reduce the um, speaking to it, it was the closing. So intro and closing are in addition to speaking and asking questions. So if I didn't say that clearly, I do apologize. So if you but were the, the But the mover typically doesn't speak to it until they're closing. That is in the current bylaw. The way it was written is if, if I'm just going to say, if the mayor made a motion and throughout the, the 13 that want to speak, he can speak to it at whatever point. And then at the end, our recommendation was two minutes to close. So For it was everyone. seven minutes in total. My apologies, yeah. not 10. Sorry, my apologies. If no, I that's a good clarification. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I think that it, that I, I don't think that they, Either way, I'm still going to support the, the amendment uh, on the floor uh, as it stands. So thank you. Thank you. Well, Councillor Neck. Let me take five minutes and tell you why you should support this. No, I'm not going to. Um, I will just say this is that, uh, and I appreciate even with that clarification, um, for me, and, and in nine years of doing this, I have had my mind changed um, multiple times uh, because of the debate that happens after we've asked questions. I have learned uh, through different life experiences that people can bring experiences from communities that they represent. And, uh, and, and I do think it is important to have uh, a fulsome discussion after we've asked questions so that we're not um, abusing the question period of the don't you think questions like we used to do last term uh, a lot more than we do this term. Um, this, this is a good time to learn from people and understand things that maybe I hadn't taken the time to, to understand at other points. Um, so, so I think I'll just, I'll leave it there is that I, I do gain a lot of knowledge and I, and again, I, I want to say thank you to all of you because I have had my mind changed throughout these discussions because of sometimes some longer responses. And I do think sometimes these complex issues do require uh, a very lengthy discussion, uh, even though that can be frustrating. But not here. I feel good after a minute and 15 of ending it. There you go. Thank you, Councillor Nack. OK. Uh, sorry, Councillor Jens, you have. I have, a, I have one for after we vote. OK, got it. OK. Uh, please vote. I voted. 
You did. We have all the votes. Oh. <laughs> the aliens looking at me like this. I would. <laughs> Can you display the votes, please? <laughs> that is carried. Okay. Councillor Jans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move an amendment to Section 38, 1 and 2. Yes, it hold reads, on. Action 38. Sorry, if I can. Yeah, uh, go ahead. 38, 1 and 2. Currently, it reads, each approved speaker may speak for a maximum of five minutes. I would like to reduce it in both of those to three minutes. So Eight. the effect, if it, by way of introduction, the effect would be that when we have speakers or others, instead of, like, approved speakers, instead of speaking for five minutes, they speak for three minutes. We still have the ability to ask them questions. It forces us to be a little, it forces our guests to be a little bit tighter on their notes, but allows us to potentially hear from more folks. Uh, in my experience thus far, often they give their argument at the beginning, then after that they belabor the, the point with examples and others. We can get those in questions. We can encourage others to write to us. In general, I think our meetings should not be pu public hearings, that they, they should not be opportunities for for long soliloquies, they should be, they should be tight, concise. Just hold on, Constant Jans. Need a seconder. I'm stalling to get this going. So, <laughs> do we have it? Yeah. Need a seconder. Second. Thank you. Second by Constant Dang. You will get years of your life back. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and oh yes, it is standard practice for the school boards as well for three minutes, not five minutes. Okay. Any questions? Seeing not. Sorry, Councillor Rice. Uh, I do believe public's voice to be heard uh, thoroughly and very clearly. And then specifically for many public uh, speakers. Um, Qu yeah. Speaking or questions? I think uh, speaking. Okay, go ahead. You can so allow. Councillor Rice, then wait. Councillor uh, Prince yeah, lined up. Councillor Principe, sorry, I didn't see your name. Questions, Councillor Principe? Yeah, I have Go a ahead. question. Go ahead. Has it ever been the practice where it was three minutes for speakers here? Not in my tenure that I can think of. I, as far as I know, five has been the magic number for everything. Okay, and can I ask a question to the mover? Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, you were saying in practice with the school board that the speakers spoke for three minutes, yeah? And you found that effective where people got their point across more so At with the it, three minutes? Yeah, absolutely. And and they were very emotional conversations, like, please keep my school open. Here's why. Really, if they if they want to add more to that, we'd encourage them to write in or send us information, et cetera. And I mean, to I think to, to Councillor Rice's point about, you know, we want to hear from the public. We do, but why five minutes? Why not eight minutes? Why not nine minutes? So... At some point, we need we need to. What is the point of this meeting? We want to hear yay or nay, get a little bit of editorial. I mean, three minutes to me is a compromise. I'd rather see one minute, but here we are. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Principe. Done. Done. Okay, Councillor Rice to speak. Sorry, Councillor Cartmel. Go ahead. Questions. Yes, so um, I'm, I'm just quickly scanning the bylaws. Approved speaker is not defined that I can see in the definitions of either of the bylaws. Maybe I've missed it. Approved speaker is passed by a motion at the beginning of your committee So it's, it, there's no definition necessarily. Like I, my question is around residency requirements. Yep. Because I believe I've had the experience uh, since chairing CPSC of having speakers from other provinces because uh, it's so easy to attend a meeting now. And I'm wondering about the approval of said speakers if they're not, if, you know, if, they, if they're not from the jurisdiction and speaking to the question that, you know, impacts the lives of people that live here predominantly. So this question has come up at statutory public hearings as well as at committee and I know our friends in legal services are here and they can speak to that, that question as well as I do think it's worth um, understanding the implication of the five minute rule. Okay, so to legal, are they here? Okay. Uh, 
Sure. Yes, I'm, I'm on the line if I can assist Mr. Mayor. So um, in the context of a public hearing, the public absolutely has a right to be heard. Five minutes has been successfully defended in court before. I haven't done the research with, without any notice to know if three minutes also meets that test. Speaking to the residency requirement, in a public hearing, you must hear from anyone that is directly affected, and you may hear from anyone else. In that May context, committee decides who they want to hear from. So it would be up to you in that case to decide whether a non-resident is someone that you need to hear from in those situations. So public, you mentioned both public hearing, uh, Ms. Jacobson, and committee. So public hearing is May, and committee is May as well? Public hearing is a must if the person is directly affected by the item that is being considered. It is a may for anyone else. Committee is always a may. Committee is always a may. Okay, so I guess uh, as, as what, so if someone has an objection to hearing from a speaker, I guess that's just a conversation at committee, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Councillor Jans, does that satisfy your desire to reduce it to three minutes from five? Or if that is the case, would you want to withdraw your motion? I, I didn't hear anything from legal that said we couldn't try three. That five has been defended for public hearings, but for council and committee, there's no reason why we couldn't have three. And even for public hearings, I still think three could meet the test of a reasonable amount of time to hear okay, from So someone. you want to you want to keep it? Okay. Yes, please. All right. Okay. Councillor uh, Salvador, questions? Nope. Speaking to. Speaking. And Councillor Rice to speak as well. Okay. Councillor Rice, I'll start with you to speak. We'll be very quick. <clears throat> so, as I said, and as an, our property um, deserve to be heard. Um, Zerly, and then also, and if we look at uh, the speaker come to the chamber, and most is about uh, public hearing session, and also uh, committees for some topics, and then uh, really uh, impact directly impact to our public. And so, with that say, and then the five minutes practice is already over ten years right now, and then. And even we notice, and during these five minutes, we still have speakers can use more time than five minutes. And then, so if that works, I don't think we need to change this into short time. And because by short time, and we may end up, we cannot receive the entire points, and the speaker try to present an in the meeting. Um, Another thing I would like to say, and the city's uh, jurisdiction authority scope is uh, very, very big, and the 73 ninth of business, and is more complicated. And then regarding uh, the level of of the services, uh, I think five minutes will be the good for our public speakers. So I own, I will not support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, appreciate the the desire to, yeah, be be as concise as possible uh, when it comes to speakers, Councillor Jans. Um, so thank you for bringing this forward. But however, I I cannot support this. Um, having been on the other side of the table many many times, um, I know how quickly those five minutes can go by, uh, especially when it comes to conversations at committee where um, we often are dealing with complex topics. I have seen, you know, minds changed and motions made at committee uh, that were the result of, you know, that full five minutes and that five minutes was necessary. So I, I guess I would worry that we wouldn't, wouldn't see that same degree of dialogue when it's necessary. Um, I think that, yeah, uh, for the same reasons that Mayor So he pointed out around accessibility and equity, uh, I think we need to be mindful that um, folks are coming from from different places, different backgrounds, different experiences, different levels of expertise. Uh, so providing that five minute window, uh, I think, does provide um, the most most equitable outcomes for folks who are taking time out of their day to uh, voice concerns or voice support for things that matter in our city. Uh, so for that reason uh, and those combination of reasons, I won't be 
supporting this amendment. Uh, I'd like to keep it at five. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Paquette to speak. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, interestingly enough, uh, I wish that this was actually two sections. I, I wish it was uh, three for committee and five for council, uh, you know, when we do public hearing. Uh, simply because, um, I, as uh, Councillor Cartmel alluded to, I've sat and chaired committee meetings where every speaker had almost the exact same points, five minutes over five minutes over five minutes for an entire day. There was no utility in it, except for the fact that people got to voice uh, how they felt, which is really great, but they certainly didn't need five minutes to repeat the exact same talking points uh, to get the point across. Now, some people might argue uh, that they could. However, in committee, there's also the opportunity to speak and ask questions of the speakers. Uh, so their three minutes could be extended uh, far beyond that initial uh, timeline. So it's a tough one. Uh, I would have supported three and five to be, to be frank, but I can't support just three because when it comes to public hearing, uh, you often have people who are directly affected by by issues not that they wouldn't be in committee but directly affected and uh it's a it's a little bit of a different conversation as everyone here has experienced at this point so um maybe at some point we see uh the proposal that i would have preferred but uh as it is i i probably can't support it thank you mr mayor thank you councillor paquette councillor tank thank you mr mayor um yeah, I agree with a lot of the points my colleagues made. I also feel like since since we've been in this role, when we have public speakers, half the time people don't use their full five minutes. And so I'm not sure, I guess just by shaving down to the three minute, um, if we're really you know solving a real problem, um, you know, if the issue is really agenda management, I'm not sure if this is the path I will look to for um, you know, try to find a solution for that. It's, it's getting a little, uh, I guess, too nitty gritty. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I'm always a fan of just create, having those options available for people to participate and um, as much as possible. And I think in this case, um, you know, we've always had five minutes and if people wanna go on in much the same way sometimes we wanna go on on things too, um, I think they should have every right to do so since this is a very, uh, you know, it is a civic uh, engagement platform. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? Where are you at? Uh, I've got the chair. Thank you. You know, I, I would say the local government is the most accessible government uh, to people. Like I served in federal government, only very select few people will go to committees to make presentations. Uh, but here, people value, that at least they feel that they have a voice, they can be heard. And I think got to give them time to, uh, to express themselves, right? So I think it's very important that uh, at a local level, we continue to defend that kind of democratic participation and people's access and ability. You know, during the last eight months, uh, I think chairing meetings, we have run into uh, uh, specific circum circumstances uh, because of the emotions. Uh, you know, we heard that, we saw that during the, uh, the situation in, in the Chinatown where uh, uh, people were not, were not able to express themselves within five minutes. They needed extended time, right? So we created that flexibility. We heard, we saw that with the, some of the engagement that we did with indigenous communities where storytelling took place and they needed more than five minutes. I think we need to be cognizant of those those realities. I think uh, reducing from five to three further limits uh, that ability for people to tell their stories and express themselves. So I think five five minutes that worked. Let's keep it at five. And I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. And go to Council Jens to close. Thank you. Uh, may I withdraw the motion? <laughs> and I just two things. One, I understand there may be future advice coming from legal, and I understand there may be, I don't wanna have the vote on this now, and then, uh, what's the word? 
acts the ability to make any change later. So I'd like to withdraw it and have this as a follow-up conversation later. Okay, is the uh, House okay with withdrawing? Withdraw? Okay, everything's okay with withdrawing? All right, withdraw. Well, it's gone. Let's withdraw. Thank you, Councilor Jans. Okay, that concludes the discussion on this issue, this matter. So, Madam Clerk, I'm just looking for what is the recommendation. We have to move first reading. Oh, yeah. Can someone move the... Uh, Sorry, first reading's already on the floor. That's what you've been amending. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. First reading has been on the... So, all right. So, we're done with all of this. No more speaking on it, right? All right. Okay. All right. Now, can we please vote? We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes the... Second reading. No, no, just hold on. I'm just looking. That concludes our item number... No. Second. Oh, we need all three readings. Okay. All right. Get it through. All right. So who moved the first reading? Councillor Stevenson, oh, you moved move the second reading. Second read. Who seconded it? Second. Councillor Tang seconded it. Point of order. Sorry, so, Councillor Rice. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, for the reading uh, after amend amendments, right? You already voted on first reading as amended. Yeah, and I just want to confirm pass, that. If you yeah. want to pass any bylaw in the single sitting, yeah. it needs to have four votes. Okay. All right. Now we have second reading on the floor. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now, Mr. Councillor Merrill, Stevenson. Move consideration of third reading. Second. Second by Councillor Tank. Consideration for third reading. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third and final reading of bylaw 20226. Second. Second by Councillor Tank. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move. Oh, sorry. So we are done with 7.12. So we have motions pending. Do we deal with them first or do we deal with private items? I would items? suggest you deal with the matters of agenda items and with then the if there's time remaining that you go to items eight. Okay. So then I will move, Mr. Mayor, that we go into private. Okay. Second. Second by Councilor Tank to go into private. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
okay that's so you want to deal with 9.1 first madam clerk yeah so in the chat i've there's three motions we'd like it, if you could pass them tonight or deal with them or vote on them so for nine one nine four and nine six okay nine one it's in the chat so i can move, I can Tang. move yeah i can move that attachment one of the july 4th 2022 office of the city clerk report occ 01322 be approved as the basis for city council submission to the government of Alberta's consultation related to the local authorities elections act and that the additional four points raised during the discussion also be included okay we need uh, this. and and sorry and that this uh, remain private pursuant to section 29 of FOIP. okay second second by councillor rice please vote We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And the next one is 9.4. I can uh, move that Councillor Rice be appointed as a member and Councillor Knapp be appointed as the alternate to the dispute resolution committee of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board, both from the date of appointment for the term of office. That Councillor Carmel be appointed as the member and Councillor Tame be appointed as the alternate to the growth plan five year interim review task force of the EMRB, both from the date of appointment for the term of office. And that the June 20th, 2022 report remain private pursuant to section 17 of FOIP. Thank you. Need a seconder? Second. Second. Second, Constant Jans. Please vote. Jans in favor. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And the next one is intergovernmental. Yeah, and Mr. Mayor, I would like to move that the July 4th, 2022 Office of the City Manager ver verbal report be received for information and that this report remain private pursuant to Section 21 of FOIP uh, and Section 24 of FOIP. Oh. I forgot 24 for the previous one, but second. Okay. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. Jans in favor. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And we will. Uh, resume back on Wednesday yeah, if you go back in private it just means that we don't have to have the peace officers come back and open the doors which is super helpful for us so oh. moved second thank you okay okay please vote to go in camera Jans yes There we go. Is everyone still with us? Yeah. Okay. It's just it's just me. Okay. Oh, some, we some have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Well, uh, until Wednesday morning, we are in the recess.